tourist is such a special state of mind of a person when he wants to see everything, take pictures or video. On this day, two bloggers were looking for a road. A strange phenomenon fell into the frame of the geolocator. A humanoid monster with wings was moving cautiously in the gloom of the trees. Soon this photo ran around the internet and received mixed reactions. Most people considered it another fake. However, there were discussions. For example, in the student canteen, classmates discussed the unusual photo. The girl liked such an unusual upgrade as wings. Perhaps she, like many girls, liked stories about fairies, Batman, and Spider-Man. The boy was skeptical, but he didn't have time to say anything because the phone was yanked out of his hand. Another fellow student came up behind them, the most popular guy on the faculty. He too wanted to see what his friends were looking at. He didn't comment on the photo, just asked about what he was most interested in, wings. He shuddered at the mention of them. But the guys just shrugged indifferently. They were more interested in whether he'd go to the party with the girls. Because he was the first to be invited, Wade, the recognized pretty boy, and next to him the escorte followed his comrades. Wade was an extraordinary success with ladies of all ages. He was tall, slender, but it was his unusual eyes that attracted the most attention, huge and green, like spring grass. In addition, he was a promising student who had the highest grades in all subjects studied. That's why he had a huge number of followers on social networks, as well as attention from girls so he could quite frankly be called the king of public sympathy and a recognized favorite of teachers. His opinion of himself could not be called modest. He even had a theory about it. That all creatures live in a pack of their own kind, identical in their preferences, expectations, and social hierarchy. And there's always a leader among them, the super-powerful, super-popular one who has the most benefits and distributes them to his supporters. Since Wade was really popular and being his friend was considered prestigious, he thought he was at the top of the pyramid of the student body. Of course, he loved it, being the coolest and mega popular. Having guys jealous and girls seeking your favor. This time, when Wade was thinking of heading to the nearest bar to have a good time in a fun group, he was elbowed in the side by a classmate and secretly pointed out something he should pay attention to. Not far away, Wade's girlfriend, Miri, was waving at them. She was yelling his name all over the square with joy that she had accidentally met him. Of course, Miri was the first beauty of the university. Who else would be worthy of the king? However, right now, Wade was uncomfortable with the fact that she had noticed him. There was no way he could go to a party with girls alone now. She'd get jealous. And the guys had invited Miri along. When she heard that her favorite is also going, she already dreamed of how she would spend time with him. And immediately agreed, enthusiastically shouting and jumping on the neck of her boyfriend except he had his back to her, when Wade saw that she was about to press her breasts against him. Immediately he moved to the side, moving out of her jumping line, somewhat abruptly so that Miri was even startled. Wade was just as scared he hated it when someone touched his back. And now he hurried away from the company of his friends, kneading his shoulder as if it hurt. His mood was already ruined. So much so, in fact, that his apology had perplexed everyone he'd left halfway to the bar. It sounded too much like a ridiculous excuse. And though his friends shouted in surprise and concern, Wade left without looking back. He walked quickly toward the house where he had the small apartment he'd gotten from his parents, not looking around. He mentally scolded himself for the poverty of imagination and the stupidest excuse, and continued scratching his itchy shoulder. A guy in a mask was walking towards him. How many times had they met, and he'd always been withdrawn and aloof? Wade sympathized with him, because he was comparing himself to him. There was only one difference between them. His secret was not yet out. Rumor had it that in his freshman year, this guy was initially quite normal. Friends, girlfriend, successful in his studies. But then something happened, after which he completely changed and began to avoid people. It was said that one day, his face was covered with disgusting blisters, and it was seen by all his acquaintances. After that, his friends turned away from him, and his girlfriend left. Wade missed the guy in the mask and once again looked at his dismal appearance. Would he be the same when his secret was revealed? Finally, he saw the walls of his home. Their rest and something else very shameful awaited him. His back itched terribly, and Wade had been in such a hurry that he hadn't even slammed the door behind him properly. 
He started to pull off his sweatshirt with relief. Underneath it were tightly wound layers of elastic bandages. He was in a hurry to get them off. That was the only reason he'd come home so early. To free his wings from captivity for a while. To stretch them. Miri's sudden leap made them jerk instinctively and press back uncomfortably. He remembered the conversation in the student cafeteria and his question that had never been answered. Now, looking at his wings, he shuddered in disgust. He didn't understand how girls could like it. Dragonfly wings on a human body, they're ugly, unnatural, so horrible to feel like a monster. And it's a shame. He wasn't born with this jewelry. It was all caused by an accident that happened to him a few years ago. How an ordinary bug spray caused such a change is unknown. Because in the morning, when he opened his eyes only in front of the mirror to brush his teeth, he saw two pairs of dragonfly wings behind his shoulders. He didn't go to school that day, but hid in his apartment all day. He was terrified of the consequences of what had happened to him. The dragonfly boy was a sensation, which would only bring him trouble. So he spent all day thinking of ways to cover it up. For example, he stopped spending time with his classmates at school for fear that they would see or feel the abnormal ruffling of his clothes. This was even good for him, because there was a lot of free time which he used for studying. But since he liked to have fun with his friends, the forced loneliness was very hard for him. Therefore, becoming a student, he decided to change his life completely. He started by changing his image. In the hairdresser's shop, he had a fashionable haircut. Now no one would recognize Modest Wade. Elastic bandages were invented for the wings. It wasn't very comfortable, but it completely concealed their presence on his back. But most importantly, the demeanor. Perfect posture, confident gait, and always polite smile quickly won the sympathy of everyone around him. One day he was tugged by the sleeve of his jacket by a delicate maiden's hand, attracting attention. That's how he met Miri. She herself approached the guy she liked to make friends, and eventually they started dating. Wade slammed his palms on the sink in frustration. He's doing fine as long as the people around him don't know about his secret. But what happens when it's revealed? He closed the faucet, wondering if it was too late to go hang out in company while he was still like everyone else. Then he stretched with pleasure. He flapped his wings so they would stretch properly and itch less under his clothes. Walked toward the bathroom exit, thinking about his girlfriend, about how hard it had become to hide the fact that he had wings from her. And then he ran into the shocked look of huge brown eyes. At his bathroom door, she wasn't supposed to be here. It was unclear which one of them screamed louder. Wade, because she could see his wings. Or Miri from the surprise of seeing a half-naked guy. As she hurried to turn away, he hurriedly slammed the door in her face. And with a horribly worried expression, pressed his forehead against it clutching the doorknob as if Miri was about to burst in and give him a scandal. Miri suddenly remembered that she was an uninvited guest and apologized for entering without waiting for an invitation. The guys wanted to invite her to his apartment to hang out, so they'd nominated her to be his parliamentarian. Wade wasn't happy about the news. He was still reeling from the fact that Miri had almost gotten him declassified, and now he had to hide from his friends. Miri stood under the door and couldn't figure out why Wade had locked himself in the bathroom and he didn't know what to say to her. Of course he felt bad. Especially now, with his heart still beating hard from the fear he'd experienced, and his breathing hitching. His girlfriend was standing just outside the thin door, and she was worried about him. Too many inconsistencies she had observed during the time from their interactions. Finally asked a direct question. One that if you didn't answer, you'd be lying. But you can't answer it without lying either. Wade froze, not knowing what to say. He lied, because not answering was worse, and he was ashamed of himself, and for his shameful secret, and for lying to his girlfriend. Wade wanted to bang his head against the wall in frustration at himself, at a situation that just couldn't end well. Because Miri's voice was getting sadder and sadder, it sounded like she had taken offense. Suddenly, beer cans clattered to the floor, and Miri's voice became loud and confident, as if she had made a decision. Miri stood in front of the door, demanding he come out. Wade held the doorknob and kept hesitating. Until he heard something that surprised him greatly, to the point where his mouth opened involuntarily to noisily suck in the air that he was suddenly short of. His modest and quiet Miri was showing her character for the first time. She just resolutely sat down on the floor by the door and wasn't going to leave that post until he came out. He even opened the door ajar to make sure he wasn't dreaming. 
and she continued to develop her thought about his strange behavior throughout the semester. And resenting him. After all, she's his girlfriend and feels like he's not telling her something, and that kind of mistrust hurts a lot. She suddenly remembered their first date, which was unforgettable, because it was the first time she was protected by a guy. That memory was hitting Wade where it hurt the most, his pride, because in her telling, his behavior was unacceptably swaggering and rude. But Miri admitted that she'd changed her mind when she'd met his unobtrusive, polite concern. And now she wanted to give him back the support and attention that had helped her so much at the time. Wade even stood with his back to her in the bathroom. He felt so ashamed of his unwitting deception. Thinking about what to do. No, he wasn't going to tell her his secret, but he could distract her from her sad thoughts. A few minutes later, the bathroom door creaked open. Miri glanced around incredulously. Because a smiling, satisfied Wade came out. And that was odd after her sorrowful monologue. He looked as if nothing had happened. A sweet couple of lovers were walking down the street, heading for the movie theater. And behind them, the unkind eyes of a man in a long cloak stared after them uninterruptedly. He had a strange shadow. The cloak bumped in all the wrong places and couldn't quite hide his unnatural movements. Meanwhile, Wade and Miri were strolling toward the place where all lovers go. On the way, she was called out by an unfamiliar boy and girl, and she responded to their call in a friendly manner. Wade wasn't happy because it was a waste of the time they could have spent together. But what could he do if his girlfriend had a good heart and couldn't say no to a small request? And then Miri was as happy as a child over a well-deserved candy bar, and she looked so sweet that Wade involuntarily thought that maybe she wouldn't push him away if she found out. But that thought was just as quickly dismissed. There was a movie theater waiting for them. The afternoon session was drawing a sparse audience, and they had a chance for privacy. They took seats in the center. A super action movie was showing. The loud noises made Miri flinch and snuggle up to Wade in fear, nervously sipping her Coke. Until she asked to go outside. So did the girl. It was awkward to do it in the middle of a session. But she carefully made her way to the exit. Wade watched her, admiring her figure and graceful movements. And his thoughts once again swirled around recognition. An inevitable one, it had to be said. If he was still going to see her. Looking at the screen, he saw a monster almost as big as he was. People were screaming in horror, and he suddenly imagined that Miri would scream the same way when she found out. Wade changed his mind for the umpteenth time and decided not to take any action yet. The later she found out, the better. At the same time, the picture on the screen disappeared with a strange popping sound that was heard at the far end of the room. Immediately, the lights disappeared as well. The audience began to speak indignantly about the inconvenience. Suddenly, the door opened and a security guard ran in, shouting loudly for urgent evacuation. The people in the hall didn't even move. It was so unexpected for them. In addition, such manipulations on the internet began to gain popularity. The guard tried to persuade them and shouted about the need to leave the room, which had become dangerous. But he hesitated in the middle of an unspoken word and fell back with a groan. Because in the doorway appeared a man, impossible here, with swords in his hands and his swords grew straight from his wrists. With one of them, he strung the guard like a butterfly on a pin. That's when the people believed and moved. They jumped up from their seats, not knowing where to run or how to save themselves. Panic filled the auditorium. Everyone ran wherever their eyes were looking, not caring where they went. People stumbled and fell every now and then. Wade jumped up too, not knowing what to do. What he was seeing seemed like a horror movie, unreal in the here and now. Because the man was dangling a real sword without his feet touching the ground, and his boots were dripping blood in quick streams. His last thought was of Miri, who was about to return. Meanwhile, the assassin was looking at him, grinning contentedly. There was something strange about his teeth, too. Not just his hands. And his legs, too. Because he jumped up like a grasshopper, intending to leap on top of Wade. Wade ran fast and fast, saving his life from the bloody maniac. He was lucky he landed on the chairs and fell through the row. Because his scissor hands couldn't catch Wade in a tackle, but made him horrified at the sudden realization. Such limbs seemed to him something familiar. He had seen them in a picture. The most common praying mantis. The boy had acquired both its appearance and its habits. Looks like his food habits, too. Wade still thought he was the only one, but now he had to reconsider. The name of the insect spray appeared in his mind. He froze, realizing that there could be hundreds of them. 
After all, he wasn't the only one who had purchased it at the store and then sprayed it on insects and inhaled it. Meanwhile, the mantis guy stretched his lips in a carnivorous smile, promising him a closer encounter. And Wade ran from him down the hall like he'd never run before. And he raced after him in unthinkable leaps, aiming to hit him with his scythes from top to bottom. The game of catch-up had gone from scary to horrible when Miri appeared in the hallway, coming back from the bathroom. Wade couldn't help himself, and breaking, fell to the floor in front of her, not knowing how to save her from the monster following him. And Miri didn't even notice him. All her attention was focused on Wade. She didn't realize what was going on. The mantis stopped as well. He was puzzled as to why she wasn't running away from him screaming. It wasn't right. So he uttered the fateful phrase in a frightening voice, after which he clenched his teeth. Wade yelled for Miri to save herself. He was still lying on the ground. And the mantis was already flying in a sweeping leap toward his girlfriend, who was frozen in the hallway, unable to believe her eyes that such a thing was even possible. Meanwhile, down below the movie theater, a crowd had already gathered. Victims and ordinary gawkers were filming the extraordinary event on their phones, trying to catch that special shot. Suddenly, one guy who was looking up noticed what could have been the hit of the season. A girl was falling down from the top floor. In her wake, Shards of broken glass were falling and glinting in the sun. The mantis man had done it. He wasn't interested in human flesh, so he just shoved the girl down, leaving her alone with her real prey. Wade ran up to the window. He couldn't believe his eyes that the double pane glass had been shattered. And his girl was now falling down to crash on the sidewalk. And the cruel people below were filming the whole thing to put on the news sites. Such a sensation. This was the day he'd been waiting for with such fear all these years. Now he couldn't hide his ugliness any longer. Everyone would see it. He bit his lip, making a difficult decision. On one side of the scale, his normal life. And on the other, his girlfriend's life. Mary was falling and the only choice was either her life or his. From her eyes flowed, but not falling, but as if soaring upward drops of farewell tears. And he made up his mind, after all, he would have his life. But she will die irrevocably. Shocked spectators urgently raised their phones again, trying not to miss the tragic sight. Because a guy rushed after the fallen girl. Catching up in a leap, he stretched out his hand, trying to catch her. Mantis looked up, not understanding how he could have miscalculated, to let the guy dive from a great height after the girl. Meanwhile, Wade grabbed Mary's arm and slowed her fall. Mantis began to laugh. If the guy wanted to save his girlfriend, he had no way to do it. It was absolutely futile to jump into the abyss after the girl. The ground was getting closer and was already very close. A police car drove up to the building. The crowd was still holding their breath as the tragedy unfolded. Wade remembered Miri offering him her help. There was hope she'd forgive him for his deception, and he'd made up his mind. Miri felt a tug, and a weight came over her, pulling her against the guy's arms. Because Wade, clenching his teeth from strain, gave the command to his wings which straightened, looking for a way out and punching four sloppy holes in his cloak. And then he tried his best to flap his wings in order to slow his fall. Still, it was a first for him to fly. He slowly descended, tucking Mary under his knees so she wouldn't hit the ground. The mantis man glared angrily at his victim's unexpected upgrade. He hadn't counted on this. The gawkers couldn't believe what they were seeing either. And while the wind from the wings made it hard to look, but you can take pictures to post on social media all you want. The guy and the girl in his arms hovered. Wade was hesitant to land in the crowd. The girl in the cap watched the dragonfly man land with her mouth open. That was impossible. Because she was following one crazy person and found two, so she contacted her coordinator. In order to quickly arrest the madman who killed the man, she took off her cap. Beneath it were flexible antennae whiskers. The multicolored strands of hair no longer seemed like an unusual gelding and the cut of her eyes was definitely non-human. The man with wings was clearly visible against the evening sky. There were more and more people looking at this curiosity. The mantis was terribly angry. He suspected that now the prey would be out of his hands. Miri fainted from overexcitement. The dragonfly wings behind her boyfriend's back proved to be something her consciousness could no longer bear. Wade worked his wings and listened to the newness of his sensations. It was strange, but pleasant. The mantis could only grind his teeth angrily as he watched the boy fly away. He recognized the species of insect that had given the man its wings. 
It was his natural victim whose odor still stirred his imagination. Wade flew over the street, the boulevard and farther still, looking for the cross that would suggest the location of the hospital. He didn't know that his defenseless rear was causing the mantis to salivate in an unusually large way. He licked his face and saliva ran uncontrollably down his chin. He was so busy dreaming about tasty and healthy food that he didn't even hear how a girl came up from behind without a cap and stretched out her hand to his head. The impact exploded in his head with a cascade of colors that blinded him with their brightness. As he lay on the floor in unconsciousness, the girl looked through the broken window and pulled out a beacon to point the way for her co-workers, then looked at the rolling eyes of the mantis. It's a nasty-looking thing. The inside wasn't any better, but then again, so was she now. Then put the camouflage cap back on. The search is complete. All that remained was to wait for the rescue team. The only person demasking their community was approaching the hospital with the speed of dragonfly wings. But one day passed, another went by. Everything was the same. It was as if nothing had changed. At recess, the students chatted about all sorts of things. Except that the video of a man with dragonfly wings flying with a girl in his arms became a hit in the number of views. Wade had become very distant from his classmates. He couldn't lie to their eyes, and it was unbearable to feel their suspicious stares all the time. Even so, Wade considered it an extraordinary good fortune. No one had ever seen his face up close, the man with the wings of a dragonfly only from below. Besides, what had happened was so out of the realm of reality that many people thought it was just another fake. The only bad thing was that the past life from which he seemed to have escaped came back to him with its saddest side. It had been that way since kindergarten, and it was especially evident during his classmates' birthdays. All the kids, supervised by the teacher, would congratulate the birthday boy, and Wade would be afraid to go near the table because he didn't have a present. And how do you approach the birthday boy without a present? And although the teacher tried to make friends with the children and convince them that it would be right to call a classmate, the children disagreed. After all, he never gave them anything. The birthday boy said the last hurtful word, reminding everyone, including Wade, why he was different. Back then, the kids wouldn't accept him into their company because he had lost his parents and he sometimes felt like he was on a desert island, even among a crowd of classmates. Now he was alone again, because he was different from his peers again, and even more so than before. His former friend reminded him of that, when Wade felt the floor of his cloak being lifted as if by accident. He swung away sharply, turning to face the man who'd snuck up behind him and hit him on the head. The man even took offense. After all, he only wanted to see if he had wings. It seemed like a very good joke. Or maybe it wasn't really a joke at all. Since Wade's reaction was very expressive, the guys immediately began to suspect things. Wade was bitter to find out that they weren't his friends at all. It had only been a day, and they had already stopped talking to him like before. They had even begun to make jokes about him. The loneliness of being alone in the crowd had come over him again. Just like when he was a kid. He was looked at, he was whispered about, he was bypassed. Alone on the half-empty bus, Wade decided to see how much his social media ratings had changed. The situation was sad. His popularity was declining rapidly. His followers were dwindling. The only thing that kept his heart warm was Miri. He had handed her over to the doctors in an unconscious state, but he was going to visit the hospital today. She was still alive, and now the only hope was that at least she wouldn't turn her back on him. He'd gotten word from the hospital that she'd finally regained consciousness, and now he was on his way to see her. He remembered Miri's words, which had touched his heart then. Now he would really need her support. With these thoughts and hopes, he drove up to the hospital. All that remained was to get up and look into her eyes. Miri, upon seeing Wade, squealed loudly and began to move away from him. And the joyful smile on his lips quickly faded. Her fear was so undeserved that he wanted to talk to remind her that he had saved her. But the girl was trembling, screaming, and the medical staff hurried him out of the room. He looked at her and couldn't believe his eyes. Would it really end like this? Where had that kind and caring, always cheerful and satisfied with life girl gone? Now in front of him was a shaking, frightened stranger who stammering on every word demanded that he leave. After he was taken out of the hospital, it took him a long time to come back to reality. He was so shocked by the change in the girl's attitude towards him. 
Once again, he looked at his phone screen. Miri used to be smiling at him there among his subscribers. Now her icon was gone. She no longer considered him her friend. He returned home, dropped his raincoat in the living room, took off his shirt. He stood in front of the mirror, desperately wondering what to do now. His soul was in so much pain that he dug his fingers into his shoulder, scratching himself until he bled and felt no pain. The solution was simple. Cut it off and that was it. He clamped a rag between his teeth to keep from screaming, brought the scissors up to the wing. He tried to press them harder. The scissors trembled in his hands and then fell to the floor because now he was shaking completely. His legs wouldn't hold him up and he fell to his knees, shuddering in a fit of crying. Wade hated himself for his cowardice, but hurting himself, cutting himself alive was not so easy. So he'd shredded his wings. What difference would it make? The next morning was as gloomy as his mood. Wade put the hood of his cloak over his head, as was his newfound habit, to hide from the prying eyes of others. As the students rushed to their classes at the university, he went in a completely different direction. Feeling like the ugly duckling from the fairy tale that his entire family had abandoned. His feet led him to a high-rise building. The flights of stairs flashed before his eyes without affecting his consciousness. He woke up only at the edge of the roof when the wind blew in his face and mussed his hair. He cast his eyes downward, looking where he was about to fall. So futile did his life seem to him, and stepped towards the street. Cars were driving, life was boiling below, and he was about to meet his death. The wind blew in his face, mussed his hair and the hem of his cloak. It picked him up and squeezed him in its arms. Indeed it did, because suddenly his wings were open and working. Already used to the feeling of flying, they did it on their own. Wade got a nasty feeling of disappointment in himself. He'd been a failure even in this case. And it was the wings' fault again. They'd ruined his whole life. They'd ruined his death, too. But there was someone who truly envied him. Her voice came very close. Wade shrank back fearfully noticing the girl who stood on the vertical wall as still as if she were on the sidewalk, and the long pink and black strands of her hair were fluttering in the wind. This was something he couldn't even imagine, standing on a vertical wall. It was impossible. She mocked him, teased him, as if she didn't think his wings were a problem. Not to be unsubtle, she yanked her baseball cap off her head. Wade was dumbfounded by what he saw. Because on the top of her head were antennae, like butterflies and her suggestion was shocking. Getting rid of his wings was the fulfillment of his dream. But her antennae suggested that she knew what she was talking about. After all, she too was an insect man, just like him. After the technical access door to the rooftop closed behind them, he sharply closed his hand over her exit to the stairs, intending to interrogate her properly. He hovered over her, staring angrily into her eyes. What if she lied? But she wasn't particularly embarrassed. Without answering the question, she looked down slyly, making her own stipulation. Covering the non-human part of her body with a baseball cap, she offered to go with her and find out for herself. The news that insect people were very numerous, if they even had their own university, stunned Wade. And he didn't have to cross into another dimension to get to them, just take a few bus stops. The question of trusting such unconfirmed facts was important but not so much so that he couldn't give in to curiosity and involuntary sympathy for the funny girl, who looked earnestly into his eyes, eager to emphasize what she was about to tell him. And as if she looked into his soul, saw the sad ghosts of his past life, because she offered him exactly what he wanted most in this life. It was the most painful question of recent times. He was rejected by everyone in the end, because he wasn't like them. Of course he went with her. Of course he did, after such an offer. It was worth seeing for himself. There were no more passengers on the bus, so the girl continued the conversation and took out from the pocket of her jacket. It was the can he had been cursing for so long, sighing bitterly every time that he had ever picked it up at all. The girl knew more about this aerosol, about which she told him passionately. It was a highly effective insect repellent, but it had a strange side effect. One that changed a person's body, giving them the skills of the insect they killed. Wade even clenched his fists, so much so he wanted to get to the inventor who had created this horrible remedy. But the girl only shrugged her shoulders and lowered her head sadly. As they drove out of town, she told him everything she knew. However, the information was very scarce. Even on the World Wide Web, there was nothing about this aerosol. It was as if it had never existed. 
The girl, quickly typing a message, explained in passing that it was their work, insect people. They had taken care to conceal all information. And before he had time to be outraged by that fact, she got up and walked toward the exit. The door of the bus opened into a dark tunnel that was carved out inside the mountain. The girl jumped onto an uncomfortable ledge and walked over to the metal door of the electrical room. A huge arched recess was visible next to it. Embedded in the wall was a panel with buttons that had to be pressed in a certain order. After the girl entered the code, bright sunlight hit Wade's eyes. Where did it come from in the middle of the mountain? It was the blank wall of the archway sliding apart, providing an exit to the outside. The girl walked forward, explaining to the boy where he had gotten to, like an experienced guide, not for the first time conducting this excursion. And there was something to be surprised about. From the slope of the mountain, modern city buildings, multi-story houses, a tower were clearly visible. All this was drowned in the green of trees. Now Wade overtook the girl, eager to see this miracle, the university city hidden among the mountains. He was stunned, staring at the fantastic picture with a disbelieving gaze. Winged creatures with the most bizarre combinations of human and insect in them were circling in the air singly and in groups. No less strange creatures moved leisurely along the paths. Often they looked more insect than human. Such a number of brothers in misfortune was astounding. However, they did not seem to be suffering from their insect-like nature. Another man stopped in the tower opposite, moved toward the window. The mantis man smelled his uncaught prey from afar. But this time he had no opportunity to attack. His hands were restrained, a chain strapped to his belt. Accompanied by a guard with a taser in his hand, he was safe. And if he took one step to the side, the weapon would be deployed. The bloodthirstiness of the praying mantis was brutally repressed. So that although he choked with saliva, he went where he was told to go. The half-crazed look in his eyes, however, told him that if it were not for the chains, nothing would have saved his victim. Meanwhile, Wade walked slowly down the path toward the administration building, slowly because he was turning his head every which way, trying to make out all the creatures he saw on the way. He couldn't get it into his head that these were all ordinary people, not alien beings. There were even small children here, and they were not the least bit ashamed of their inhuman appearance. His guide patiently waited for the guy to get used to the fact that this was a normal reality, and he was not the only one here. She explained that all these mutated humans needed protection. The university provided it, which had grown over the years to a small town with streets, parks, daycare centers, and schools. While the shocked Wade tried to find the words to express his attitude to what he saw, the girl was already leaving to make arrangements with the professor waving goodbye with her long hair and he was left alone in the midst of a diverse crowd with a frightening imagination of non-human appearance. He went for a walk in the park, still marveling at the inhabitants of this strange place. They not only did not hide, but also embellished their unconventional appearance in every possible way, while he was still hiding his wings under his cloak. Wade walked around and pondered on reevaluating his values. A different perspective on his problem was new to him. Suddenly a May bug flew past his face, a very ordinary one. It almost flicked him on the forehead. Wade followed its target with his gaze. In the shadow of a white marble archway sat a gray-haired giant in a yoga pose. Honey was smeared across his chest, and insects sought him out. Insects crawled and crawled on the chest of quite ordinary-looking man. Without waiting for the annoying question, he immediately explained why he had bugs on his chest. And opening his mouth wide, he swallowed another loser, flattered by the sweet life. There was such a crunch from chewing the bug that Wade cringed. He walked away from the strange old man who ate such a disgusting thing. He stared after him. Wade didn't get far. In a moment, the old man was already unceremoniously pulling up his cloak to look at his wings. Wade immediately wanted to be as far away from the local madman as possible. His wings immediately carried him obediently to the other end of the clearing. The old man, strangely enough, was satisfied. He scratched his ear thoughtfully, showing an interesting tattoo of a human skull on his arm. His question was as inappropriate as his tactless behavior. Wade immediately remembered how Miri had reacted to his having wings, and it reminded him why he was here, what he was striving for, and what he wanted out of life. He answered the old man's question sharply, and Wade went straight to the entrance of the university. The man chuckled into his beard and watched him go.
he had reason to laugh. He already knew what the result would be. Wade had to go up to the glass tower, which glistened unbearably in the midday sun. Waiting there was the professor he'd been promised to meet by the girl who'd brought him here. Wade stared at the professor, trying to determine what insect ugliness was inherent in him. He found nothing, however, and that convinced him that the mutation could indeed be reversed. So he was very happy to meet the professor, the only normal person here, the one who actually turned out to be very understanding because he immediately picked up the remote control. To show him what it was actually about and what it looked like in reality, Wade stared at the screen, wanting to see this miracle that was now possible for him. They were watching a recording of the graduation party in a full wall format, so everything was very clearly visible. First in the line of graduates was a girl with a fly face instead of a face. The strange name of the ceremony grated on his ears, but Wade didn't hurry to ask. Then what appeared in the fly girl's paws was a goblet of green bubbling liquid. A disgusting looking proboscis was stuck in the goblet. The drink began to flow rapidly. Then the girl bent from the sudden spasm that twisted her. The glass fell out of her hands and shattered. Wade imagined how much pain she was in and his face twisted with empathy. The transformation began with her hands. The black fly-like graspers were becoming normal hands. Gradually, the wave of change reached her face as well. The fly face disappeared, and in its place appeared the face of a beautiful girl. She pressed her palms to her face and cried with happiness, unable to believe what had happened. Wade was unusually excited. This was exactly what he wanted. The professor answered in a detailed scientific way about a discovery made at the university. But then he took pity and explained in simple language, as if for a layman. Wade was shocked at how simple it was. One drink of the medicine and you're a regular person. And that vial of happiness was right in front of him, just a hand away. And he did reach out in a certain sense, starting to beg the professor for help. However, the bubble was immediately hidden behind his back and a categorical refusal was sounded. The professor, covering his eyes with his eyelids, began to speak of the difficulty of preparing this medicine. Wade bit his lip, waiting to see what reason he would be given for his refusal. But there was no refusal. On the contrary, it was a business proposition. The Institute was interested in having the best students and thus motivating them to excel in their studies. The professor offered him a deal. It came as a shock to Wade. A few more years of studying here would fulfill his cherished wish. Next, he and Jean went outside and were walking somewhere. Wade didn't even notice where. He was thinking. He was thinking out loud, because Jean suddenly interfered with his thoughts, telling him her own view of the situation. Wade stopped. Automatically, he fumbled for his glasses case and put them on his nose. He smiled cheerfully. Things were working out pretty well, even if not immediately, but he would achieve what he wanted. To make the transfer from one educational institution to another had to visit the main administrative building. There were a lot of students in the courtyard. Wade had already begun to get used to their inhuman appearance because he no longer paid attention to them. He looked at his new documents and tried to come to terms with this unexpected turn in his life. Before, he had never imagined that he could change the direction of his studies. Chance had decided everything. If it hadn't been for Jean, who had taken the trouble to familiarize him with the specifics of his studies, he might have made mistakes. Wade took her gift, opened it. In his situation, any information was needed like a breath of air. The notebook she held out to him contained descriptions of the faculties and notes on their specifics. The presence of excellent students was emphasized. Of course, he'd been drawn to the one with the highest percentage of honors students. Wade remembered the professor he'd been talking to. He happened to be the dean of that faculty. And besides, he was the one who'd already offered him a deal. So Wade decided. There wasn't much to choose from anyway. It was almost impossible to get honors in the other courses. Now he had to worry about the entrance exam. So he stood on the main avenue, looking around the central building with the intention of finding out how it could be done here. He used to go to the internet cafe. There he could study and have a snack without the distraction of cooking. He opened the notebook once more, hoping to find out how it was done here. Just as suddenly a hurricane blew past him, the girl came at the guy, toppling him to the ground and bringing her fist over him. It was the first time Wade had ever seen insect people fighting, and he gaped in amazement. There was a real beating of a man on the walkway because the guy wasn't defending himself, but the girl was pounding him as hard as she could. She kept hitting and hitting him with her fist. There were abrasions and even blood splatters on his face. Until the guy came to his senses and growled back at her, lifting himself up on his hands. 
Wade started to feel uneasy. Seeing students fighting like rabid insects was kind of scary. It was a good thing that Jean, who was retreating somewhere, was around again. She tried to calm him down. In between, she lifted the scorpion girl by the collar of her jacket with one hand. With her other hand, she grabbed the lapel of the injured guy's jacket and threw them apart, far enough and easy enough as if they were stuffed toys, not people. Wade watched the spectacle with a sagging jaw. His mouth was in that position all the time today, because the girl with the scorpion tail flew far away and hit hard, but no one sympathized with her. And the guy, coming to his senses on the ground, tried to recover his breath. Jean came up to him. She addressed him as if he were the one responsible for the fight, confident, as if she had the right to do so. Apparently, he recognized her, because, gasping in pain, he tried to say her name. From this, Wade learned that his tour guide was no ordinary student, but something like a head girl. But as he was picking up the words, she had already waved him off, telling him where to go, and went back to talking to the boy. Soon he was already sitting in the auditorium preparing to take the entrance exams. His neighbors were the same guy and girl, and there was so much noise from them that Wade didn't expect anything good from the training itself. In the end, he decided to concentrate on the computer monitor. If he didn't want to, he had to come here. And study hard, too. To survive student hell, he'd have to prioritize properly. Otherwise, he would not be able to achieve anything here, and his studies would be useless. The most important thing at the moment was to become an excellent student, and for that he needed to get into Professor Hinn's class. Meanwhile, Professor Hinn stood at the panoramic window and waited for a visitor which did not slow down. The professor turned to him, expecting to hear the reason for his so insistent desire to meet. It would be the same old man from the park who had so frightened Wade. That was what he had come for. The professors met each other's gazes. They were thinking about the same thing, about how a freshman would take the entrance exam without knowing anything about the specifics of getting into their university. Professor John stroked his beard thoughtfully. Would he be able to cope? The guy had just arrived and was immediately caught up in the exam. He remembered his expression before he left. The young man was shy of his wings. This annoyed the professor a lot, because in that case he wouldn't even dare to use them for their intended purpose. When the bell rang, Wade tensed up, expecting the entrance exam to begin. His eyes glazed over, his hands shook, and a cold sweat appeared on his face. Suddenly all the students started rushing to the windows and jumping out of them into the street. Wade crouched behind his desk in fear. He didn't know where to look. He didn't understand what was happening now. There was only one guess, and he didn't like jumping out the window after everyone else. His hunch was confirmed by the crazy old man who looked into the auditorium. Only now he looked very different. Even scarier, because now his whole look spoke of power and the right to order him around. Wade rushed to the window to see what the entrance exam was all about. The applicants were flying around, jumping from branch to branch, doing other things in the air. All in all, they were showing off their best behavior. Wade couldn't figure out why. Was this a university or a physical training school? An uncertain voice came from behind him. He turned quickly to its source. Who else was coming up behind him? Standing behind him was an unusual-looking boy. His insect-like appearance was confirmed by the short antennae on his head, the claws on his fingers, and his woolly knee-length socks, like those of bees or bumblebees. The boy took Wade outside, for the condition for admission was as strange as the students themselves. They went straight out into the verdant young forest. Along the way, the boy talked about the cardinal rule of university admission, a game of hide-and-seek. Who would have thought it? Fortunately, there was more than one winner. It was enough to get the sign of victory, a flash drive to become a student. Wade was terribly excited because he had unknowingly fallen behind and needed to rectify the situation. An unexpected question from the boy distracted him from his confused thoughts. Why would he want to know his plans? Unless it was out of politeness. The boy listened carefully to his answer. He was so impressed with Wade's grandiose plans that he nodded his head and smiled sweetly. He was a good friend, Wade thought. That was the end of their paths. Each had his own way to go in search of the professor. Wade climbed a hill that gave him a good view of the surrounding countryside. He was worried about the exam because he didn't know what to do. So he went wherever he was going. He had no other ideas, how else to look for the professor in the forest, until he remembered that he had absolutely no use for hills and tall trees now.
Dropping his cloak onto the branch of the nearest tree, he did the simplest thing available to him. Soared high above the trees, from where the forest could be seen for miles around. He could see everything from up high. His obedient wings willingly turned him where he wanted to look. He saw many flags, some farther away, others closer. The only question was, where would he fly? Moving his gaze closer to his fellow travelers who also had a hard choice to make, he hovered, literally and figuratively. Because a fierce fight had broken out below, two were already exchanging blows, and a third was running up to them. Nearby, four men hung on the giant, preventing him from getting to the chosen flag. Wade realized from the scattered exclamations that the scuffle was because of what appeared to be fierce competition and natural selection for admission to the chosen professor. Everyone was fighting everyone else. It was wildly strange. Why such brutal methods just to get into the university? He decided that he was not going to get his way with these guys. The flags were fluttering on the horizon. All that was left was to choose which one Professor Hinn was hiding under, or fly them all. But then he noticed something. From his height, he could see the top of the nearest mountain. So he flew toward it with his wings flapping vigorously, before anyone saw him and stopped him. There, near the broadcasting tower, the desired professor was seated in a comfortable chair. Above him, the red and yellow flag of the university was proudly flying. Professor Hinn was reading a book and was pleasantly surprised that this student had found him after all, and even so quickly. Wade was in such a hurry that he landed rather unluckily, plowing the ground with his nose and stretching out in front of the professor in a beggar's pose. But he was quite pleased with the result. He had never flown at such a speed before. He had also calculated that the students were not fools and knew where they needed to go better than he did. All he had to do was to overtake them. Getting off the ground, Wade waited to see what the professor would tell him. Would he take him into his class? The man walked over to a table with many bottles of water, took a box from there. Holding it in his hand, he complimented Wade on his ingenuity and good wings, and turned the box toward him. There remained the one flash drive he'd rightfully earned. Wade brought it up to his eyes, happily contemplating his first accomplishment on the road to success. He had made it. The professor, however, was not so optimistic. He sent him back to the auditorium, cryptically warning him to be careful. But who was listening? With the flash drive in his hand, it seemed like the pinnacle of happiness. And the unsuccessful competitors were not noticed at all, and they were very angry that they were late. Professor Hinn didn't waste any time either. He took out his phone and quickly scribbled a message. One last touch, and it went out to this year's newly formed group of applicants. Wade felt a vibration in his back pocket and was soundly surprised. No one had texted him in a day. He opened the message. The faces of all the students who had received flash drives were now available to the angry community of misfits and publicized targets. Wade didn't immediately realize the level of sleaze the professor had planted. He saw his face labeled as a target. Now he could be seen by everyone. Professor John was swaying in his hammock and chuckling contentedly at this. The background was a heated fight between students for possession of the flash drive. He was amused by what discoveries still awaited the newcomer on the way back and how he would deal with them. He was almost certain that he would fail. Jean was rather excited. She sympathized with the lad. Still, it was his first time in this place, and he might not be able to cope with the brutal selection. In an instant, the message was received by everyone concerned. The second round of the exam was announced. Wade realized what would follow only when he was taken in a ring by the ill-intentioned competitors. From behind the trees, the stomping of approaching feet of the other contenders for the flash drive in his hand could be heard. As he looked around, he almost missed the approach of the first applicant, but managed to crouch down, letting an impressively sized fist pass over his head. Then Wade was running with a big man chasing after him and trying to catch him. He was really scary. You get your hands on one of those and you're not going to be left with any broken bones. Wade stumbled and crouched on the ground, watching the man's approach with fear. The exhortations didn't work, and he rolled down the slope into the ravine, glancing back and not noticing the outstretched arms of the other challenger ahead. Or rather, a second pair of long arms growing from the back of the other challenger. Barely dodging the claws aimed at him, Wade realized that he would have to run very fast. He had to use his wings again. They had helped him more than once. They had now. The crowd that was closing in on him had no time to react to their speed and agility. 
Using his wings at top speed, Wade sped away, angry at the ridiculous entrance exam. Suddenly he heard a call that was different from the howls and growls that had been following him. The boy who had escorted him into the forest was peering out of the hollow of a huge old tree and waving invitingly. He swiveled his head around, surveying the space still free of his pursuers, and beckoned to him. Those who wished to study in the class of the most generous on grades professor rushed after the fugitive unceasingly, trying to catch up with him. So they ran past the old tree where Wade and the boy who had rescued him were holed up. Wade tried to catch his breath and thanked him confusedly for his help. The boy was embarrassed by his gratitude, not knowing how to say it. So he decided to show it, bringing his finger close to the forehead of the unsuspecting Wade. A sting shot out of his finger and pricked him right in the center of his forehead. It made his body go numb and settle into the dead wood inside the tree. And the boy unclenched his naughty palm and took the coveted flash drive from it. He warned him that the poison wasn't fatal and he'd come to his senses soon. Wade stared wide-eyed at the sweet boy who had suddenly transformed. He was growing into a monster, cunning and insidious. His face came so close that he could see the malicious grin on his face. The law of the jungle in action that was the main purpose of the entrance exam, and Wade hadn't even realized it. The boy turned to leave. The precious flash drive was in his hands. The newcomers never won this race the first time around precisely because they were too gullible. Flying into a hole in the tree trunk, he mocked Wade and his dream. Wade pulled out the sting stuck in his forehead. The bee venom turned out to be very weak indeed. With an effort, he rose to his feet, overcoming the tiredness and sluggishness of his limbs. He flew after the cute bee boy who had taught him a cruel lesson. He noticed his approach, but he was not going to give up so easily. But he worked his wings faster, hoping for the effect of his venom. Wade reached out his hand, wishing he could grab the traitor who was moving away so fast. The thought so gripped his mind that his eyes suddenly blurred. The world became monotonously green, but the boy's movements were visible several meters ahead. For this, he had to thank the dragonfly, which gave him not only its wings, but also the extraordinary sharpness of her gaze, which made her the queen of the hunt. A thousand eyes in each pupil and the world is transformed like a 3D game. After all, hunting dragonflies are the best hunters because of their ability to predict their prey's movements, which is exactly what's happening right now. Wade was on the path of the hunter, and the boy became his victim. As B looked around to mock the hapless newcomer, he suddenly noticed that the boy he had tricked was catching up with him, and the pursuer's eyes were glowing with an unkind green light. But there was no time to run away. He was overtaken by Wade's fist, which smacked him in the jaw for deception, poisoning, and unfair taunts. An entirely different flash drive was inserted into the computer's slot, a red-colored one. A soul-soothing enrollment message appeared on the screen. Jean exhaled a sigh of relief. Her entrance exam had been passed safely this year. She was approached by a classmate who sat in front of her. He was interested in the newcomer for some reason. Or maybe this was his way of getting back at Jin for unfairly rebuking him. His scorpion girlfriend next to him wasn't paying attention to them at all. The guy looked away and Jin cringed. Propping her head up, she thought about possible problems. She remembered the new kid and his confident determination to be the best. He wouldn't make it the first time. No one could. Just then, Wade's fist caught up with B-Boy, avenging his betrayal. B's fist involuntarily unclenched and the precious flash drive flew down. As his opponent's fist fell back, Wade saw the glow from the flash drive as it fell downward. He rushed after it, trying his best to catch it, to grab it. He didn't make it. Close to the Earth's surface, it was intercepted by another hand, clenched into a fist. The blacksmith girl jumped in time and intercepted the valuable gift of fate. Another jump and she was already far ahead. Her powerful legs could carry her even over the treetops. Wade was confused, of course, but not for long and was about to rush after her. At that moment, however, the B-boy's limp body whizzed past him. He noticed it in passing, and his heart grew cold with fear. After all, he had not expected that his punch to the jaw was capable of sending the man into a knockout. Dilemma. His flash was recoiling at the speed of the powerful legs of the grasshopper girl. On the other side of the scales of fate was a human life. Yes, the B-boy was his own fault, and his fall was no more than an accident. But Wade could not leave his death on his conscience so he grabbed him by his clothes without letting him fall. He looked back with annoyance at his load, but there was no time to do anything. 
so he rushed after the flash drive with it, dragging it through the air like a sack of shit. He dropped him at the top of the nearest tree to recover and get out of the situation on his own. I looked around for the blacksmith girl and didn't see her. He was terrified. His dream of becoming an excellent student was now under serious threat. In addition, his body suddenly stopped obeying him and fell on a fluffy tree branch. Wade fell through it, cushioning his fall and fell to the ground, immovable. His heavy breathing and excessive sweating indicated that he was poisoned after all. Eventually, his eyes began to roll back and his consciousness began to fade. Only the semblance of sounds remained, and in the darkness that enveloped his consciousness, a distant human voice was heard. With an effort, opening the husk between his heavy eyelids, Wade saw someone's feet. The sudden rush of adrenaline even allowed him to brace himself against the danger. He saw before him the crazy old man who had so frightened him earlier, the one who ate insects as a regular snack. Now he simply passed by, thus pointing the way out of the forest thicket. And his message came as a real shock. Wade had been passed out for almost half a day. Although there was still a small, almost impossible chance. Was five minutes a long time or a short time? Wade resented it. After all, what had happened to him today was extremely unfair. The old man stopped. He sighed at having to teach the stupid boy a lesson. He glared at him angrily from under his furrowed brow and scolded him heartily. Wade stood there like a spitting image. After what the old man had said, there was no doubt that justice would not be served. The law of the jungle was again confirmed only by a grown man. He drew his attention to the signal lantern with a video camera, proving that his efforts to save the boy bee had been in vain. Because there is little humanity left in the people here, and their capabilities are sometimes unknown to themselves. The old man crumpled the bag of cookies he'd just eaten in his fist and laughed at the newcomer's naivety. Wade hung his head sullenly. Gloomy thoughts overcame him. He wanted to live in a world of bug people less and less. As proof of his future futility, the old man tossed a crumpled bag into his hands, demanding that he throw it away. The cynical old man raised his index finger in the air, assuring him that from now on his destiny would be to sort garbage. He walked away, leaving Wade alone to relive his failure to get into the university. Wade stood there, feeling his hopes shattering into tiny shards and hurt his ego, a bitter resentment at the injustice, and resentment at himself, made a purely human heroic act and received in return mocking ridicule. It turns out that no one even needed it, but immediately slapped himself on the forehead for such thoughts. He's not a bug. He is, first of all, a human being. Since he had the very bag thrown to him by the old man in the palm of his hand, he decided to throw it away out of anger. But he remembered the old man's last words and hesitated. The hint was too clear in them. Unwrapping the package in a fury, he had expected to see anything up to a half-eaten gingerbread. But not this. His eyes widened in surprise and almost doubled in size. Because at the bottom of the gingerbread bag was a flash drive, not the one he'd lost, but a different one. Wade vividly recalled all the recent events, the words and actions of the unceremonious old man, and realized he'd given him a chance, a ghostly one, but a chance to win. Professor Hinn was walking towards Professor John. This meeting was not a pleasant one for him. After all, he'd done something that wasn't quite legal. And indeed, he immediately suspected him of humanity and kind feelings for the boy. For example, because they had all observed the rescue of the boy bee. Prophet John thought about how to answer him in order to get him to leave him alone. The surest way was to excuse himself with another experiment. And he'd be believed, because he always tells the plain truth. But without elaborating on the details, Meanwhile, Wade flew with all the power of his wings toward the university building. Though he felt he could have gone faster, tears filled his eyes. At the speed he was going, the headwind was already cutting them. And if he closed them, he would be like Professor Hinn, smeared on some surface. Remembering something, Wade slowed sharply and reached into his pants pocket. There lay his glasses. Opening the case, he was glad they were unharmed by his fall. Immediately putting them on his nose, Wade felt almost happy. Now he could make real speed without fear of wind or dust getting in his eyes. His speed thus became quite prohibitive because the world around him merged into streaks of color. At this time, the laziest students were hanging out in front of the university windows, hoping for a free gift. The watchman immediately warned them that a new victim was approaching. Everyone immediately cheered up and prepared to rob as a real gang should. They came out to meet him, pointing their weapons and fully utilizing their abilities. 
Despite this, the air vortex blew past, blowing the wind and spinning Spider-Man around its axis. They had to chase the guy back to the auditorium before something irreparable happened, and the flash drive could still be taken away. However, a red-haired guy from the established freshman class jumped out in front of them. He was followed by others. Soon the defeated gang shamefully fled from the walls of the university. Only one loser was not in time and roared in pain, lying on the ground. Something large whistled and swiftly descended near his head, forcing him to raise himself up fearfully. But he was prevented from completing the movement by the scorpion girl's foot. Nearby stood her boyfriend next door, and in the distance, a disgruntled djinn folded her arms across her chest. She had received an unexpected message from Professor John and was now wondering what it was. While her classmates were once again figuring things out amongst themselves, Jean looked up to the windows of the classroom and smiled. At least she had obeyed the professor's orders. Wade, not even realizing the collision had occurred, skidded to a halt at the window of the classroom he needed. The only open laptop shone its screen, waiting for him. Sliding the flash drive into its slot, Wade waited for it to boot up and quickly entered his passport information, in a real hurry, until his five minutes were up. That was it. From then on, he was considered an official student. A different course, though, not the one he was going to enroll in. Sweating profusely from the effort, Wade read the lines that appeared before him, and collapsed, exhausted, onto the back of his chair. He didn't feel disappointed. He'd been lucky enough. And the course, did he care what course? As he rested and pondered his prospects, an unexpected message arrived on his laptop. Wade stood up, staring at the screen. What could it possibly be? And from whom? He even stood up from his chair, so much so that what he was seeing didn't fit in his head. No rest. Immediately upon enrollment at sunset, classes began. The employees went home. Some of the windows of the university were lit up with the light of someone else working there. And Wade was led out by the guards at arm's length or rather prevented him from even entering the lobby. No excuse could convince them that he had a right to be here. Wade stared at them, wondering how to get to the designated auditorium. Just as suddenly, a voice was heard from behind him, and his student ID was shown to the security guard next to his shoulder. It was Jean who took care of him again. She found out where to find him and brought him the document. From there, they were already walking together. While Wade shook leaves out of her hair, she told him a little about herself, and about the man who would become their primary teacher, tried to comfort his ambitions of becoming a top student. Wade cheered up and looked at Jean more welcomingly. With friends like these willing to help him, he could do anything. As he read the text on the badge he owned, Jean looked back at him, a great deal of doubt read in her gaze. But she was only joking at his self-confidence. Why dissuade him otherwise? Finally, they reached the hall where the teacher had gathered them. Already at the entrance, Wade was caught up in the cheers of the students sitting there. They knew him here. It was unexpected. Everyone here was looking at him. To feel like a star here was incredibly strange. He hadn't realized that the internet was available to insect people as well, and they were actively using it. Only the guy at the top of the row suddenly pounded his fist angrily on the tabletop. Wade recognized him immediately. The unforgettable fight in front of the university. And the guy had accused him. His accusations appeared to come from the past. It was the first time Wade had heard what appeared to be his defense. This group of misfit students had had something to do with the fact that he hadn't gotten a visit from the Secret Service. Shocked, Wade stood frozen in the middle of the classroom, unsure of what to say. Jean had gotten to the red-haired boy and slapped him on the top of the head with her notebook to stop him from talking. She stood up for Wade. Since she was an eyewitness, she knew he had no choice then. All the students, especially the girls, smiled sweetly at the, well, almost, almost national hero. Even Jean had supported his decision then, even though it had been unusually difficult for her. Wade stood there, accepting the accolades, not knowing whether to thank or apologize for the inconvenience. He didn't realize he'd been in the public eye the whole time. Eventually she left, covering herself with an assignment from the professor, and he was left standing there, not knowing what to do next. On the highest tier of the classroom, a mature man was watching this performance. With a haughty chuckle through his teeth, he decided that it was time to bring order to the place, his own order. While the redhead was muttering something unpleasant under his breath to Jean, who had left, this student from the back row approached him from behind. Before he could even look back, 
He slammed his head into the countertop. He got a nosebleed and lost consciousness. Wade was surprised by what had happened in front of him. He'd seen a lot of things today. Maybe that's the way it was done around here. Because the man took the floor, he had been quite rude to everyone here. And since the most likely competitor was permanently disabled, he made a strong demand that his words be taken into consideration. The argument was that the guys with the bats had entered the auditorium. Thus, he wanted to assert his leadership and the last word in a possible dispute. The students trembling with fear did not know what to answer. His demand was impossible to fulfill. It required no study at all. And why would he do that? Placing his hands on the shoulders of the nearest students, the man answered why. And he discovered an original way to become the first to study, simply by removing the passes to the university from his classmates. His underlings began to walk through the rows of the auditorium and rudely take away the students' badges. Wade was outraged, giving some cutthroat students hard-won student ID. His wings immediately went into motion. He flew up to slam his fist into the face of the rude man. But he didn't even flinch in response, just smiled boredly. The next thing Wade saw was a bat flying toward him. Then complete darkness fell. There's no telling how long it lasted. Because Wade woke up lying in bed with a huge lump on his forehead. The bandage kept the blood from flowing and his head was splitting with pain, but he was alive and that's what mattered. Sitting up on the bed, Wade looked around. At the medicine table, Jean was holding sacred. She briefly explained what had happened while she arranged the used medications in the cabinet. Wade reached to see what had happened to his student ID and saw that it was gone. Jean reassured him that it wasn't a problem. After all, it was just a regular piece of paper and she headed for the exit. Wade stared after her, trying to figure out if those guys were stupid enough to go after a piece of paper. She looked back at him at the door, wishing him a good night's rest, but her gaze wasn't calm. Wade was touched by her concern. She had bailed him out of difficult situations time and time again. But remembering Miri's behavior, he had to admit that things weren't always what they seemed. A husky male voice suddenly echoed from the next bed. Wade flinched and looked over. There lay the redhead from the auditorium. Of course, he didn't know anything. He'd been knocked out at the very beginning. But he'd gotten pretty excited when he'd heard that the students had been stolen. Wade tried to calm him down with what Jean had told him, recounting what she'd said. Only it didn't calm the redhead down. On the contrary, he even raised himself up on his hands to look him in the eye and made him think with his head before taking someone else's words at face value, Wade thought. It appeared that Jean had lied to him. Why would she do that? And then he remembered her words, back then in the auditorium, defending him from the attacks. She said she would have done what he did. She'd saved him in a hopeless situation. Meanwhile, Jean was standing in front of a gang of rabid bugs on the shore of a mountain lake. Just in case, she gave them a chance to change their minds and return the student loans amicably. Of course, they didn't. On the contrary, they began to surround her, waving their bats. The gang leader put on his student IDs and grinned contentedly. His real target was in front of him. All that was left was to reach out and take it. Not his underlings, however. The first cheeky man met the ground, sealing his head into it. The second, when he also stretched out his hands to her, going to grab her, he saw a roundhouse kick to the head, beautifully executed from the turn. The leader grinned disappointedly at the stupidity of his friends and began to remove the student's neck. While the girl was dealing with the third, he stretched out his outstretched hand with the student IDs clutched in it toward the water and shouted, drawing her attention to it. Of course, she rushed towards them, intending to snatch them away. She couldn't let the student IDs go missing. Suddenly, the jacket on the ringleader's back cracked and additional limbs began to burst out from there, just like a bug's. Jean didn't immediately realize who she was facing. While she was parsing his appearance, he had already completely transformed and introduced himself as an aquatic predator. He grabbed her arm and threw her into the water, into his habitat. After falling into the water, Jean immediately jumped up, spitting and screaming with rage. And from above, the ringleader was already flying at her, aiming straight for her head with the sharp peaks of his claws. Holding his claws and pushing them away from her face, Jean went underwater. This was not a good thing. After all, she didn't know how to breathe underwater and only now realized the danger. While her hands were busy clawing, Jin's throat was caught by the ringleader's human hand. Then a second, and he began to drown her in the shallow water, taking care not to leave any marks on her neck. 
His friends watched calmly as their leader drowned the girl. And it looked like it was over. For the man was frozen in a bowed posture, and the water around him had almost calmed down. As suddenly a green lightning bolt flashed over their heads, causing them to duck involuntarily. Standing in the rain of spray, they tried to figure out what was going on. The girl sitting on her knees in the water was coughing up the liquid that had gotten into her lungs. Coughing, Jean looked at the fight going on very close by. There, Wade was punching the face of a male swimmer who hadn't expected this change of circumstances and had unwittingly gotten underneath. Meanwhile, his underlings had died down and were shouting amicably from the shore, trying to get a glimpse of who had interfered with them. Of course, they recognized him. They had seen wings like that only recently. The ringleader recognized him, too, and was surprised to see the guy again so quickly, his right fist reflexively clenched, and aimed right at Wade's nose to end their conversation. But missed, because the guy suddenly twisted out of the path of his swing, and his eyes turned green again. The dragonfly's gaze gave him back the ability to anticipate his opponent's movements. A strong swing that met with no resistance drew the ringleader's arm away, turning him sideways toward Wade. It was at this point that Jean woke up and shouted to Wade to get the hell out of there. The ringleader looked in her direction, grinning wildly. Because at that time, the claw of his beetle limb was already heading for the unsuspecting guy's neck from behind. And it pierced the absolute void. The boy was no longer where he had been. He was quickly dragged backwards and away from the swammer. Breaking free from Jean's grasp, Wade flew upward in indignation, reprimanding her for interfering. In response, she revealed to him the true nature of his opponent and his strongest side. Wade looked around. There was water all around, and he was the only one who could fly. What was to stop him from snatching the girl from the lake? The ringleader, however, had a very good lure. Student passes again hung dangerously close to the water surface. Behind his back, his associates had gathered, and the gang was once again ready to deal with the unruly students. Wade was actually genuinely angry at such unprincipled and unscrupulous means of getting what he wanted. He was ready to fight. Jean, however, chased him away. She was clearly making a decision and looked away with her fists clenched. She explained her request by saying that all these bandits were after her, and it was up to her to deal with them. Then she raised her hand to the neck of her sweatshirt, determined to unzip it. But Wade disagreed. Flying closer, he lowered himself beside her, stepping into the water, and reminded her of her own words. A wide, sly smile spread across his lips. Jean stared at him and couldn't understand what was different now. Why was the boy beaming with happiness? He pointed his finger toward the shore so she could see the new actor approaching. It was just that Wade had seen his red-headed friend finally get there. And he had a personal beef with the gang, which they found out about immediately. No one could stop him, didn't even try. It was a surprise, and everyone would just take his beatings obediently. He was particularly good at kicking. His grasshopper symbiote gave him that ability. The leader, of course, recognized him. He knew who to bash his head against the table first. He was looking at Des the grasshopper, but he saw a movement on the side of the couple in the water with the corner of his eye. And he managed to get the student passes out of the hand of Wade, who was after them. And he made a deadly circular swing with his beetle limbs, but to no avail because the guy had time to see and pick up his feet. But he didn't stop there. He hovered over the leader of the swimmer and began to tease him. He would fly under his paws from one side, almost hitting him with his chest. Then he'd jump up on the other side, where it's closer to the student passes. The leader held them close to his chest, just in case, being incredibly angry at the suddenly bold guy, and was trying to figure out what he was, because if you know that, you know his weaknesses. And Wade went for the ram. He turned in a flare and he took off toward the leader. As he slipped between the claws flapping behind him, he only pretended to be after the students. In reality, he was well-versed in physics. The weight of a body as it accelerated increased several times, depending on acceleration. And he accelerated very well. Consequently, the impact was like a battering ram. Blood spurted from his broken nose. The ringleader's head, by inertia, skidded backwards. But he did not fall. As he returned to his original position, he struck back with his claws so hard that water splashed in all directions. Wade barely had time to get out of the line of attack. The ringleader, cradling his broken nose so it wouldn't bleed so much, began to negotiate. Glancing in the direction of the girl he had offended, he turned to the boys with an offer. 
His accomplices lay who were unconscious, who were exhausted. It was necessary to try to negotiate. Meanwhile, water bubbles appeared behind Jean, who was walking in the shallow water toward the shore. And out of the water jumped the last of the ringleader's handmaidens. He immediately took the girl in a tight grip, yelling victory. But she did not consider this pathetic attempt of victory, a swift elbow strike, and the enemy flew half a meter away. Only in that time the leader came so close to her that she didn't have time to dodge him either. It's good to have friends to watch your back. Wade was just in time to grab the swimmer's paws, which were raised to strike, and pulled him up over the water with them. The leader looked up, but he didn't have time to say anything, because Wade dragged him by his paws out of the water and onto the shore. In a semicircle, he slammed his head into the hard ground so hard that sparks flew from his eyes. As the ringleader regained consciousness and roared with rage that he had lost, Wade snatched the student passes out of his hand before he could think of anything else. Told him everything he thought about his methods, which were unacceptable even for a bug, and took to the air, getting ready to fly away. Jean watched him go. Today he had revealed himself to her in a new way. She didn't know how to feel about it yet. However, she would always remember this moment. The university didn't wait for its heroes, it didn't even know about them, and student life rolled on. Student cards were left in the most prominent place where they were taken apart by classmates. It was John who had begged him to do it this way not the other way around. What she was afraid of, no one understood, but the guys heeded her request. It couldn't be said that Wade was upset. The glory of being a hero somehow didn't appeal to him the first time around. At least he wasn't alone now. And the two-bedroom student apartment allotted to him made him happy. After all, now he had no one to be shy and hide his wings. Unpacking his new things, Wade enjoyed the perks of his new life, until a heavy hand rested on his shoulder. A familiar voice behind him informed him who it might be. Des Grasshopper loomed over his head. He'd been friendly so far, but Wade remembered what he was like in anger, and that was frightening. The guy's disposition turned into a friendly hug and a not uninteresting hint for Wade. And then a pair of ringing girl voices came from the doorway. Jean and an as yet unknown scorpion girl had come in with their purchases. They were carrying a case of beer and snacks to go with it. Wade even turned pink at the amount of friendly attention that had been poured on him personally. A beautiful girl. John leaned close enough to him that he could look into her eyes. The student dormitory was still buzzing for a long time. Students were celebrating their admission to the university. After which bottle of beer, the conversation broke into pairs. Wade was enjoying his discoveries with Jean, and Des was once again fending off his girlfriend's insistent attentions. This moment of relaxation and for the first time in years, complete peace of mind was worth the price of admission to this university. That night, far out in the woods, the results of their evening adventure were being summarized. The swimmer leader stood at attention in front of a tall tree, sweating profusely. There, on a lower branch, sat a beautiful masked woman and reprimanded him for his failure. He tried to justify himself and assure her that he would get the cure next time. The lady was surprised. Why had the performer gotten it so wrong? After all, she was negotiating in the third person. So the woman jumped down from the branch to the man. She had a sharp stinger sticking out of her back. A few precise blows, blood spattering from the wounds. And now the weeper is completely safe for everyone, including that he will never tell what and for whom he was contracted to do. And the lady, no longer fearing exposure, lifted the mask from her beautiful face with her bloody hand. Her gaze was fixed on the distance. Her words about the head carried her thoughts away, toward the lockup where the most dangerous criminal was being held. She had already taken the first step toward his release. Yesterday's daylight auditorium no longer seemed as inhospitable as it had yesterday after the attack. But Wade was still nervous. First time, first lecture, and immediately first test. Jean, who sat next to him, touched her finger to the guy's hand, which was trembling with tension and tried to calm him down. Her reasoning was sound and reasonable. Wade was again embarrassed by her attention and concern. Friendly help was something he wasn't used to yet. Then a familiar old man entered the auditorium, striding vigorously. He swept swiftly to the pulpit, and started up the chainsaw he had brought with the usual gesture. A madman with a chainsaw in his hands was something Wade had always dreamed of seeing in his nightmares. So he smiled the blissful smile of an idiot thinking he was crazy to see such nonsense in person. 
The playground was not empty at this time of day. About a dozen people were frolicking on it. That's where Wade jumped out, running away from the old man. His friends ran beside him. Behind them came the monster with the chainsaw. The area was instantly deserted. Wade wondered what right this old man had to do such a thing. Dez's answer was stunning. There was no way Wade could imagine this madman as a respected professor, much less his mentor. But Jean, running to his right, confirmed that such training might well be part of the educational process. And reminded him of the bitterest day of his life, when a crazed mantis had forced him to reveal himself to Miri. How he had run through the corridors then, saving his life. At these words, the old man paused, and the boy saw that he was racing across the playground only them so far, obviously for not coming to class yesterday. He wanted to make it clear to the negligent students why they were enrolled in his class. Wade was breathing hard. He wasn't used to this kind of training, but Jean had suggested that it was possible and necessary to use his advantages. And the professor confirmed it, cranking his chainsaw to full power again. His threat to take away his chance to be the best student scared Wade more than the chainsaw. And the game of catch-up continued. The old man chased them around the playground like he was a maniac. Wade barely had time to jump away from the chainsaw that whizzed by his neck. Which reminded him of running away from a praying mantis in a movie theater, racing with death. But then Dez could hardly deflect himself from the chain, which was spinning at breakneck speed, driving him to the left and to the right. When the saw went straight for his friend's throat, threatening to cut off his head, Wade used his wings to pull his neighbor away from the circular swing of the native curator. The old man noticed it. So did the boy's sharply green eyes, paused, allowing a sigh of relief. His conclusions, however, were so overwhelming to Wade that he stiffened and didn't notice how the chainsaw, describing a semicircle, broke their friendly tandem with Dizadi. But Wade was no longer here. His thoughts had taken him away because the professor's words sounded like a judgment. To become a true dragonfly was to be a bogeyman to humans, people like Miri. The old man had noticed his inattention and had already reached out to him, about to take him out of the game. But then Jean intervened, running past and knocking the boy out of the curator's swing with her attack. She was close enough to bring Wade back to reality. And then they watched together as the professor raced Diaz around the playground. He'd already adapted and was able to use his leg strength to dodge the chainsaw. And even make jokes in the process, making puzzling jumps and rolls. He had to be rescued before the professor got completely pissed off. This was greatly aided by the dust veil raised by the dragonfly wings. And, while the old man waited for it to disperse and settle down, to continue chasing the students, they ran away from the clearing to hide in a secluded place. The woman walked down the long prison corridor with an easy strolling step, and at her feet lay a breathless staff. She was on her way to fulfill the orders of her head, and no one dared stand in her way. A melodious voice was heard. The prisoner's eyes, clouded with madness, opened slightly. Through the bars of the bars, a mask was staring back at him, yet beneath it was a beautiful woman. Behind her back, the destroyed guards could be seen. At first, she tried to open the code lock with the usual student pass taken from Plavinets. There was little hope of that, however. Then she looked back at the front door. There was someone standing there, and she was waiting for him. The b-boy who was supposed to get her a professor's pass. She hugged him in gratitude and began stroking his head in a pitying gesture, discreetly drawing him closer to her. Although just at that time, he began to come to his senses and realize what he had just done. And he didn't understand at all why? And the side of his neck itched mercilessly. After all, that was how the poison of submission had gotten into his system. The pass was immediately used for its intended purpose, but he was not released from the embrace. The door was unlocked. Instead of red, a green light came on, and out of the cell came the mantis man, biting his teeth and pulling off the remnants of his shackles along the way. And since he had been starved the entire time he had been here, the smell of insect men was like the aroma of delicious food to him. Two men stood before him. The woman was hugging the trembling boy. She knew what she was doing. Because the b-boy had been sent to be eaten as a sacrifice, and she herself had flown farther away. The last thing the boy didn't immediately see, as he squinted fearfully at the woman, was the face of the madman leaning over him and saliva dripping from his mouth. By the time he noticed, it was quite late to do anything. There was no one to respond to his screams. 
only the woman. But she stood there with interest, watching the process of feeding her ward. She even lifted her mask so that she could see better how the mantis was tormenting the body. The blood spatter didn't bother her. It was more of a research interest. Wade stood in the middle of another clearing, bent over, getting his breathing back to normal. His companions were more physically fit, for they were hardly out of breath and waited patiently for him to come to his senses. In the gap between the bushes, it was clearly visible that the old man did not waste time on the fugitives. And while they were trying to get away from him, he gave their classmates a good chase. Now there was a bunch of them lying half-conscious on the edge of the playground. Wade knew at once that they were to be Professor John's favorite students. And he lowered his head sullenly, regretting that he hadn't gone to the more merciful Professor Heen. Jean tried to cheer him up a little, but Wade was no longer so easily led. If this was the method of teaching, then becoming the best would have to be at least for the sake of surviving. Des, peeking from behind the bushes, suddenly shushed the chatterers. They immediately lay down to peek. The girls in their group were running away from the professor. Suddenly, one of them fell. The second could not leave her friend. And he was approaching slowly, slowly but inevitably with his chainsaw. One of the friends tried to protect the other because of her injury. However, the professor was inexorable. Tears had already come to the girl's eyes. They were not used to such an attitude. It's even surprising. How did the qualifiers pass? That's what the professor thought, but he had the perfect way to weed out the unfit. A stroke of a chainsaw and the girls were ready to give up being his students. Only now things weren't going according to plan. The chainsaw stopped. Wade flew up from below and supported its hull so that it wouldn't go down again. The professor looked at him over his shoulder in bewilderment. What does this guy think he's doing? And he suddenly started accusing him of abuse of power. Isn't that funny? The guys behind the bushes were frightened for their friend, who dared to reprimand the formidable professor. However, the professor did not seem to be too angry because he condescended to explain. In confirmation of his words, the chainsaw again increased its revolutions and roared louder. Wade stood as if hypnotized and didn't know what to do next. And the professor decided to raise the stakes as punishment for everyone. First of all, to the insolent student. Jean and Des listened intently to the sanctions they received at the mercy of their friend and got angry. Wade was just as angry, but the reason was the deranged professor who didn't seem like he was going to teach anyone at all. Though his gaze was serious and thoughtful. What did he want to teach him, all of them like that? Wade listened to his advice, trying to figure out what this old man really wanted from him. They were barely visible or audible from the prison block, but the mantis man didn't need to be. He whirled his head around, looking for a familiar scent. The woman's exhortations didn't bother him at all. The mantis man could sense the food in him, and drool ran down his chin at the smell of the guy who had been running around here recently. That smell had haunted him in his dreams since their meeting at the movie theater, and now he knew where to find him, the dragonfly guy who'd run away from him the first time. For Wade, the situation was frozen like a fly in amber, friends sitting in ambush. The girls are lying at the professor's feet, and he stands with a chainsaw on his shoulder, waiting for action from him. What to do? My hand involuntarily clenched into a fist. He really wanted to hit very badly, and he did it. The fist flew straight into the face of the old mocker. But at the last moment, he ducked, and Wade swept past, bringing his fist down in vain. His sarcastic sneers were unbearable to the lad's ego. So he tried again and again to hurt him, but again and again he left the line of attack. The friends watched these attempts with intense attention. Des was worried that they would be expelled, but Jean thought otherwise. Wade, who was completely pissed off, was able to see the world through the eyes of a dragonfly. This was the moment the professor had been waiting for. He was eager to see everything and understand how it worked. While the guy was flying at him, he just stood there and stared. But when one of the guy's hands grabbed at his shirt to prevent him from dodging, at the same time, the other was draped over his head and was rapidly approaching. In a single fusion movement, the professor held a counterattack and put the newcomer on the ground. The guys behind the bushes involuntarily shuddered from the force of their friend's blow to the ground. The girls whimpered quietly and involuntary tears showed in their eyes. And the professor leaned over and made another remark about his stupidity. Wade lay on the ground, unable to breathe for the pain. He waited until he felt better enough to breathe. At the same time, he tried to think with his head to see what advantages the professor had that he could outmaneuver them. However, the latter disappointed him. 
He didn't use the insect's advantages, only human strength was involved. And again he showed him his tattoo. Apparently it made sense, though Wade couldn't make any sense of it. But his substitution of the insect advantage was unnerving. However, the professor threw the chainsaw to the ground. He had other tasks at hand. He stood over the defeated student and began his lecture. To show his weakness, something small flew at Wade. It fell, and he saw a dragonfly sitting on his chest, a toy dragonfly. But he didn't even think about it. Immediately, he jumped up and began to throw it off him, screaming with indignation. The professor's gaze clearly reflected what he thought about it. But continuing the lesson, he suggested to consider on this example the shortcomings of understanding oneself, one's true nature. The boys listened attentively, imbued with the importance of scrutinizing their advantages, and Wade considered the toy in his hand and recognized the limitations he had created for himself. Recognize his unwilling symbiote as part of himself? That was a hard thing to do. Almost impossible. So many years of hating yourself for being different with ugly wings behind you. Hearing the genuine fear in his girlfriend's voice and being rejected by her because of it. At this very time, a rare but loud applause suddenly erupted behind their backs. Everyone looked back at the source of this unexpected and inappropriate sound. The applause was coming from a strange masked woman who knew very well who she was talking to. The professor, on seeing her, immediately tensed up. He looked as if he had met a ghost. She confidently walked along the path towards the men, and already by this made everyone anxious. The guys in the bushes became alert. What this woman was saying was flavored with such contempt that even the girls felt it and wanted to get off the path. The one who was injured didn't have time and was thrown off with a subtle flick of her tail. Droplets of blood splattered, and Wade didn't even realize with what or how it had been done. Des didn't hesitate long and leapt at the woman from behind the bushes, from behind an ambush. Not so much an ambush, because he was met by a stinger ready to attack. He hadn't expected it, so he turned gray with fear. A prick, and the poison spreads through his body. Jin ran after him from the bushes, but she didn't have time to do anything. Because his body was picked up by the dangerous woman, whispering a few comforting words to the boy. She sealed his fate, and Wade couldn't figure out what this woman was doing here. Her words were scary to the point that he couldn't believe they were true. He wanted to take them as an evil teacher's joke. But he only knew of one creature that preyed on human insects and took them as food. He looked absent-mindedly at the woman. Was she really talking about him? There was no need to guess, because the professor was struck with a sudden blow from the back, piercing him through and through. Jean stopped fearfully, not knowing which way to run or what to do. Wade stood beside the professor, saw the huge hole in his back, and didn't know how to act either. Because behind the professor's back, the toothy maw of the mantis guy from the movie theater was smiling at him. He was already reaching out his spiky, scythe-like arms toward him, as if intent on pulling him toward him. And Wade stood immovable in front of him, staring at him with frightened eyes, just like the other day. Jean, too, recognized the man she'd come to the human city for, and didn't recognize at the same time. He was different, more calm and collected. The woman was leaving, taking Des with her, and even though the mantis didn't really want to obey her, he followed her obediently, leaving behind the wounded professor, the girl leaning toward him, and the dragonfly boy frozen in a stupor. The professor glared angrily at them, but he couldn't do anything about it. In fact, it was a miracle that he was still conscious. And the woman looked back and even opened her face for a moment so that he would remember this picture of her triumph. Jean was ready to rush after them. After all, her friend was hanging on Mantis's shoulder. But the professor held her back by grabbing her hand and squeezing it hard. He held her with one hand while with the other he dialed a call on his cell phone. It was all he could do now. Jean was yelling at him about how they couldn't wait until the university to gather the rescue team. By then, Des would be impossible to find, for they would lose sight of the kidnappers. However, the professor was undeterred. He must protect the students who do not yet know how to fight such an adversary. But in his argument with the student, he completely forgot that she is not the only one here who is so reckless. It wasn't until Wade flew up above his head on his wings. He looked up and heard that the boy was about to fulfill the terms of their mock argument. After all, he had lost. Wade glanced almost cheerfully at the university officials and offered to remove himself from the student body voluntarily if it prevented him from following his friend. And he took off up the hill. 
he was followed by the angry shouts of the professor. Wade flew hard, driven by guilt. He couldn't forgive himself for his stupor in the face of danger. Now he remembered Dez almost fondly. It had been his first real friend, after all and Wade deliberately looked through space with his newfound dragonfly gaze, searching the immediate area of the forest, trying to find the kidnappers. He found them not far away at all. They were calmly pacing along the path and in no hurry to get anywhere. At this time, the professor was roughly cursing at the guy while Jin bandaged his wounded chest. He compared him to a gnat that flew to fight an enemy much stronger than him, and lamented that his lesson had never reached the stubborn mind of the reckless child because for the dragonfly, the mantis is the first and natural enemy in the food chain. While Wade was wondering what he should do now, the mantis suddenly looked up at him with a satisfied look in his crazy eyes. He sucked in air with his nose, showing how happy he was to see him. The braids of his arms came into motion. The first time, Wade deflected with ease, though his heart thumped loudly with fear. Then he flew between the sides of his arms much more lively, dodging and looking for a gap in his defenses. He clenched his fist tighter as he contemplated doing the same thing he had done to Plavoons. Finally, he ducked under his mantis elbows and got his chin from underneath. Mantis even stopped for the sake of this moment, because this attack was like scratching behind his ear, and Wade launched himself backward, shaking the bloody hand that had smashed into Mantis's chin. His knuckles were shattered beyond repair. He couldn't even imagine that such a thing was possible. Mantis had revealed himself to him in a new way. He was no longer human, not if he maintained his inhuman form by cannibalizing it. Here he had to admit that this enemy was beyond him, and his eyes widened fearfully. He could already see himself impaled on this monster's sharp scythe arm, and he shrank back cowardly as he once again approached him. But it was the bored voice of a woman who was tired of waiting that drew Wade out of his depressed state of mind. Dez sat beside her unconscious, and Wade remembered why he'd come here. Not to fight the enemy, no. He'd come for him. Dez was just beginning to regain consciousness. He was seeing unreal images that weren't easy to make sense of. At first he thought it was his friends calling him to another soccer game. But then the words began to somehow not fit the reality. The angry shouts were annoying. Another loud scream brought him to consciousness. Dez opened his eyes. It was Wade who was fighting with his last strength against a monster with spiky scythes instead of arms. Des couldn't believe his eyes at first, but the reality was echoed by the numbness of his entire body and a painful itch in his chest. The woman also turned her attention to the boy who had regained consciousness. It wasn't good. But what should she have stung him again? The fact that a second dose of poison would kill him didn't bother her. Dez tried to move away, but his body wasn't listening very well yet. At that moment, Wade dropped his opponent and darted between the woman and his friend. He put his back to him, trying to buy his friend at least a little time. He already considered himself a suicide bomber. Dez was angry. Why should he run if Wade himself wasn't in less trouble? He barely had time to maneuver to avoid getting caught in his opponent's arm braid. And he was also keeping the wasp woman from approaching Dez, shoving her aside time after time. Dez reminded him of their last conversation over a beer in the dorm, about Wade's stupid tendency to sacrifice himself and his interests for someone else. Wade hadn't found anything to say then. He really didn't understand why he was doing it. And Dez had remained meaningfully silent then, letting him figure out for himself that he was a heroic fool. To think of revealing himself, destroying his own future for someone who didn't even want to see him afterward. And now Wade had found his answer, lying on his back under Mantis's imminent strike. Dez looked at him and thought that he too would regret letting it end like this and would do nothing for his friend. The adrenaline surging from these desperate thoughts allowed the shackles of stupor to be thrown off. His hand reached for the collar of Wade's jacket and pulled it behind him away from the pair of perverts deep into the woods where they'd be safe. They stood stunned by the sudden escape, a very quick escape, it must be said. For Dez had developed an incredible speed, even for him, and was galloping away into the forest. His species advantages, which he had never used before, suddenly erupted. A special knee device passed down to him from his accidental symbiote, allowing him to leap a distance that was nearly three times his own height with a powerful push from the ground. Like a grasshopper, Dez pushed himself off the ground, flew the next distance and dragged his friend's limp body behind him, and on the way, he reprimanded him for all the resentment that filled his soul. 
he felt incredibly relieved that everything had turned out all right in the end. The mantis grimaced frustratedly. His toy and his food had escaped him. The woman hissed angrily at him. But he was suddenly alert and responded to her with a very different tone, anticipatory. Because his sniff told him that the game wasn't over yet. When they stopped for a break, Dez suddenly heard Wade make an unconventional suggestion. And he got mad. He'd seen how the mantis had already overpowered his friend. If he hadn't intervened, the outcome would have been predictable. Trying to get through to his mind. He's already covered in blood and he wants to come back. Wade was well aware of the level of danger which for him alone was lethal. But his conclusion was unexpected, and Dez didn't know what else to say to him. Wade just didn't want a repeat of this horror and wanted to end it once and for all. And he also cared that there would be casualties, more and more. The monster had to be fed. Dez had to agree with that. But he turned away stubbornly, not wanting to get involved in a suicidal venture. But Wade raised a finger, drawing his attention to one important detail. Meanwhile, tragedy was unfolding on the playground. Jean was trying to stop the professor from bleeding. The other girl's girlfriend was also hurt, and she was shedding tears over her. Jin's thoughts were with the guys, but right now the professor's life depended on her efforts. How could she leave him behind? Suddenly a gust of strong wind blew up and something zipped past them, turned around and rushed back. Only dust and small leaves followed in its wake. John shuddered and looked around anxiously, but she saw no one. But the professor understood, but remained silent. It was hard for him to speak now. The pair of kidnappers never moved from that clearing. Mantis sniffed warily. He had lost the scent of his victim again. The woman urged him to leave. Then a familiar odor wafted from the other side, and Mantis's gaze went there. All he could see was a dragonfly guy in glasses throwing strong vines around the neck of his escort. She was already flying through the air with her back to him. Mantis involuntarily noted the suddenly increased speed of his victim and clenched his teeth with anger. In a minute, the woman was crucified on the nearest birch tree. The vines seemed to wrap themselves around her arms, legs, and torso so that she could not move. Finally, Wade tightened the last knot at the woman's feet and became fully visible. Then he set off again, aiming for the mantis. Maybe at this speed it would get him through? He kicked him this time, sparing his arm. The blow threw the mantis's head back. And nothing else. He smiled, confident of his invincibility. Wade shook the limb that had been knocked off the mantis and decided what to do with it. Meanwhile, mantis was attacking him. He leaped forward and swung his scythe arms. Wade dodged, but didn't get far. He dodged again and again, but he was still dangling in front of the mantis. He was clearly executing the plan he'd told Dez to distract Mantis. Dez rushed to his rescue, making his longest jumps. Seeing Wade running over Mantis and still unharmed, he tossed him the stolen item. Eventually, Jean did realize what had changed on the set after the strange gust of wind. The news that the chainsaw was missing only brought a slight chuckle to the old man's lips. Wade caught the chainsaw high above Mantis's head so that he couldn't intervene and knock it out of his hands. Dez shouted something encouraging to him from the ground as Wade tried to figure out the controls. Finally, the chainsaw started, roared, and smelled of acrid, syrupy smoke. Now Wade was armed as well as Mantis. He had two spiky scythes. He had the buzzing death in his hands. The answering glare of the enemy was frightening. Mantis swung first, hoping to reach his foe with a wide, circular swing. Wade waited for just this moment, straining to see the trajectory of his scythe. The professor's chainsaw whirred and the first limb flew into the air, scattering bloody droplets through the air. Mantis screamed terribly with unbearable pain and desperate rage. He had lost his arm as well as his advantage. However, he was even more dangerous now. Wade had barely had time to fly away when the second scythe swept past him with unprecedented speed. The boy stood at a distance, waiting for the mantis to weaken. But mantis didn't seem to be relenting. He was so used to thinking of himself as the peak of insect evolution that he was now hungry for revenge. So his jump was unexpected and merciless. It was no longer a game of eating. Now it was hungry to kill. A chainsaw raised in time to meet him prevented him from reaching the boy. The mantis himself had caught his scythe on its twisting chain. But a scythe is not a human hand. The chainsaw roared and creaked, sparks flying, but it couldn't cut through her armor. Mantis's leap ended with a fall to his knee. He lowered his head, preparing for another swing. But now his target was his enemy's weapon. Without it, and with only a scythe, he was still able to deal with the cocky fellow. 
Parts of the broken chainsaw flew in all directions. Wade was unarmed, except for the fact that he'd just managed to fly away unharmed when her tank exploded from the damage it had done. Such a blunder, that he might lose his weapon, had not been thought out by Wade, and now he was frantically thinking of what to do. At that moment, Dez entered the fray. He sprang up on his improved legs and struck Mantis with all his might. Mantis swung back so well that he pushed the guy who was attacking him away. Dez fell and hit his head on the ground. The outside of the scythe didn't do him any appreciable damage, but it wouldn't last long. Wade, seeing how the situation had changed, rushed to his friend's rescue without thinking. Mantis stepped on Dez with his foot to stop him from running away, and Wade was able to grab him with his scythe. The teeth of the scythe sank into the boy's body, preventing him from getting off the hooks. And the mantis began to pull him toward him, licking at him with its black, inhuman tongue. Wade twitched, trying to twist out of the grip. But nature doesn't mess around, and he couldn't do it. The mantis's jaws had already expanded to a width unimaginable for a human. It was capable of biting off the entire head at once. But then the rustling of leaves was heard and grew stronger and stronger, which immediately fell on their heads from above. Following the leaves, a real monster jumped down from above, in a veil of smoke. Mad and furious, its swift movements were impossible for the eye to catch, until it froze, sweeping everyone in the fight in different directions, and it was Professor John. Wade looked at this miracle and did not know how to understand that the mortally wounded professor was now running as well as a young trotter. He remembered the wound, the blood pouring from it, and his despair. Even now, the t-shirt on the professor's back was torn in the same places as before, but the holes showed healthy, whole skin. The professor had to explain that it was their medicine that had gotten to that level. Then he turned his attention to Mantis, who had fallen down by the tree trunk. He was still recovering. So were the boys, although they were not quite whole, but they were still alive, which is a lot. Mantis got up and wanted to continue his revenge for the severed hand. The professor stood opposite him, kneading his hands before the fight. But Mantis was even crazier than the professor, because he impatiently rushed at him without thinking of the consequences. The professor had a score to settle with him, too, and he prepared himself for a heated encounter. Even his left arm, the one with the tattoo, was beginning to smoke suspiciously. When the mantis hovered over him in a desperate leap, swinging his only remaining scythe, all the professor had to do was clench his fist and counterstrike. Wade stared at the professor's hand as if it were an amazing phenomenon of nature. It couldn't be. Yet it had. Nature is capable of unique experiments, and insects are the most successful of them. Their abilities are sometimes beyond comprehension, because they can survive even in extreme conditions. The professor had an armor-piercing arm, inherited from his symbiote, the bombardier beetle. It was his image that was imprinted in the intricate lines of the tattoo, not the skull at all. And the armor-piercing fist flew to meet Mantis's internal exoskeleton. The moment before two powerful enemies meet, it's beautiful. So much rage and superiority in each of them. The boys froze, anticipating this encounter. And then they didn't know what to say because their coherent speech was taken away by the fantastic ending of the battle. Smoke, steam, the smell of burning, and the defeated foe at the professor's feet, baked to a hard crust and no longer thinking of resisting. The professor once again demonstrated his still-smoking hand so that the students would have a good idea of what they were dealing with. This was a first for Wade, so he asked again, as he might have misunderstood. The professor obviously didn't want to answer, but the persistent student wouldn't back down. So he had to clarify some things about taking advantage of insects, which boiled down to one well-known saying, everything has to be paid for in the end. Wade looked at his trembling hand and thought about how hard this must be. The professor didn't tolerate self-pity, so he ruthlessly reminded him that he, too, would pay for his inhuman abilities. But glancing up from under his frowning eyebrows, he admitted that it was his own fault, because he'd rushed into things when he was young. His advice had stumped Wade. The old man had a way with riddles. Evening Nest was calm and serene. After the event that had gone down in history as the Mantis escape, everyone wanted to rest. True, the main characters had to rest in the hospital, wrapped in bandages. But at least they were not bored together. And they talked for a long time, exchanging impressions of the events of today. They were especially concerned that the vines had been torn and the strange woman had escaped. 
A little later, Wade pulled out a clipboard and began to look at it intently, at Dez's interest. He showed him an open page with a description of the dragonfly's features. The advice of an experienced senior companion should have been heeded. There was a full moon that night, and through the unshaded windows, the room was illuminated by the bright moonlight. One of the pillows was unoccupied. Wade was sleeping peacefully. Dez was not. He climbed up on the bed, covered in unwound bandages, and at first he just sat there, staring blankly at one point, but there was an unusual puncture on the back of his neck, a purple stain. The poison of subjugation injected there made his body go in a hypnotic trance to where he was ordered to go. That's where his mistress was waiting, and they met under the moon, unusually bright this night. The venomous wasp used her advantage to subdue the lad. She bent over his face and looking into his eyes began to speak in a caressing voice of hatred. Gradually, her palms embraced and clenched around the guy's neck, intending to strangle him. Except that the man's massive body came crashing down on top of them. The woman managed to bounce away and even covered her mouth, which was open in astonishment with her palm. Her actions were calculated and the professor's hand was already smoking. He was ready to avenge his students without regard for his own health but first he wanted to hear the answers to his questions. After all, everything that had happened today had not been an accident, especially since he recognized her, knew her before. The woman looked at him without fear and with a haughty smile on her lips. Just at that moment, they had a witness who had crept up unnoticed and stopped nearby to listen. Wade had been awakened after all by the sharp sound of the creaking door and had decided to follow what had happened to his friend and now he saw Professor John gently lowering Dez to the ground, and the latter still continuing to sleep soundly. Then he turned to his companion and continued their uneasy conversation. The fact that they knew each other, and judging by the beginning of the conversation, knew each other quite well gave him a bad feeling. The woman stood there with her chin up arrogantly and did not want to talk, but she still had to answer, and she took the initiative in negotiations arrogantly shut down the topic of respectful communication between the professor and the former student. Professor John scratched the back of his head, not knowing how to talk to her. And because he was so blunt, his fist immediately burst into flames with barely contained anger. He released the flame into the ground. The woman managed to bounce back, though, and was unhurt. His anger and rage sounded a frightening threat to the woman. And she only laughed at him, fully confident in her own strength, that she could stand up to him. The horrible accusation of the murders she had committed in Nesta had caused Professor John's already too often suffering fist to blaze again. Now he released the flame ahead of him, at the woman as promised. The powerful blow snapped the trunks of two trees, unwittingly setting the dry wood on fire. However, the woman avoided being hit by the flames by leaping upward, and, doing a somersault over his head, sang into his ear an ominous promise about his future. The professor turned to follow her, fending off her counterattack from the air. Now they froze opposite each other, ready for a duel, the professor's blazing fist against the poisonous sting of the wasp woman. Suddenly a quiet but insistent ban sounded and a third man intervened in their confrontation. Professor Hin came out from behind the trees and stopped beside Professor John. He greeted the woman politely but coldly. His eyebrows were unhappily furrowed because to allow another fatal battle he could not. He chased her away, and the woman looked at the two men incredulously. Would they really let go so easily? Professor John whispered to his colleague his conclusions based on his observations. However, Professor Hina had his own thoughts on the matter. Human voices could be heard in the distance. People were rushing to extinguish the fire started by Professor John's flames, and the woman became nervous. But before she disappeared, she left the last word to herself. Her promise was frightening in the certainty with which it was spoken. The professors watched her gloomily, suspecting that their next meeting would not end so peacefully. Then they turned back to the blazing fire, which was already being extinguished by a team of firemen. It was just about time to talk. Professor Hin, glancing at his colleague's trembling hand, first chided him for being extremely careless. Then he reassured him that their mutual acquaintance was being followed. It was only then that he noticed that they were not alone here and that their conversation had a witness. Professor John turned to the unwitting spy, frowning his eyebrows angrily. That it was Wade didn't surprise him at all. He was standing there, supporting his friend ready for a reprimand. But there was none. 
On the contrary, Professor John took his friend's body from him and peacefully explained what would happen to him next and carried it to the treatment building. Wade didn't know how to ask the professor about the woman and the conversation he had witnessed. However, he started the conversation himself. It was important for him to convey to the boy the seriousness of the situation. He told not much, only the most basic things without going into details. The woman was a mystery. Her behavior, her motives were unknown, only that she was extremely dangerous. Professor John asked for silence. It was important to prevent unnecessary gossip. Wade strode forward, brooding. Then suddenly he turned and stood right in front of the professor. He confidently put his palm to his chest and asked to become a personal student. Agreed to what the professor had said about him in their first class. Confessed his weakness and declared a burning desire to fix it. And once again he insistently asked to be a student, looking firmly and insistently straight into the professor's eyes. The latter stood opposite him and his lips parted in a crooked grin. He answered with only one word, but how much meaning was put into it? The medicine at Nesta was top-notch, and after a couple of days, just as lunchtime rolled around, the boys were out of the treatment center. The canteen was full of students eating lunch. Everyone had their own diet and preferences, depending on their insect species. The boys preferred the food familiar to all humans, meat with a side dish and scrambled eggs. Des, after his diet at the asylum, he ate a lot of meat and he was eagerly telling Jean the story of his strange awakening. Wade was silent as a fish, and Jean looked at him suspiciously, but she asked nothing. Then their attention shifted to the food stand. A mutual acquaintance of theirs appeared there. Des immediately became agitated and hardened. Her appearance among the mass of students immediately caused an extraordinary amount of excitement. She was a unicum even among the insect men, because her symbiote was not an insect. Constant research was not easy to tolerate, and now it was a little understandable why she had such a hard, unsettled nature. Wade thought it would be apropos to ask Jean what her symbiote was, too. That caused Des to cough in surprise. And Jean's hesitation before answering, it was obvious she wasn't too eager to answer. In fact, she didn't answer either, just declared her affinity for the dragonfly's natural enemy. After that, Wade somehow didn't want to find out any further. That's when Des got up from the table about to run away, because his longtime girlfriend, who too often ended up in fights, had appeared on the horizon. And this time he received a friendly greeting in the form of a kick to the body. While Des was picking himself up off the floor, Dorothy sat down in his chair with her feet on the table and gave him the latest news. Wade glanced questioningly at Jean, and she explained what it was all about, glancing sympathetically at the battered Dia. That's what she'd been doing back in the human city when she'd first apprehended Mantis. Wade thought about the fact that at this university, the training seemed to start with the practical part. And theory would be taught that way, by the way. He remembered what the professor had already taught him. Now he would have a lot of practicing to do. John, waving her fork, added some interesting information for everyone present. Dorothy, the scorpion girl, nodded her head in satisfaction at the mention of her name. Des stared glumly at Jean. He wasn't expecting anything good if Dorothy's name came up first. Wade held his breath, waiting to see who else she would name as part of their team. The last one she named was herself, and he exhaled in relief. The four of them had bonded enough to be happy about this choice by their handler. Besides, he was pleased that his friends were stronger in fights, which meant there was a really good chance to be the best. Wade looked at his team and suddenly felt them all as the closest people to him, almost relatives at least for the duration of the university. A few days later, the weather suddenly turned bad and it rained continuously. The only thing to do at such a time was to stay indoors. Professor John chose the gym. However, even there he was found. From the doorway came the insistent voice of his assistant. His message was alarming and untimely. It was already evening. What could have happened at this hour? The aide brought the tablet to his eyes and read the latest news from it which made the professor stare at his aide in disbelief. After all, his most promising team couldn't have been so foolishly set up. A few days ago, when the teams were formed, the professor had given them the simplest assignment, just to see how they would work together. Showed them a memorable can of pesticide and told them to find similar ones. Wade felt uneasy at the sight of the spray that had changed his life so dramatically. Meanwhile, the professor took the remote control of the projector, intending to show the presentation. 
On the screen appeared commercials that dealt with various aspects of human life and the use of insect pesticide in them. And the logo of a one-day company that sold out to an unknown party and disappeared immediately afterward. The map showed the region with the most victims of the pesticide. Wade suddenly realized that he was lucky he hadn't been discovered sooner. And the professor went on to talk about the reverse medicine that is produced from this product. In this way, he emphasized the importance of the assignment and even promised a maximum score for its completion. There was an immediate uproar among the students. Everyone had an opinion about the assignment. Wade also thought that the professor was too generous, and that was suspicious. But he didn't wait for additional questions and immediately sent everyone to their groups to make a plan for future searches. The next day, they went to the human city. It was strange to be back to normal people, without insect additions in their bodies. They split into two groups to speed up the process. Wade found himself paired with Jean. They were walking down the street and coming up with the most unexpected places the pesticide hunters hadn't looked yet. Suddenly, Wade stopped and started laughing happily, causing the people around him to be bewildered by this act. Then he grabbed Jean's hand and pulled her toward a place he knew well. Because it was where he lived, had acquired wings, and still thriftily stored the pesticide in his desk drawer. With joyful hopes, he opened the door to his own apartment. And he saw what could not be. Everything was turned upside down as if the place had been thoroughly searched. He stared in horror at the state of his apartment. Jean, too, was shocked at what she saw. Wade immediately rushed to the desk, pulling out drawers in search of pesticide. But all he found was a lone battery. The aerosol was gone. Someone had taken it. Wade was desperate. All his hopes were crumbling like a house of cards. Searching in vain for a way out of this situation, he thought that Jean might have once done exactly as he had and stashed the pesticide in her house. But she only pulled her cap deeper over her eyes, hiding their expression, and refused to do so. She left the apartment first, not intending to discuss her decision. Wade stared at her in silence, wondering what had happened to the always cheerful Jean. As a result, they sat down at the bus stop and began surfing the internet, looking for possible locations for their future searches. First, they went around to all the neighborhood stores and asked salespeople about the pesticide they needed. Then Jean caught Wade doing something inappropriate. He was relabeling the label for a completely different product at a loss. Stopping his futile actions, she handed him a glass of Coke in return. Then they sat on a bench and discussed today's accomplishments. It was all for nothing. Wade regretted that the canister from his house had disappeared and was at a loss to guess who might have stolen it. To distract him from his futile musings, Jean asked him a question that had long piqued her interest. Wade pondered what to answer. The question was unexpectedly difficult. The assumption that Miri was the cause of it all made him cough, causing most of his drink to end up in his lap. Struggling to cough out the remnants that had gone down the wrong throat, Wade tried to object. He remembered Miri again so vividly as if she were standing right next to him. Evaluated his feelings. Now after some time and many events, they had faded considerably, and had to admit that he hadn't considered her his girlfriend for a long time. All his life he had dreamed of being like everyone else and living like everyone else, and wings prevented him from feeling complete. He also realized that he no longer blamed Miri for doing that to him. He could see that the girl was really scared. Jean tried to cheer him up by praising his current capabilities. After all, she was even a little jealous of his wings. She didn't have any of her own. Wade suddenly realized that he had never thanked Jean for intervening in his life and preventing him from doing the wrong thing. He remembered his condition then. It had been full of hopeless longing and misery. And that meeting had been the best thing that had happened to him in his whole life. He didn't know how to say it. All words seemed silly to him. They couldn't express the depth of gratitude he felt. She, too, remembered that day and the effort it had taken to lure him onto the bus, and so she found an excuse to point out to him that he was all right now. Well, as much as possible. Wade agreed that since then his life had become more meaningful and interesting. In return, he decided to inquire about his life before in the human world. Jean listened attentively to his question, only growing darker with every word he spoke. Then she hid behind the brim of her cap again, unwilling to discuss her past. Wade didn't want to back down, but the phone suddenly rang, ruining his plans. It was Des and his message gave him hope that today hadn't been a wasted day. He stood outside an abandoned warehouse, the evening sun illuminating its walls. 
Wade was glad there was enough antidote for everyone. Jean, on the other hand, jumped up from the bench and stared at the phone in Wade's hand in horror. She even reached out to pick it up, trying to warn Dez that it was dangerous. But the connection to it was suddenly gone. While Wade was thinking about what had happened, she was already running down the walkway, heading for the nearest cab. As she ran, she explained what had frightened her, and her fears were very convincing. Wade suddenly realized the depth of the trouble his friends were in and hurried up to follow. It was not until darkness fell that they reached the address, and Wade utilized his wings to make it as fast as possible. Jean headed straight for the main entrance of the abandoned building. Wade was in no hurry to follow her. He had an uneasy feeling about it. But they entered the warehouse together. Their lonely footsteps sounded loud in the empty building. Wade glowered at the phone, looking at the racks and the boxes lying on them, and Jean shifted to a jog. It startled her that their friends were nowhere to be seen. Wade almost fell, catching the toe of his sneaker on a heavy box that was on the ground. The light of a flashlight highlighted its contents. So many cans of the pesticide they'd been looking for. He even picked one up, examining the label. He wanted to believe that they had indeed gotten lucky. Only suddenly there was a painful shriek and the sound of impact. And Jean began to fall, pouring blood uncontrollably from her side onto the floor. Wade watched it and couldn't believe it was real, and the jets, poorly discernible in the darkness, were actually blood. However, there was a ghastly gut hanging over her body, its claw dripping blood from the wound it had inflicted. This gut turned out to be the elongated arm of a guy not seen before, who stepped forward out of the darkness to meet it. Wade shifted his gaze to Jean lying motionless on the floor and the pool of blood that was spreading around her body. And his eyes darkened with rage. How could you kill a man for nothing, his gin? He ran full speed toward the killer, raising his arm as he did so. Wade had been orphaned early on, so he thought he'd already suffered his share as a child. When he looked at the portraits of his dead parents and cried with resentment at being abandoned. In his youth, when he was suffering from loneliness and learning to make adult decisions. But even now, his heart was torn by the fact that the girl who had shown him real life was leaving his life. That her body was a broken doll lying on the dirty floor with no signs of life. He realized that his life had changed abruptly again, because all the light in his life was dead. All that was left was revenge, and he took off, rushing towards the killer, ready to kill. The one, confident of his advantage, smirked relaxedly. Because his clawed hand was capable of holding his enemy at a considerable distance, only Wade had his own advantage, dragonfly eyes able to anticipate his opponent's movements. And his fist swung toward his foe's face as the claw grabbed air. It hit him squarely right in the jaw, knocking him back a couple steps. The blow, reinforced by the inertia of the oncoming flight, shattered his enemy's jaw. Kneeling down, Wade watched what his opponent would do next. He calmly set his jaw, as if it wasn't the first time he'd done it. Then he stood back up and asked how Wade was feeling. His knuckles were indeed shattered, but now Wade suspected that it was not from the force of his blow. He'd seen it in Mantis before and knew what it was. To dodge the claw's new swing, he reached up to the ceiling. When he heard the earwig guy talk about absorption, he didn't understand it at first. Then Wade almost threw up when he began to explain the meaning of the word, especially when he started describing his own sensations of eating human meat, even if it was hybrid. And he drooled as he talked about his discovery and boasted of his own monstrously increased abilities, which he had never had before. Ordinary human life disgusted him, unloved work and the bullying of his boss. He took his first revenge as soon as he had the advantage of an insect. His dream was to dominate the world. Though looking at this non-human, it was clear that someone had done a great job on his mind. And this person knew everything and prepared a trap for the stupid students in advance. A new throw of the earwig's claw almost took Wade by surprise but he managed to back up a little, knocking years of dust off the roof rafters with his wings. The earwig didn't realize what had happened, whether he'd caught his prey or not. But the guy grabbed his claw by the claws and persistently pulled them apart. There was blood on his hands from hurting himself on the cutting edge. However, there was only one thing that excited him. The reason for his girlfriend's murder, the fact that his bright sunshine was only killed to enhance this subhuman's abilities. Earwig's claw grasped the air again because the guy was no longer there. He was rushing toward him again so fast that the claw couldn't keep up with him. Another blow to the jaw bent Earwig's body to the ground, 
Immediately, a second blow was delivered to the right jaw, which further shook Earwig's balance. The pincher did come back, though, and grabbed the guy's leg to pull him away. Wade felt a sharp pain pierce his leg, and he was dragged backwards. And then he was slammed against the wall, spattered with crumbs. He jumped to the ground near the very box of aerosol where he had stood at the beginning of the fight, and stared fiercely at his mocking opponent. Who thought he was the pinnacle of evolution? He swung his weapon again, and his claw was closing fast on Wade. It hit the floor, exactly where he stood. But it was wasted again. The overly fast guy was flying towards the earwig again, and his fist was about to attack its target. Claw managed to knock him off his trajectory, launching him with a swing towards the opposite wall. Lime sprinkled again, confirming the force of the blow. Blood trickled from Wade's cleft forehead, flooding his eyes, but he flew forward again toward the earwolf, because the unforgettable image of Jean smiling at him was before his eyes. For her, he was ready to kill with his bare hands, without regard to his own injuries. And yet he reached Earwig, knocking him to the ground with a single blow. His head twisted unnaturally to the right, crunched, and returned to its original position, eliciting only another mocking confession. Wade was breathing hard and glaring angrily at this Terminator, quickly deciding what he could use to piss him off. Forced back as the Earwig's claw rose again for another swing, he remembered clearly the lesson Professor John had taught him in the night woods. He dropped to one knee, preparing to attack the Earwig again, and worked his wings. He took a counter-acceleration, intending to use what he had secretly practiced. Suddenly, he fell to the ground, not even halfway to the earwig. His wings trembled and did not want to lift their owner into the air. As he pondered what had happened and how to proceed, the earwig even paused his attack. Wade remembered the professor's words about the cause of his own weakness and was greatly afraid that this could happen to him, too. It was such a bad time. The enemy's claw was already approaching, preparing to grab his suddenly exhausted opponent, and already approached the defenseless throat, threatening imminent death. Suddenly, the unbelievable happened. Jean rose up and kicked at the flexible joints of the claw, taking it away from her friend's throat. The earwig howled in pain. Apparently, his limb wasn't as protected as his head. Wade looked at the suddenly resurrected Jean and couldn't believe his eyes. He'd already buried her in his mind. She looked perfectly healthy. The only reminders of the fatal blow were the holes in her shirt and the blood. She took off her jacket. The earwig was angry that he had miscalculated so badly, and now he had two opponents at once. And now his claw was aimed at the girl as the more dangerous one at the moment. Wade shouted to her from behind in fear that she wasn't running away or moving at all. However, she had a reason not to be afraid of the claw coming at her. She had kept that secret until now. Wade stared in shock at what the fragile girl was doing. Her irises glowed bright orange as she fixed her gaze on the earwig's claw. She did something that made his claws begin to melt and turn in the opposite direction. Feeling his flesh smoke and melt, the earwig screamed terribly in pain and fear. Wade stared mouth open at this awesome sight. Jean's capabilities were opening up to him in a new way. And she was ready to flatten earwig with a single angry glare. And she raised her hand, about to do so. Once upon a time, back in her old human life, she had lived in a poor neighborhood. Her classmates had been cruel to her because of her financial situation, and even deliberately waited for her on her way out of the house to jab her harder, because she didn't live like the rest of them in spacious apartments with her parents. She lived in a semi-basement with her older brother. One morning, going to school, she saw a group of her classmates right at her doorstep. They were filming her on their cell phones while giggling obnoxiously. Jin didn't expect them to be capable of such a thing. For the sake of petty revenge and vanity to publicly humiliate a classmate. Especially a guy who once wanted to date her and assured her of his sincere sympathy. Now he was filming her on his phone and mocking her. Not for long, because he got kicked in the bad head and slumped forward of himself on the sidewalk. This was done by Jean's older brother who had always protected her and cared for her as best he could. Jean was grateful for his care. After all, he remained the only person close to her after her parents died. Studying, working part-time all the time, but never leaving his little sister behind. The house in which they occupied the semi-basement was very old. And its inhabitants were different. Besides people, there were hordes of cockroaches. Once again, noticing a mustachioed pest running around the floor of the house, Jean couldn't help but scream in disgust. It woke up her brother, who was sleeping off the night shift in a hard day's work. He grabbed a can of repellent and immediately rushed to his sister's aid. 
However, from frequent use, the can was completely empty by then, and Jean was left to shake with revulsion in fear that now she would have to spend the night among the insects that were sure to swarm out of every corner when they found out that the repellent had run out. All night long, there were strange noises coming from the door of their apartment, and even the cats that ran by were afraid. By morning, the apartment was trashed, their belongings strewn across the floor, and the brother and sister slumped against the wall in exhaustion. The brother pulled out his phone to look for something more insect-killing and came across an advertisement for a new pesticide. Gene doubted the ad was true. But after all, you should be sleeping at night, not chasing annoying cockroaches. Her brother was very kind and caring, dreaming of a better future for his little sister. But that was the last time they sat together on the cold floor of their little apartment. Afterward, Jean was left all alone in a world hostile to her and completely without any source of income. The only person who cared about her had died. The first few days passed in hopeless stupor. It was as if her heart had stopped beating. At times she cried with despair, especially when she came across something that belonged to her brother. But unkind people couldn't leave her alone even in the midst of her unconcealed grief. Her classmates had brought a box of roaches with them to sprinkle out her window. Jean was just sitting by the window, and at first she didn't want to believe that the girls in her class had done such a mean thing to her. But then her heart sank with fear. She had always been so afraid of insects that she could hunt even one cockroach for a whole night. And now there were a hundred of them falling through the window. And all of them were particularly large. Having turned the box out the window, the classmates ran away with laughter, though there were desperate screams coming from the basement. Jean huddled in a corner while a swarm of cockroaches scattered around her room. And now she had no one to protect her from them. From now on, she had to deal with her own problems, including the swarm of cockroaches that seemed to be multiplying and encircling her from all sides. Just then, her wandering gaze came upon a can of pesticide. It lay on the floor like a last greeting from her brother. He had probably bought it before he died. And now his last care for his sister was needed more than ever. Jean immediately grabbed the canister. Her hands trembled with fear and squeamishness. But there was no trace of apathy. In that instant, she was on a path to fight against overwhelming odds. And she was going to win. The cloud of cockroaches was shot with jets of pesticide that pulverized them into dust. And some time later, a transformed Jean emerged from the dust cloud with cockroach antennae on her head and cherry irises in her eyes. And now she was using the advantage she'd gotten from the cockroaches, the ability to create real fire from chemical compounds. An earwig was furious and suffering from the deep burn she had inflicted. He turned over shelves and empty boxes, trying to get to the girl. And she darted around the room with amazing agility and began to interrogate him about her friends who had disappeared here. Every non-substantive answer was followed by a repeated blast of fire at the earwig. Wade marveled at how quickly and easily she had dealt with the overly self-important bug. But his mind went back to the moment when she was lying on the floor. He couldn't be wrong. You don't survive with wounds like that. Suddenly, he noticed that her arm was covered with shreds of skin and bleeding profusely. But she didn't think much of it. She was more interested in what was wrong with Wade, why he wasn't moving. He watched in amazement as the horrible wounds on her arm quickly healed and the skin became perfectly smooth. However, she still couldn't say aloud what she had become as a result. But it was Earwig who shouted it, attacking from above. He could not, did not want to be defeated in this fight. His blow missed its target, but Jin was able to strike again with his fire and escape. But his words hurt. She had always been ashamed of her symbiote. And it was especially shameful to hear it in front of Wade. The taunts pissed Jean off, and it was a painful burn for Earwig, but he didn't stop teasing her. Wade watched Jean take risks, moving closer and closer to her enemy to strike again, and he realized that words like that hurt her deeply. But there was nothing he could do about it. His wings still did not obey and hung like rags over his shoulders. Meanwhile, the Earwig was actively catching Jin, and she was just as quick to first attack and then to get away. And he was already beyond tired and hungry and the appetizer was running away from him, and he could not catch it. They froze across from each other briefly to catch their breath and stared at each other absent-mindedly. The earwig suddenly thought of the easiest way to catch it. And this time his limb darted past Jean, who had prepared to attack. The guy she was so protective of, it was her weakest point. She realized the plan too late and ran after the claw, knowing she couldn't stop it. 
but Wade saw that he wasn't the target of the attack and shouted it to her. Because the claw suddenly changed its angle of attack and brought Jean down on top of him, it hit her right in the middle of her chest and even lifted her off the ground, unable to throw her body off. Wade saw a stream of blood flowing from Jean's wound for the second time. An earwig was gritting his teeth that this time he had defeated the girl after all. He swung his limb harder to throw off her body lodged on the claw. Wade stared at the through hole in Jean's chest and couldn't budge. It was impossible to accept that she was dead again. Long hair brushed his face as the earwig flicked her body off his claw and dropped it at his feet like unwanted garbage. Glazed eyes and complete immobility indicated that the irreparable had happened. While Earwig was speculating on the eternal and inhuman, he had missed one very important point. But now he saw, and could not understand, the threat posed by the new change in his victim's appearance. Wade's eyes and wings suddenly glowed the green of spring grass. The wind picked up. The Earwig stood watching the lad's wings suddenly grow and lengthen and shine with an unbearably bright, eye-slashing, poison-green color. At his feet was the body of a girl, and apparently it was this that moved the guy to go to the next level. What was frightening was that he didn't even know that such a thing was possible. The only way he knew how to do it was to eat the victim. But on the bright side, this guy was now a coveted prey, with these possibilities, and he aimed his limb to get him before he came to his senses. But he didn't get there in time. The guy had rushed towards him faster and was already standing next to him. His blow was much stronger than before. Earwig had no time to react. He was already flying back a few meters from the missed body blow. Wade aimed exactly where he had hit Jean and was puzzled to see such an unexpected effect from his blow. The earwig was sparking white sparks. Smoke and the smell of burnt flesh billowed from it. In response, a claw swept toward Wade, shattering and overturning the remaining racks. The earwig was sure he'd get the guy, for so far he hadn't been as fast as the girl. Yanked the claw back and couldn't budge it, surprised. Because the guy was standing in the same place as before, but he was holding his claw with one hand. He yanked harder, pulling his limb as hard as he could. However, the fellow steadied himself on his feet and still did not let go of it. His face was fearful, there seemed to be nothing human left in it. Because his girlfriend had been killed, and now he was going to take a life for a life. Wade's eyes widened beyond belief. His pupils, on the contrary, narrowed and burned an emerald color. Now a real dragonfly was looking at the world from them. The earwig was staring at him, unblinking and angry, though he was slowly becoming afraid. Wade, on the other hand, could barely see his face. Tears came to his eyes from the grief of losing John again. In desperation, he yanked the claw toward him and began to twist it around his head. On the other end of it, an earwig was learning to fly under the ceiling. At a particularly low turn, Wade grabbed his face with his five fingers as a dragonfly does, squeezed, and slammed him to the floor like he was throwing a ball. With all his might, all the hatred and anger that had built up in his heart. And then he pressed his face to the concrete floor with his hand and pressed. Until, for the sake of saving his head, he turned his attention. To his own claw, which swooped overhead and clawed threateningly. But Wade turned around and suddenly sank his teeth into it so that dust sprinkled between his teeth. That's how the dragonfly's instincts kicked in. A beetle's shell is nothing to it. So he bit down hard on the earwig's claw that had killed his gene. The earwig, held securely by his hand, squinted through his fingers and couldn't immediately realize what had happened. What the guy was doing with his limb and what he was spitting on the side while doing it. And Wade suddenly remembered his last training session with Professor John and his words. He had explained to him how he could become stronger by turning the insect's advantages into a harmonious complex of dragonfly instincts and human intelligence. To do this, one had to cease to be human, letting in the element of alien instincts, and the body then changed to suit the needs of the new master, became more perfect to accept the new possibilities. Wade could feel it now, the way he was driven by desires that were completely unlike his own. The way his hand gripped the face of his enemy and his fingers wished to clench to pierce through her with their claws. In that moment, he looked terrifying. Flaming emerald eyes, grinning teeth, and glowing wings behind his back made his appearance even more dragonfly-like. Earwig looked between his fingers, which were digging more and more painfully into his face, and marveled at the change. He was also sorry. He had always considered himself a dangerous predator, the strongest. 
This time, however, he had miscalculated, and he himself had become the victim. It turned out that for every strength there could be an even greater strength. Now he saw his pride, his claw, being torn from his limb, and it flew, bitten off, into the depths of the warehouse, splashing cavity fluid all around. Then one member of his limb was torn off, then the other. The earwig screamed for mercy. He did not want to die. But his cries were in vain, for his victims didn't want to die either. And Dragonfly gnawed into the next joint of his limb, tearing the chitin with his teeth like ordinary paper. Soon there was little left of his long claw, and it was all gnawed off. Blood and mucus gushed from the wounds so violently that the walls and beams of the roof were still streaming blood. The earwig wasn't even screaming anymore. He was howling, begging for mercy in a pool of his own blood. But again a ruthless hand came upon his face and dug its fingers into him. Then she lifted him above the floor. Dragonfly lost his head completely and glowed no longer green, white light of hatred. His instincts overpowered his mind and his mouth opened to bite his enemy's neck as easily as a claw. Suddenly he was toppled from the back by a newly arrived man wearing an unusual-looking helmet. A jelly-like mass appeared in his hand, the amount of which gradually increased. Then it shot out flexible, sticky threads that wove a web. Soon Wade, who was in an unconscious state, was securely twisted. The man looked on and turned contemptuously away from the remains of the earwig to approach the immovably lying fellow. He was more interested in him. So he lifted his head, gazed into his face to memorize it well. He wanted such a curiosity for his collection, but now was not the right moment for that. Because there were Nesta bloodhounds on the approach, looking for students who had not returned in time. At this time, Wade began to come to his senses, though his thoughts were as confused as after a heavy hangover. All he saw was a blurry image of a blonde man wearing a strange headdress. His eyes closed again from the effort he had made. During this time, the blonde man had disappeared. As the bloodhounds approached the warehouse, a fine rain began to drizzle. But even so, they stopped and did not dare to enter under the roof of the warehouse with such a familiar name. Suddenly, they heard heavy footsteps shuffling on the floor. The commander of the trackers commanded them to get ready. There was no telling what would come out of this suspicious place. However, the student they were looking for appeared from there, and in his arms was the bloody body of a second student. Professor John went out to the main entrance to meet the funeral procession. To keep him from getting wet in the rain, an assistant held an umbrella over him. Because he didn't care. When he heard the footsteps, he walked quickly towards it, not looking at the fact that the jets of rain immediately soaked his T-shirt. And he saw only two of his students. One of them was dead. He stood there, not knowing what to say at this tragic moment. But the professionals around him were already calling for a medical team. The professor stammered, but still uttered the question that was of interest to everyone here. Wade tried to tell how everything had turned out, though his tongue was still slurring and his thoughts confused. His vague answer made the professor so angry that he inadvertently broke the stretcher with a blow of his fist and grabbed the boy by the shoulder, about to shake the information out of him. Wade couldn't justify the accusation, so he kept quiet. He didn't understand how it could have happened that they'd fallen into a trap. A medicine woman who was rushing to a call intervened in their difficult conversation. Professor John glanced at her unhappily, for he had never heard an answer. However, the woman found convincing arguments to precipitate his assertiveness. Just then, the students came in, who had to be removed immediately so that they wouldn't see what they shouldn't. It was immediately clear that this was not the time or place to talk about such things. A soft but demanding order sounded to Wade, which he hurriedly complied with. The healer pulled out a leather pouch, opened it, and ran her fingers in, to pull out the sparkling pollen and sprinkle it on Jean's wound. Wade was unusually excited when he saw that she had taken it upon herself to treat the dead Jin. Leaving his question unanswered, the medicine woman shook the same pollen off the growth on her head. Glowing mushroom hyphae began to grow rapidly on her arm. Wade knelt in front of Jean's body and stared at the medicine woman in a daze. He didn't understand how this was supposed to help until the medicine woman's assistant explained that the unique compound of an insect and a parasitic fungus, especially the fungus, which once became an unwilling symbiont of the firefly and then the medicine woman, able to cure even the worst wounds in the shortest amount of time. Wade watched as under the influence of the medicine woman's hand, thin strands of mushroom hyphae patched his friend's body. Soon there was no trace of her through and through wound. It was as if the girl were asleep.
lying on the ground. It put hope in Wade's soul that things might yet turn out all right. However, the medicine woman could not make him happy, and his smile was gone. Jean's body was soaking in the pouring rain that mourned her early death, and Wade and the medicine woman could not save what could no longer be saved. Wade leaned over Jean and his tears mingled with the raindrops. He still had a ghostly hope that Jean would rise again as before. Professor John watched in silence at his colleagues' actions and the boys grieving. He too had a lump in his throat. So it was the medicine woman who ordered the body to be sent to the morgue. There was no one else. The orderlies immediately dragged the hastily repaired stretcher to the corpse. But it was not so easy to tear the grieving guy from the girl's body. He waved away any requests addressed to him and did not let them take the body from his arms. And he held Jean even more tightly to him and cried, cried, cried. The day before his brother died, after a night chasing a cockroach, they had one memorable conversation. Jean had complained about everything that was wrong in her life, especially the nasty insects. And her brother brought up an interesting idea, that nasty insects become beautiful after they molt. It was new to her to hear her brother compare them to these bugs. He believed that everything would still be fine and even beautiful, if only they waited a little longer. His optimism was good for Jean's mood. That time it ended in a mock scuffle. Her brother had taught her to appreciate what he had. And then, picking herself up off the floor, reaching out for his sister, he said some unforgettable words that were imprinted in her memory. Because they were the only thing that kept her spirits up through the difficult moments of her life. And now, in the cold pouring rain, in the strong embrace of a friend, her fingers trembled slightly and clenched tightly around his wrist. Tears froze in Wade's eyes as he looked down at Jean. And the professor and the medicine woman had to turn around at the boy's desperate cry because something was happening to the girl that no one expected. The skin was falling off her face in layers and cracks were running down her body. That's how butterflies are born. Destroying their former receptacle from within, they return to the world as winged beauties. Her sight didn't return immediately, but the first person she saw was Wade, who was shedding tears over her. Jean was changing, floating amidst the light, burning her skin. The only anchor that brought her back to reality was the guy's hand, which she clutched in her palm. She was familiar with that feeling of support and protection from her past life. It was something her older brother had often done. He seemed to be the one bending over her. Like when he'd first nailed a cockroach with a roll of toilet paper. And then he grabbed her hand to hold her close and comfort her. Her vision gained clarity, and her brother's face transformed into that of her close friend. What else would you call a man who avenged your death without sparing his life? Jean was bitter to see how haggard his face had become in such a short time, and the tears in his eyes. But he didn't let her say anything. He hugged her, pulling her as hard as he could against him. Now joyful tears of relief were pouring from his eyes. His miracle had come true and Jean had come to life. To the embracing couple already ran all present, especially hurried medicine woman. The guys were immediately taken to the medical center for treatment and comprehensive examination. Wade had also suffered a lot that night and he was extremely surprised when the door of the room opened in the morning. Because in walked Des and Dorothy, totally healthy and wondering how this could have happened. After all, they were really there. They were supposed to have missed each other. Because while Des and Dorothy were looking through the neighboring warehouse for pesticide, they heard an incessant rumble so loud it shook the building. Wade was glad to hear that his friends had only gotten bumps when the racks collapsed on them and contemplated contentedly those whose fate he dreaded even to think of after not finding them in the warehouse. While Dorothy plopped down on a neighboring bed to rest, Des recounted the latest news. However, there was something incomprehensible about the case, a warehouse that turned out to be a well-prepared trap. How had they found it? Des scratched the back of his head, recalling the man who had tipped him off about the warehouse. He'd described his hair, his clothes, his demeanor, and it seemed vaguely familiar to Wade especially the earring in his ear, an original piece of jewelry with a spider and a web. Meanwhile, far away from Nesta, two people met in a secret laboratory, Spider-Man and a scientist in a white coat. The spider still had the mysterious helmet on his head. If you looked closely, it looked like a huge drop of water which fluctuated with every movement. Next, they walked through the laboratory deep into the building, and Spider told the man about the last events of the day. When the time came, the water bubble around his head suddenly burst and Spider fairly sucked in fresh air with his nose. 
His interlocutor barely had time to cover himself with a folder and handed him a dry towel. Spider, wiping himself from the water, confirmed his subordinate's hunch. He was indeed plotting a new experiment. While the faithful dog lacquered the remnants of water from the floor, the spider began to plan a new operation. And he was very upset when he learned that Wasp had already managed to kill one of the executors. Wade and Dez were walking down the corridors of Nesta, talking about all sorts of things, important and not so important. And they didn't suspect that they were being watched closely by an ill-wisher. And Spider was already mentally weaving his net, planning to catch a very interesting person in it. Nesta University was brightly lit by the rays of the midday sun. And so it was terribly hot in the auditorium. Wade wasn't suffering from the heat. He was really pissed off about the situation. They had failed. Now Professor John was standing in front of the lectern, reciting the results of his search, and there was no telling what punishment he had in store for them. His classmates screamed about the unfairness of the assignment, and Wade even covered his mouth so he wouldn't say anything and get crushed. Jean was silent as well. The professor didn't get angry, only furrowed his eyebrows sternly, and he didn't even blame the negligent students, much to the surprise of them all. He took the projector remote in his hand again, about to show them a new presentation. This time a chart of the pesticide findings from previous years, and those findings were getting smaller every year. He looked away, about to inform the students of one unpleasant thing. That nest wasn't the only organization collecting insect people. One video appeared to capture a camouflaged man with a can of pesticide behind his belt. He approached a couple of young boys from behind and held a plastic box containing some rare insect in front of him. The next frame held a picture of Dorothy as the victim of a similar experiment. Des leaned back in his chair, stunned. He had never considered his friend's problem from this angle. Dorothy had her head down on the tabletop and was playing irritably with her hair. She was uncomfortable with such attention. The professor leaned his hands on the pulpit so that every student would get what he was about to tell, about a death trap designed specifically for the students of their university. He looked them over with a steady gaze, watching for each one's reaction to his words. Because next he announced a new assignment, which was now becoming very dangerous. After all, no one could know what move the enemy would make next. The especially fearful were given the opportunity to voluntarily drop out of the course. The professor did not hide the level of danger so that everyone would make a decision with open eyes. He even reminded them of how John had almost died in a setup trap in the warehouse and of the other two students who had been killed by the enemy more recently. Wade and Jin sat next to each other and were suppressedly silent. Strange things were happening at the university. In the end, the professor promised everyone an encounter with death. He waited for each of his students to answer. Dorothy wondered. Des pounded his fist desperately on the tabletop, drawing the attention of everyone present. The other students were experiencing the news in their own ways. Two of them chatted. One was unbearably bored. The third was staring gloomily at the floor. The two girlfriends were definitely scared and looked at each other with frightened eyes. At that moment, Wade suddenly rose from his seat. He had something to say, but first to ask. The professor expected a question from anyone but someone who had already won the battle with the enemy, so he was wary. Wade raised his hand like he did in school and asked about the thing that bothered him most, the rankings. There was silence in the audience. How could anyone think about grades in a situation like this? Even the professor folded his arms across his chest in a defensive gesture. But he had to promise that the risk would be taken into account when grading. Jean looked at Wade wide-eyed with surprise. She hadn't even realized he was such a careerist. And Wade had his reasons. He'd been over-anxious once before, almost lost. And he was afraid of that feeling of hopelessness again. But he knew that luck favored the brave, and he wasn't afraid to take risks especially since he had already looked into the eyes of death more than once. Des laughed out loud at his words. He was impressed by the size of his friend's ambition. At first, he had been startled by the fact that two university students had already died. However, what hurt him was that even in Nesta, there were people who transgressed the law, and he longed for justice. Dorothy generally liked to fight, and she was not embarrassed by such a small thing as mortal danger. She even envied her friends who were in trouble. Her friends also cheered up. The braver one decided for both of them that they should not give up at the first threat. The others didn't see the difference. The threat existed for all the students. The second person killed wasn't even from their class. 
Jean smiled enigmatically. She knew that this kind of psychological shakeup was something the students received regularly in this course, to weed out the weak of heart and instill extra caution in the rest. Professor John stood in front of his audience of students, listening to their answers, and shifted his gaze from one face to another, trying to understand their motivation. All were determined to continue their studies, despite the threat of death. So everyone passed the first little test. But before he left the auditorium, he turned to the headman with a cryptic question, the gist of which was revealed on a brightly colored banner above the dining hall doors. Wade was used to formal celebrations, and so what was going on in the hall made him a little uneasy. Everyone was doing what they wanted to do without regard for the rules of table behavior or the culture of socializing at respectable events. He asked Jean if formal gatherings at Nesta always felt like a raucous party, but he didn't get a normal answer because Jin was thinking about something else entirely at the time. She wanted to talk about his attitude toward her, but she didn't know how to start. She was about to talk to Wade about the night she had died, but he was distracted again. Dez was begging for help and protection from his crazy girlfriend who had decided to play horseplay. It was enough for Jean only to glance grudgingly in Dorothy's direction, and she immediately jumped off Dez's shoulders and went off to do more naughty things. For example, now she had decided to get drunk, and banging her fists on the table, demanding more drinks. Dez slumped back in his chair, exhausted. Wade handed him a can of beer to refresh himself. He wondered why his friend was putting up with this attitude from his girlfriend. Dez looked at him angrily, but he deigned to answer. Taking a sip of his drink, he recognized that it was his way of supporting Dorothy. Too young for adult problems, she'd gotten an ugly scorpion's tail and was going through a lot, shut down. Wade realized that Dez thought Dorothy's problem was her inability to make friends with people. But now the opposite was happening before his eyes. A strange guy walked up to Dorothy and pulled a can of beer toward her like a good acquaintance. Dorothy raised her head and looked at the guy, then at the can of beer in his hand. Then she looked back at her friends, who were sitting at another table, watching her but not rushing to intervene. And suddenly she felt so bad. They were all out there having fun together, and she was here alone and nobody wanted her. So she took the offered jar. She took the unexpected suitor under her arm and, wagging her tail defiantly, led him to the exit from the hall. The boys looked at them dumbfounded. Had mean Dorothy found a boyfriend? Dez's words about Dorothy's inability to socialize were immediately called into question, but he didn't understand what had happened to his girlfriend. It was unclear why, but the girl's behavior hurt him deeply. As he chewed fiercely on a piece of chop, Wade laughed at him, until he caught a glimpse of the fake boyfriend in profile when he looked back to see if anyone was following them. Wade didn't like the look in his eyes, wary, hard, and not the least bit drunk. Dorothy was already out, and he watched the door open, his concern for her rising in his soul. The cell tower in Nesta was working smoothly. Calls were untraceable. So the kidnapper was calm, sending an urgent message for them to be picked up. The most difficult thing, stealing a valuable experiment from under the enemy's nose, he did easily and simply. The guy walked over, crouched down in front of the girl bound in her own web, and reached out his hand to pick her up and carry her to a safer place. Only his hand was suddenly intercepted and squeezed, pulling her aside by the other man's hand. Still, Wade decided to follow his friend and the young man he didn't know, and seeing her tied up became terribly embittered. So he grabbed her arm and took a closer look at the kidnapper's face, trying to see what he was hiding under the hood. But except for a band-aid around the edges of his lips, he saw nothing remarkable. This morning, Spider had a remarkable conversation with his subordinate. The latter was worried that another trip to Nest would bring more problems than benefits. Spider recalled the Dragonfly Boy's amazing leap in ability development, but shook his head negatively. Then he looked at his subordinate with a sidelong glance and exhaled another name in an inspired manner. A girl who was a unicum even amongst insect people. Her mutation was promising. If sorted out properly, it was possible to create someone bigger. The party was in full swing, so no one noticed the disappearance of several people. Wade had only come out because he was worried about Dorothy and hadn't expected to see her tied up and unconscious. Now he was standing in front of the kidnapper and wanted to figure out what exactly was going on here. At the most obvious suggestion, the guy suddenly became angry and yanked his hand out of his grasp. Then Wade rushed toward Dorothy, trying to bring her to her senses so he could get her out of here. 
but the kidnapper's fingers suddenly dug painfully into Wade's shoulder and threw him far away from the girl. With the swing of his hand, a cloud of black feathers rose into the air. Wade hadn't figured out the situation yet, but he was beginning to suspect something, especially when a small black feather fell on his hand. It left a deep cut that bled, and there were many more of those feathers swirling around. Shrieking in sharp pain, Wade instinctively clutched the wound, causing the guy to fake sympathy, who had deliberately created a large kill zone with his advantage gained from the tarantula, so that he could get Dorothy from Nest into his lab without any trouble. Wade, clutching his bleeding wound, listened to his revelations, and realized that he was facing an enemy who had come to Nest to kidnap Dorothy. The man suddenly looked at him sharply, an unkind look, as if he were making a difficult decision, and suddenly he lunged at Wade, taking on the features of his symbiote as he went. Its eyes glowed violet, and its sternum somehow began to resemble the round belly of a spider. Watching the fingers clenching for a punch, Wade remembered what he could do. Then in the warehouse, he'd seen the limits of both his weakness and his strength, and had been able to raise his level to unreachable heights. And he immediately launched upwards, not waiting to be hit by the undoubtedly poisonous spider. So Taranul missed, and the poison bristles did not help him. They were blown away by the wind from his wings. Wade was looking up at him and figuring out how to get Dorothy, and Taranul knew exactly what it would take to subdue a recalcitrant boy. His warning didn't look scary, but there was an angry pulse in his pupils. He suddenly bent at the waist, arching his back, from which black bristle feathers began to shoot out. His symbiote had an upgrade to fire its own venomous bristles at the enemy. Wade only had time to shield his hands from the cloud of bristles flying at his face. New cuts immediately appeared on his forearms. He peered through the gap between his hands, waiting for the attack to end. But the stream of bristles kept coming, though it was getting hard enough to stay in the air. Soon he had to sink to the ground. The poison had done its work and his wings refused to obey. Wade thought the smartest thing to do was to call for help. But Taranul grabbed him by the scruff of the neck before he could escape from the clearing. Now he had only one choice, either kill the guy or take him with him. Jean continued to sit at the communal table and wait for Wade to return. She was sad that she never got to ask him the most important question. While she was drinking alone, Des came up behind her unheard. Therefore, Jean was greatly frightened by both his question and his appearance. He was drunk out of his mind. He was alarmed that Dorothy had been missing him for nearly an hour. She'd disappeared. Jean was alarmed, too. She hadn't been tracking Dorothy on purpose. She was concerned about other things. But how could she forget the epic lesson she'd taught Des, who still treated her like a little girl? That was the last time she'd seen her. At that time, Wade broke free from Taranul's grasp by flapping his wings. He even managed to fly a little farther away, keeping his eyes on her. But Taranul was quick to catch up with him so there would be no escape that way. With a sharp turn, Wade flew in the other direction. This time, Taranul was in no hurry, because the boy was already flying full speed into the cloud of his stubble. Wade dropped down beside the unconscious Dorothy. If calling for help didn't work, he was going to protect her. Suddenly, there was a crackling sound from the sky, and the wind whipped up fine debris. Wade looked up and started trying to wake Dorothy again, but she didn't respond to his words. He stared at the unconscious body, and a strong anger began to awaken in his heart. Only she could be so foolish as to let the whole group down. From above, the powerful searchlights of the helicopter that had flown in illuminated the clearing. Wade prepared to fight Tara Nulis for the girl. He wondered why he would go to such lengths for someone else's girl. Wade made it clear to him that although he wasn't her boyfriend, he would defend her to the last. Wade realized the consequences if one member of their group disappeared. So he scattered, flapping his wings with all his might and taking off into the air. Taranul looked up to see what else this strange guy would do that didn't value his life. He accelerated and used his own set of dragonfly skills. His eyes and wings glowed emerald. Wade did his best to follow Professor John's instructions exactly, especially since he'd already done it at the warehouse trap, and his bloody fist struck Taranul on the elbow of the hand he had set up. It was enough, however, to send him flying upward by inertia and then falling in the distance. Wade was glad it had been so easy. Terranulus weighed much less than Earwig, except that he fell straight into a characteristic stance, which meant an immediate attack. The smile left Wade's face. He didn't know what else to expect from such an unusual opponent. One moment, 
and he's on the ground because his legs are no longer holding him up. Two holes in his neck, and then he heard the last words above him, which his consciousness was still catching. Taranul recognized that Dragonfly's attack was impressive, and the guy had added a lot to his abilities, because there was a lot of trembling and pain in his arm, which had been injured in the fight. But then, wiping his mouth, smugly declared that he was much tougher. Consciousness did not return to Wade soon enough, but he did open his poisoned eyes. He didn't realize where he was at first, because the bed was real and he was naked in it. Only the ceilings and walls, though dark, looked unfamiliar. He turned his head sideways with difficulty to get a better look. Suddenly a thin girl's hand fell on his chest and a familiar face pressed against his shoulder. Wade felt sick at the thought of what might have happened here. He couldn't remember anything at all. Dorothy's eyes opened weakly. Consciousness returned to her slowly. And then they stared at each other in incomprehension as to how it could have happened that they had woken up in the same bed. Within seconds, Wade's cheek was already swelling. And he, thrown off the bed by a good leg kick to the chest, tried to justify himself. They were in a locked, abandoned room. Everything around them was old except the bed. Dorothy was sitting on it, wagging her tail nervously as Wade looked for a way out. He tried to pry off the boards of the boarded-up window with his hands and freaked out. Because his life had taken another wrong turn, and that threatened to get him expelled. Dorothy was mysteriously silent. Wade suddenly noticed this and was afraid that the mysterious traitor in Nesta was her. Dorothy bit her lip nervously and was angry at the incomprehensible situation. She believed their kidnapper for some reason. But why? Did not have time to tell, because the door lock clicked. The guys immediately became alert and took a fighting stance in the center of the room. But a little girl appeared in the doorway and invited them to the table. Dorothy looked around warily, expecting a trick, and Wade marveled that a child had been sent to them instead of a guard. When they left the room, they found themselves in a real kindergarten, with two teachers watching over them. Wade looked at the cheerful children and didn't understand where they were. The answer came unexpectedly from Dorothy. All the new discoveries made Wade's eyes even bigger than they had been before. She stood looking at the girls eating lunch at the table and remembered how she had once sat at that same table and the rocking toy in the corner that waited for its dashing rider. That's how Wade knew that Dorothy had grown up here in this orphanage. And she could tell him exactly where they were now, but that didn't explain much. Suddenly, the little girl noticed her aunt's tail and shrieked enthusiastically. Behind her, other children pulled up to the tail as well. By the time the teacher saw it and had not yet had time to be frightened, Dorothy quickly explained that it was such a toy and even shook the tail. While the children groped and praised her limb, Dorothy steadfastly endured. But not for long. She ran away after a minute, unable to bear the children's attention. She might as well have lost her tail. Wade was looking at the boy's sketchbook when the door opened again. An older woman entered. She smiled happily and welcomed the dear guest. He was relieved to find that his clothes had not gone anywhere but were hanging washed in the backyard. But the news that Taranulis had delivered them here caused a surge of anger, so much so that he even pounded his fist on the table. Wade remembered how friendly Dorothy had been to the strange guy, and now there was an explanation. The principal could only tell what had happened toward morning. What had happened the rest of the time remained unknown. Wade had the idea that they were not prisoners here and could return to Nest. And the old tutor began to question him about the life of her pupil. Wade had realized before that he knew nothing about Dorothy. But now he realized that he had misjudged her behavior. Dorothy sat on the bed in her old room. The childhood she had longed to forget had come back to her. She thought back to that unfortunate day when everything had gone wrong. Her little self, she was late for school and the last one to leave the orphanage. And right outside the gate, she encountered a ghost from her past. With fear, she backed away from her father, whom she hadn't seen for a long time. He was very drunk again, and for some reason he came after her, but this did not please her. On the contrary, she was shaking and stammering with fear. Her legs wouldn't obey her. And her father swung the bottle at her again, as he had done once before, and she could only cover herself with her hand. Dorothy bit her lip desperately to keep from crying. The memories were too bitter. The dull gray room like her past life was weighing down on her. In the meantime, the superintendent had realized that she was delaying her guest with her talk. As she went to get her clothes, the sheet was nearly pulled off Wade by a child's hand, revealing her wings. 
The little girl wanted to socialize and was very persistent. The supervisor apologized for the child's behavior. But Wade was not offended. He realized that all the children here were deprived of affection and attention. Therefore, he did not hurry to find Dorothy, but decided to play with the children. Finally, the girl finished her drawing and brought it to Wade to show him. It was a butterfly girl, and the drawing could well be recognized as a child's fantasy. If it weren't for the little kid's intimate knowledge of entomology, and the next thing she said was shocking, he immediately thought that maybe there was something wrong with this orphanage. Wade continued to question the girl, and he told her his innermost childhood fears. The girl showed him the mosquito bites on her arm, showing him who she didn't like. And then she stunned him by admitting that she liked dragonflies, and even explained why. Wade marveled at the depth of the child's knowledge. He also had a changing picture of life. He'd never looked at his symbiote from this angle. However, the conversation had to end there because the teacher came in and called the child. The girl happily gathered herself, anticipating a joyous event in her life, a real adventure and lastly gave him an album with her drawings as a keepsake. Wade waved goodbye. He didn't know what else to say to her. Then he opened the album to the first page, but he was still staring at the girl. Communicating with her had strangely brought peace to his soul, and everything became easier and simpler. Meanwhile, two people were walking along the underground corridor of the orphanage, the head and the teacher. The headmistress's face remained tender and kind like a loving grandmother's, Although she was looking at the unconscious child, the girl was already prepared for a certain procedure. Both women put on protective coveralls. In the hands of the younger one was a simple-looking cardboard box. And on the wall were hung pictures of their particularly successful experiments. A particularly disgusting millipede emerged from the box, but it wasn't an insect. The experiments continued. A gloved hand picked up a familiar can of pesticide from the table. That's how they met. The millipede the pesticide and the unfortunate child, who was about to be sacrificed by cruel adults to someone else's ambitions. But then suddenly there was a knock on the door. The women turned at the sound. The head of their uninvited guest suddenly poked through the crack, and he wanted to ask them something in a friendly manner. The door was immediately slammed shut before he could see the uninvited. A little later, the superintendent looked out, panting and crabby, to ask what he wanted. The guy had snuck in where no one expected to see him, the secret underground level. Yet here he was, demanding attention quite insistently. Moreover, he knew exactly where he had come to and why, because he was extremely calm. Even when he kicked at the door, knocking it open and throwing the superintendent into the depths of the room. While the younger girl ran to the older one's aid, he entered the operating room. He made it in time because a little girl handed him her sketchbook. And there was a moment of great joy for the caretaker, and it was connected with quite recognizable even in a child's drawing cans of pesticide. Then he remembered what the superintendent had said about Dorothy's tale. She hadn't seemed at all surprised, though she had claimed to be. And only the girl's drawing explained why. The teacher had a canister in one hand, but a lot of money in the other. He was standing in front of an old woman whom he had broken her nose with his own hand. And he didn't regret it because it was a crime to feel sorry for those villains who sold children for money and turned them into monsters. When he saw the child's drawing that struck him so much, the girl had already been taken away. However, he remembered in which direction they had gone and went in the same direction. It was very fortunate that a little boy had tried to stop him and thus pointed the right way. While Wade was talking to the boy, he heard voices from the direction of the stairs. This confirmed to him that he was on the right path, all that remained was to go downstairs. As the door to the basement slammed shut, someone Wade had missed came into the room. Tarantula had returned with his purchases, but he wasn't in a hurry to stop the boy. On the contrary, he sympathized with him. Wade stood across from the perverted women. On the floor between them lay a broken door. They had drawn the right conclusions. The guards of the place were indeed lying unconscious. But the women did not seem frightened. The first shock had passed, and they were already rising from the floor. The younger one, taking advantage of the fact that the guy didn't consider them worthy opponents, suddenly jumped towards him. Sharp needles of claws popped out of her fingers. However, Wade had time to react, and she didn't manage to hurt him. She flew off into the corner from a strong push. While the younger one lay there, unable to even breathe from falling to the ground, the older one stared at the boy wondering how she could get him. 
Meanwhile, Wade saw the revealing pictures on the wall. Among the other kids was Dorothy. Wade couldn't understand why condemning children to loneliness and suffering, for he remembered well what it was like to be a monster among ordinary people. His anger was so boundless that he flew to the older woman to shake the truth out of her. But from the woman's mouth came a long tongue, sharp as a pike, and pierced his shoulder. Clasping the wound with his hand, he looked at her and realized the rediscovered circumstances. As the woman wiped his face and licked up his blood, he realized he was dealing with a genetically altered mutant like himself. Then he rushed to the doorway, intending to call for help. But he was met in the hallway by the cook and two gardeners. All of them, too, were insect hybrids with needles on their arms. Dodging the needles aimed at him, Wade wondered how he could get out of here. The basement had become a trap for him. The cramped room was too uncomfortable to move around with his wings. Slipping under the arm of the cook who was too actively attacking him, Wade suddenly noticed the caretaker hurriedly carrying the girl towards the door. He shouted and rushed after them to intercept the child. But the headmistress's long tongue stopped his attempt. She was not going to let him go. She realized that he had now become dangerous because he knew too much, and it was foolish to let him live. Meanwhile, Dorothy sat in her old room. She twirled a toy she had once sewn with her own hands and waited. When the door opened softly, Dorothy knew who had come to see her. June, whom she had once befriended and trusted. He held out a bag of things to her peacefully. But Dorothy looked at him sullenly, her tail patting the bedspread irritably. So he hurriedly turned away. Suddenly the walls of the house shuddered violently, so much so that even June felt it. No wonder Dorothy became even more angry. She now realized very well that she was being told something. June answered her honestly. He saw no reason to hide what she would already know. At least from him, she would hear only the truth. Dorothy gritted her teeth furiously in indignation that he thought her so stupid. She grabbed her old friend by the sweater, shook him, and hissed her indignation in his face. Then he resolutely recalled her past, the one she'd really wanted to forget. The day that had divided her life into before and after. First, the terrible meeting with her father, who had found her here, too, in a rural orphanage far from the city. She immediately remembered what she had feared all her childhood. Drunken father with a heavy bottle in his hand, who loomed over her like a mountain and could beat her just for fun, from a bad mood. And he was always in a bad mood. Little June was going to skip his first class that day, so he came out later than everyone else. He saw his loving father raise his bottle to teach his daughter a lesson. Peeking out from behind the post at the entrance gate, he thought about how to save Dorothy. He was too young for that himself. But when her father grabbed her by the hair so she couldn't escape, and swung to hit her, then it happened to Jun for the first time. Bristle discharge, a small one, but he could defend himself. Dorothy, on the other hand, was too weak to face the world, so he thought of a way to help her become strong. He had personally begged and was present when they transformed Dorothy, implanting her with the scorpion genes. Dorothy stared at him in shock. The major mystery of her life was unexpectedly simple, and the culprit for giving her a tail was standing right in front of her. June realized that she would not soon forgive him, but tried to justify his act by necessity. He did it so that she would become stronger and be able to protect herself from her father and the cruel world, too. The next time her father showed up to discipline his own daughter, the arm he swung was intercepted and squeezed by a small child's hand so hard that he could not wrench it from his grasp. Then the little girl with the scorpion's tail stood over her father defeated at one blow, and blood dripped from the knuckles of her hand. Since then, June had convinced himself that he was helping abandoned children grow stronger so they could defend themselves. He'd seen happy children playing, but that could only be so in kindergarten while they were being cared for by adults. So he took on the mission of an evil good wizard who would save them against all odds. June showed Dorothy a can of that pesticide they had been looking so hard for. As he advertised the new world he was building, Dorothy thought back to Nest. She was more than satisfied with it. Her friends were there. June, however, had pinned his hopes on his enemies, and he spoke admiringly of his head. He grabbed Dorothy's arm, trying to persuade her to join them. But he looked into her eyes in vain. Dorothy looked at him as if she were seeing him for the first time. She felt as if the shadow of a huge spider was looming over her to subdue and take her over. She, in a strained voice, whispered the words he longed to hear. And then she hit him with all her might, so that he could feel how much she disagreed with his proposal. 
A teacher with a child in her arms ran past and saw June fly out the door of the room and into the hallway. But Dorothy came out after him, tapping her heels confidently. She listened to her friend reprimand her as if he had done something wrong, and she realized that she couldn't expect any help. June sat on the floor, rubbing his chin with his hand, wondering what had gone wrong. If his sweet, forgiving friend was acting like she was ready to kill him. Her scorpion was ready to attack, and it became clear to him that a fight would still have to be fought. Meanwhile, three needles stuck into Wade's arm, and he saw his blood rushing up them. He jumped back and listened to his enemy's boasts in confusion. Finally, he realized what kind of symbiotes his opponents had. Indeed, the most annoying creatures that always hunt in packs. Now they were blocking his path to the door and taunting him, certain that he could not defeat an entire pack. The superintendent stroked her long tongue and assured him that the girl was beyond saving. And Wade suddenly remembered his recent conversation about mosquitoes. The girl had said a wonderful thing. She had hoped that a dragonfly would save her from the mosquitoes. And though she had been carried away, it was still possible to do so. She called the dragonfly heroic because the dragonfly was their natural enemy. And even now, with the whole crowd blocking his exit and convincing themselves what dangerous creatures they were, he could still see in the superintendent's eyes the instinctive fear of a stronger opponent. Wade called to his dragonfly, listened to its instincts, and their consciousnesses immediately merged. The dragonfly's complex glowed with emerald flame. The flock of Kamarov watched the guy transform and felt a supernatural, unconsciousness-defying eeriness. The dragonfly stance, ready to attack, came so easily and naturally that Wade felt almost omnipotent. His confidence was shaken by the long tongues that shot toward him. The superintendent, though afraid to come any closer, could reach him from a distance. The kindergarten workers again, as if on cue, opened their mouths and extended their tongues toward the boy, trying to suck on his skin and suck all the blood. But Wade, with his increased speed, managed to get out of the way of the aiming tongues. In the second volley, he jumped upward toward the ceiling. But the tongues seemed to be dimensionless. They kept pulling and pulling after him. He barely had time to maneuver and dodge, because the masters got wise and the tongues began to hunt him at random. Then Wade increased his speed even more and became like a green lightning bolt that darted between his opponents. The human eye could not keep track of it. Moving at an accelerated pace, he was able to strike his enemies. The first to fall was the cook. She fell to the floor unconscious, not even realizing what had happened. But it wasn't easy for Wade either. His eyes were watering from the high speed. So he almost missed the supervisor's tongue. Barely got out of the way in time. Wiping away unsolicited tears, he quickly thought of how to solve the problem. At this time from the second floor of the orphanage sprinkled shards of glass. And into the courtyard jumped two irreconcilable friends. Past friendships are not easily forgotten. Dorothy expected all sorts of things. But all she got in return were poisonous bristles. June folded his arms in front of him and let loose a cloud of them. The poisonous cloud was closing in on Dorothy, but she only covered her eyes with her hands. None of the bristles released could do any damage to the girl. She smiled cheerfully, for she knew it would. Her childhood memory had not failed her this time. Now it was the tail's turn. She did her best to strike another blow at Jun with it. Though June bounced off Dorothy's tail, it didn't reach its target either. So he jumped after Dorothy while she was still facing him to grab her shoulder. But the scorpion's tail struck the ground, stung, and worked like a spring. Doing a somersault in the air, Dorothy landed behind her friend's back and shouted a few catchphrases from there. She loved this game, only it wasn't a game to Jun. A new volley of bristles erupted from his shoulders. Dorothy was faster, however, and this time she threw him back a few meters with both feet. When he landed, she gave a satisfied sigh and condescended to tell him to stop doing something stupid. But suddenly a kindergarten minibus sped past her. The teacher took a moment and drove through the yard where the overgrown children were fighting. She was in a hurry to get the girl away. Dorothy immediately rushed after the minibus, which increased its speed more and more. The highway was empty at this time, and the teacher drove a little slower. She kept looking in the side mirror, but there was no chase, so she even calmed down a bit. But then ahead of the car, a tailed figure emerged from the woods. Dorothy stood in the middle of the road in a scorpion stance, ready to attack. The impact of the tail pierced the asphalt and gave her an additional foothold. She grabbed the van's front end and lifted it off the road. Holding it in her outstretched arms above her head, 
Dorothy cheerfully suggested that this was exactly what they were trying to accomplish by making her a scorpion. Then she tossed the minibus aside so that it flipped over on its side. The kindergartner smashed her forehead against the windshield and lost consciousness. The girl was still relaxed asleep and uninjured. At this time, Dorothy was caught up by her friend. June couldn't afford not to complete the task. As she turned to him, he returned a punch to her jaw. Leaping up to the girl to complete a series of punches, June thought to end there. But Dorothy counterattacked with a leg kick to the head. She had trained too well with Dez and was ready for the unexpected. And now Jun had to defend himself against her swift attack. Especially when, with a swish of her tail, she kicked out an asphalt crumb that shot painfully at him. June calmly agreed with Dorothy that he would not be able to deal with her by his previous methods. So she slowed down to see what other surprises her friend had in store. And he began to remove the bits of Band-Aid that were always on his cheeks. She had never seen his face without that adornment. One by one they fell to the ground, unnecessary now that he had decided to reveal his secret. Across his cheeks where humans dimpled, his venomous fangs extended. His threat looked very different now. He was completely out of his mind in self-defense. Dorothy looked at him and didn't understand how she hadn't noticed it before. She had previously thought the tarantula was his only symbiote. But its fangs belonged to the fastest and most aggressive snake in the world. And June didn't hesitate. Leap. And now his fangs were piercing the neck of his childhood friend, injecting his venom into her. He was an experimental confirmation that two symbiotes could live in a human being at once both of them not insects. Dorothy was doomed because she couldn't know that, but she still trusted her friend. For good reason. The last words she heard were that it wasn't fatal to her. As her body slumped to the ground, June pondered what to do first. First, he jumped onto the wrecked minibus to see what happened to the passengers. The girl was still asleep, but quiet mumbling indicated that she would come to her senses soon. He reached out with his hand to get her body outside through the window. After all, the head's task must be accomplished. It was as if the girl had been waiting for this moment, for she opened her eyes. All she saw was green lightning. Wade got there just in time and threw Jun away from the van on the fly. He could only get to his feet a few feet away from the van. He stared angrily at the guy he'd fought yesterday. He was in his way again. Wade got down on one knee, dragonfly stance plus a chance to catch his breath after a fast race. Behind him were the defeated Komars, who couldn't resist his new speed. But this enemy, who had already defeated him once, was far more dangerous. Except that behind Wade's back was a little girl who needed to be protected from a terrible fate. She watched them through the windshield, not daring to move in the seatbelts holding her. It was only recently that Wade had punished her bloodthirsty caretakers, when the superintendent's tongue almost got him, because his eyes were watering at high speed and he couldn't see much. He flew into a rack against the wall. The wing caught on a cabinet. He looked to see what was there and saw the plastic goggles that protect your eyes on dusty jobs. Now Wade was counting on those goggles to help him deal with the tarantula, because now he could get up to his real speed. The one didn't wait, but immediately emitted stinging bristles. Wade had to learn to resist them. He looked at the enemy and figured out how to deal with him. First he flew higher, though the stinging bristles had gotten him there. But now he could anticipate their trajectory. And since the goggles were covering his eyes, he could dodge them. He missed a few, though, and it hurt. The tarantula below continued to throw out its bristles. After all, it had been enough last time. So Wade launched himself at the ram, realizing he had only one way to reach the tarantula. One he'd already used, a punch to the jaw, but at high speed. It threw his foe several dozen meters back along the roadbed. Jun flew, blood spurting from his mouth, so strong was the blow. And though stubble swirled around him in a purple cloud, it no longer frightened Wade, because he was angry, because he was protecting something he cared about. The tarantula grouped just in time to land and took a stand, spitting up the blood that had pooled. Wade took the new stream of bristles almost calmly, for his eyes were safely protected. He developed his new speed and sprinted forward in a curve. He stopped only when he delivered another knee strike to his opponent's jaw. In the side mirror, the girl could see how badly Jun, who had always been kind to her, felt. But when the man turned to face her, she was frightened, covered in blood, with a purple light from his eyes. And the scariest of all were the fangs from his cheeks that he never showed. Now Wade was being attacked by a black mamba he had never seen until now and couldn't know her capabilities. 
When her fangs were quite close to his throat, Wade had already anticipated their trajectory. So he fell on his back, pushing his foot into his opponent's chest, and thus returning him to his previous state of flying backwards for a long distance. Wade's heart was pounding frantically, though. Seeing fangs within a centimeter of his neck would not leave anyone indifferent. Even though his opponent bent the roadblock with his back, he was back on his feet. Jun was determined to finish this thing the way the chapter needed him to, because he too had once been weak and peeked at the cruel adults through the crack of a door. They always ran out of money. The single mom didn't have time to earn enough to pay back what she owed. The next time the debt collectors came, she'd lay at their feet to beg for another payoff. June watched his mother get beaten up and couldn't defend her due to his age. That time, though, he couldn't stand it and lunged at the man with his fists. But he was just lifted up in his arms and carried outside like an inanimate object. And his mom was left all alone and unprotected with two grown, strong men. That was the last time he saw his mother alive, her frightened look he remembered forever. Because the next day he was brought to the morgue of the local hospital. For him, the only one who knew her to identify the body. A new shot bristled with a scream full of heartache. June was screaming his reasons for doing what he thought was right, and he believed in them. He saw himself as a savior of children and made sure that those close to him would always be able to protect themselves. And so much feeling was put into his words that he was able to throw out several streams of venomous wool that wriggled like a multi-headed hydra at once. Wade was even frightened, seeing such power and such belief that his cause was right looking away from the very first dense stream of bristles directed at him. He spotted Dorothy lying there. Unconscious on the road, she could have been badly hurt. So he tried to cover her with his body from the poisonous bristles. Although they stung him painfully, bloodily, he did not retreat, only pressed down harder. John only laughed at his efforts. He knew she was immune, didn't he? He'd enveloped Dragonfly in a cocoon of streams of bristles that obeyed his will, and he'd already sentenced him with that. But Wade disagreed with him and was still going to fight for his life. First, he carried Dorothy's unconscious body to the safety of the roadside. Then he shouted his truth to the tarantula, which he was unable to understand on his own. June saw that the girl had climbed out of the van and was now hugging Dorothy's neck. And was frightened of her. After all, the child was not immune to his poison. The last time he'd seen her, she'd been tucked behind the safety of the windshield. And he had no idea that when she saw Dorothy's unconscious body, would come out of her safe haven and rush to rescue her from his bristles. And now she was sheltering one who was incapable of being hurt. But the girl did not know it. Wade left them by the side of the road and rushed to restore justice. June prepared his fangs going to fight with them, for he could no longer emit a hair for the girl to be hurt. Black Mamba made his lightning leap towards Dragonfly. Both were going for the ram, but the Mamba had more opportunity in a contact fight. One bite and the enemy's resistance could be forgotten forever. Wade saw his trajectory a moment before the fangs closed in on his neck. He did a sharp, almost impossible somersault, making a perfect circle but avoiding the fangs at the last moment. Jun stared at his antics with his mouth open, trying to come to terms with reality. His attack had failed for the first time in his life. He saw that the guy was a lightning-fast, indistinguishable green lightning in the sky, constantly changing its trajectory. He didn't even have time to turn his head when he flew past him and immediately came back, but in a different direction. In a word, Dragonfly, its skills are well described by entomologists. And the boy had acquired her ability to maneuver on the move. And now he was entangling the tarantula in a network of deceptive spans to confuse and deliver his crowning blow. His movements were elusive to the human eye and blended into streaks of color. It seemed to be here just now, and then it rushed forward and disappeared in the distance but you can already feel with the back of your head that he is already somewhere nearby. You hear the rustle of wings. This time, Jun couldn't turn around fast enough, and he missed his jaw. Wade swooped over his defeated opponent, gradually descending. He stepped to the ground and ran a few more steps forward on inertia. Then he looked back. He and his clothes were riddled with razor-sharp wool. But he was willing to make this exchange. After all, his opponent lay unconscious on the pavement. Then Wade approached the girl who was kneeling beside Dorothy. She looked at him with her mouth open and said nothing. Wade reached out his hand toward her. But he heard only one word, spoken in a shaken voice. He slanted his eyes to look behind him. There he could see the dragonfly wings he had forgotten about. 
He immediately remembered Mary's reaction to his wings, how she was scared of him. So he hurriedly moved away from the girl so as not to scare her even more. However, he was held back by a small hand, grabbing him from behind by his jacket. The girl ran up on her own and clung to him, not letting him go. And it wasn't the wings that frightened her. It was just that she saw Wade's injured shoulder and wanted to let him know it. She stood in front of him, arms folded in front of her, tears of sympathy glistening in her eyes. And a grateful look. That's how, pray tell, she realized he was saving her from the people who'd cared for her for so long. Wade looked at her and realized this was a moment worth fighting for. Like that first night in the dorm, he felt like he was now in the right place at the right time, for the sake of making this girl smile and be happy. So he smiled back at her, experiencing a moment of sheer happiness. His silence startled the girl, so Wade embarrassedly scratched the back of his head and tried to reassure her. Then he affectionately ruffled the girl's hair, reassuring her that everything was fine. He was already planning his next steps, how he would return to Nest, not alone. But he turned his gaze to the roadside where Dorothy lay and was half silent. Because he did not see her where she had been, the roadside was completely empty. He looked around in shock, wondering if she was awake and hiding somewhere. And he didn't see how behind his shoulders the space seemed to expand, and a strange guy looked out into the gap, and in his arms was the unconscious Dorothy. But the girl in time shouted to Wade about the danger. He looked around, immediately switched to running, trying to distance himself from the unidentified object, and stopped only when he was out of its reach. The girl clung fearfully to his leg. June first heard a familiar lifeless voice full of scornful mockery. Then a man manifested on the branch of a nearby pine tree, partially hidden by thick, long hair mimicking his surroundings, and Dorothy slept in his arms. The chapter's special courier had been sent to assess the situation and bring the scorpion girl to him. Jun immediately realized what kind of experiment his girlfriend had been sentenced to and became angry, but also tried to change the situation, claiming that everything was under control. Wade looked at him in surprise. It appeared that Tarantula was protecting Dorothy, too. John's hand reached helplessly for his unreachable friend. He realized that the courier would not let her out of his arms now. So his back exploded with venomous bristles again, but now directed toward his own, now a former associate of his. But the courier indifferently informed him of his head's opinion of his unworthy human weakness, and effectively dismissed him from his position, if one could call it that, then disappeared, covering himself completely with his hair and the directed hairs were useless. Anger June was still trying to trace in what direction he was going by the barely noticeable warp of space. He tried to get up, but he couldn't do it on his own. He thought for a moment and called Dragonfly for help. Now they were on the same side. Wade looked surprised to see his former enemy now talking to him in a friendly manner. However, Jun now had a new goal, to get Dorothy back. And he was going to do it, even if he had to use someone else's help to do it. In a clearing by the lake, a tempered glass pavilion had been built for special guests. Dorothy was in it now, securely entangled in a spider's web. As soon as she came to her senses, she heard an unfamiliar voice. In front of her were two people, well, almost people. One of them seemed to be in charge because the other was very respectful. He did not hesitate long and told her his offer at once. What could he hear from a teenager who had never grown up? An angry message on the long distance wrote, but this reprimand from her even pleased the blonde. Meanwhile, the waiter brought two dishes covered with lids. On the dishes was something meaty, appetizing-looking, but completely unrecognizable meat, and she was offered to eat it. Dorothy again refused in a rude manner. The blonde man, though, calmly began to eat the exact same thing, confirming its safety. The blonde continued his conversation leisurely, teasing his captive with the flavor of each bite sent to her mouth. The dog was at his feet, too, begging for a piece of meat for himself. He tried his best to persuade her to taste the food he had brought, but the girl still refused. Spitting balls of piercings into a napkin, Spider thought about how to behave further. In the refrigerator, there was still a lot of meat from the killed and cut into pieces earwig. Dorothy blushed, so sickened by what they were trying to feed her here. She tried to free herself from the ropes to get away from the madmen, but suddenly she heard the clomping of a woman's heels behind her. A moment later, the sting of a venomous stinger appeared on her neck. Her consciousness ceased to obey her, her eyes rolled back, her thoughts became confused. 
The wasp had come to say hello to its head. She supported the unconscious girl's head. She suspected it was for her sake that she had been summoned, especially since she had become her living weapon after the subjugation injection. Wasp nodded at the stake and wondered what was so special about it. The answer didn't exactly make her happy. Rather, it puzzled her. The head's new way of enforcing obedience was unexpected. Because it reduced the individual's freedom of choice to the level of an animal. The head held out an uneaten steak to her, offering her a bite. But after such information, OSA pretended to be more interested in the girl. She felt sorry for herself, but not for the girl, and let the head better take care of his new toy. The order sounded, and the body, obedient to the wasp's will, bent over a piece of hybrid but still human meat. Dorothy's memories flashed back to the faces of her friends who were now being sentenced through her. She mentally said goodbye to them, for she could not resist the wasp's command. Tears of despair ran from her eyes, and her mouth obediently opened to bite into the disgusting meat. Suddenly the clinking of glass was heard and a crumble of shard sprinkled inside the pavilion. The courier immediately reflexively covered himself with his invisible hair. Wasp took a few steps backward so she wouldn't get caught in it. Whoever it was, he hadn't come for her. And Spider remained seated with his table knife and fork, because the table had been swept from its place. An hour earlier, Wade and Jun had been searching for the courier's trail. Wade had no idea how to find the invisible man, but June crouched on the side of the road. He had an ingenious way of picking up his enemy's footsteps through a web he had woven himself. Its vibrations told him in which direction the object was moving and where it had already passed. The spider was not particularly confused. After all, he was on his own territory. And he was even amused by the group of rescuers who used to be implacable enemies. He considered it a special gift of fate that today he had both objects of interest to him as guests. The spider was contentedly examining the prey that had flown in on its own. Wade glanced suspiciously at the owner of the house. His awareness was too obvious. He remembered Dez's words when he described the appearance of the tipster to the warehouse where they'd fought the earwig. The man who now sat before him matched the description perfectly. In addition, the wasp that had freed Mantis and tried to kill Dez was also here. June understood what had happened and why Dorothy was hanging in Wade's arms like a helpless doll. If Wasp was here, then she was using her Wasp Rider advantage. He looked firmly into his head's eyes because he wanted to ask him some questions. The spider kept its eyes on him as well. A contemptuous grin of superiority never left his lips. June wasn't asking his questions he was accusing, but this wasn't the first time Wade had heard of such a thing. He remembered Earwig's boast. At his subordinate's indignation, Spider rose from his chair with a satisfied smile, as if he had been praised for his ingenuity but then a handful of poisonous bristles swept past his face, like a warning. It was June's way of reminding the head of his promise about the orphanage children. After all, Dorothy was also an orphanage child. He was ready to use his tarantula complex if he didn't get an answer. And he did get an answer. Not the answer he expected, though. The spider took out a tablet and typed the access code on it. He showed one of the latest photos of the place where the orphanage children were transported after being treated with pesticide. The place was called, very eloquently, a farm, because the children there lived like cattle, eating out of a communal trough, and they only developed their physical skills. Jun's pupils were constricted with rage, because Spider wasn't going to keep his word. He was cheating him. The second photo was even more horrifying. Up close, you could see that there was nothing human left in the children. They were dumbed down to the level of instinctual animals. The spider was openly laughing at him and his dreams of a better future for the children. While Wade was coming to his senses from the new information, Jun was no longer around. Black Mamba was bearing down on his enemy to punish him for what he had done to the children. Jun tried to express his attitude towards the former head with dirty swear words. Its fangs were ready to sink into his throat. But then Wasp intervened. She laughed condescendingly and sent out a subjugating pulse. Wade was just about to join the fight when Dorothy disappeared from his grasp. There was a loud crunch and Jun's broken fang flew into the air. Dorothy had knocked his fang out with her tail, and now blood was gushing from his mouth. Jun hadn't expected such an act from her specifically, though the color of her eyes indicated that she was in control. Satisfied, Wasp raised a hand to the hair obscuring her eyes, and displayed her unnaturally glowing eye, through which she watched her victim's eyes.
and also controlled her nerve endings through injected neurotoxins that suppressed her host's will. For a time, she herself became a different creature with alien advantages. Today it was the scorpion's tail, its main weapon which it used to strike its enemies without missing a beat. In addition, its powerful claws and carapace made it invulnerable. Dorothy, thanks to her exoskeleton, was absolutely protected and could tear even the armor with her claws. And now she rested the huge claw that covered her hand on the floor and held the other claw at the ready, frozen in a scorpion stance, ready to attack. Jun stared at her with fear. He had never seen Dorothy so formidable, and he had no desire to fight to the death the one he considered his friend. But subject to the will of others, she struck first, throwing him back against the wall. Protecting his chin with both hands, June didn't realize that the blow would be a tail across his torso. After all, it hadn't done that before. The wasp looked smugly at the result of the blow. After all, she was the one who had tried to get deep into the girl's brain to activate all of her abilities, and was now enjoying the thrilling battle. A win-win, it had to be said. Because June was only defending himself because he was afraid of hurting Dorothy. Wade tried to appeal to Dorothy's consciousness to shout to him to fight. But his outstretched arm was caught in a desperate grip by a web loop. The spider decided to tackle his adversary. Wade immediately flew to the ceiling to get away from the spider. However, his angry scolding was not heeded by anyone. He was a gnat, for whom a strong web had already been woven and he was in the center of it. The spider looked at the work of his hands with satisfaction. As a perfectionist, he was very satisfied, and even added threads, trying to wrap the helpless prey in a ball. But they hung, tattered, which greatly surprised and upset the spider. Because Wade, with his dragonfly jaws capable of chewing chitin, easily tore the threads that entangled his hand and flew toward the spider, screaming his hatred as he flew. The spider released more threads in his direction, trying to catch his too quick prey. But Wade increased his speed to the limit and becoming green lightning delivered his crowning blow. Blood gushed from the spider's mouth. He didn't even realize how it was done. He fell to the floor. Wade clung to the ceiling and stared at his enemy rising to his feet. Now the spider was angry and sent more threads of webbing in his direction. But the green lightning bolt again darted along a complex trajectory. It gave him another crushing blow to the jaw, sending blood spattering in a fan. And another before he could regain consciousness and use his powers. The blows came at Spider from all directions. He was like he was in a green cocoon from Wade's constant circling around his person. Eventually he started laughing hysterically like a madman, wiping away the blood that had come up. After all, the guy had never gotten through his exoskeleton. And, as if unintentionally, he pressed the spider's abdomen in his earring, sending a pulse. Immediately after that, jets of water began to spray from the ceiling of the pavilion. The weather immediately turned foul. Wade's wings became wet and heavy. But the spider was in his element, and water began to gather around his head. And now his threads could catch the dragonfly, who immediately lost his speed. And they were entangling him. First of all, his neck in a strict submissive collar. The water made the web more flexible and slippery, the kind not easy to grasp with one's hands. Wade felt the threads clenching tighter around his throat. He tried to break them with his hands, but a water bubble appeared on his head, preventing him from breathing. In such a state, death was inevitable. Only the fingers near his throat held a slit that gave the necessary air supply. A similar bubble rippled on the spider's head and did not prevent him from breathing or talking at all because it was the advantage of a silverback spider living in water. Holding the boa constrictor in his hand, he already considered himself master of the situation. Wade wasn't about to agree with him. A little girl was left on the highway waiting for the rescuers from Nesta. Wade gave her his uniform jacket to keep her warm and told her to wait until they came for her. Suddenly, light footsteps were heard behind her, coming closer. The girl was frightened at first, but the affectionate voice quickly calmed her down. The girl who approached her was wearing the same jacket and opened her mouth in surprise when she realized she had found a witness. Jun was meanwhile trying to hold back the blows of the wasp-controlled Dorothy. His real enemy was standing in the corner enjoying the spectacle. How Scorpius fought the tarantula to the limit and the latter couldn't stand up to him. It really wasn't easy to withstand that kind of pressure, and June, who had been hurt more than once today, could barely keep up. Mostly defending himself. It was hard to raise a hand against his girlfriend. When he felt his shoulder bone brittle after another blow, he decided that she wouldn't forgive herself for killing him later and began to fight in earnest. 
To begin with, he let loose a cloud of stinging hairs. But Scorpion covered himself with his claws to keep them out of his eyes and continued to approach. Seeing that the claw strike was imminent and could very well be the last, Jun decided to use his crowning blow. A powerful leap high up took him out of the scorpion's reach. The jump was followed by a fall and he had to land on his back. At that moment, control loosened. And when June was ready to bite Scorpius with his venomous fang, his friend Dorothy, who didn't realize what was happening and smiled happily at him, turned to him with clear, clear, clear eyes. The attack had been thwarted. He could no longer bite her like that, fully conscious. But that turned out to be just a trick from Wasp, to remove control for a moment so her player wouldn't take damage. The next blow from Scorpion's tail knocked Jun off his feet and slammed his body against the wall. The spider took a moment away from his victory to praise the wasp's skill. The pair of them had long since put into action a plan to use Scorpius for their own purposes, even released her to nest for that purpose. Jun only now recognized the level of his partner's perfidy and regretted so much that he had trusted him wholeheartedly before. Exhausted physically, he was only now realizing what he was really fighting for, and he was getting creeped out at the thought that those would now win. The spider had long ago lost human morality and now wanted to make the whole world like himself, and decided to start with his girlfriend. Jun hadn't realized before what kind of world his partner was going to build. It seemed beautiful. His words were inspiring. Equalizing everyone's rights and opportunities seemed right. But the world that stood before him now was terrible. The spider was going to unleash monsters on the streets of human cities. Then only hybrids would truly survive. The spider continued to enthusiastically expound on his idea. From the outside, it looked like he was mad. And Jun didn't know how to stop him now. He couldn't fight now. He couldn't even move. His condition had been noticed by the observant wasp and deemed him already defeated. So she sent Dorothy on her previous errand to pick her up off the floor and eat a piece of human meat so that she too could become like them. June looked at her and suffered because he wanted what was best for her. He'd done everything for it. And now he'd failed her. And now she would have to pay for his mistake. He turned away so he wouldn't have to see her make the wrong move, but he couldn't close his ears. And he listened to the wasp's insinuating words that substituted her own thoughts and feelings for Dorothy's. Wade, who held the threads of the web with his fingers so he could breathe, was the first to speak. He shouted his honest opinion of what OSA had said. He was supported by June. With their loud voices, they interfered with Wasp's hypnosis. Wade screamed as hard as he could to reach Dorothy's consciousness. It was all he could do now. Because he himself had recently become a monster in the eyes of ordinary people and had had a hard time getting over the state where everyone had turned their backs on him. He remembered how he suffered from loneliness and misunderstanding, and even wanted to end his life. June also couldn't forget the way Dorothy had once supported him. He constantly walked around with band-aids on his cheeks, and it seemed strange to his peers. There was a constant wary whisper to him, and he was therefore not wanted to be friends with. Until he met Dorothy, she was the first to offer him friendship. And though he didn't immediately accept her help, for he had a lot to fear. But she didn't back down. She held out her hand and waited for him to say yes. It was so amazing then. There was a man who was not afraid of his looks or possibilities. Then their friendship had begun, a friendship that neither time nor circumstance could change. And now all he could do was summon the last of the venomous fur to the surface with his last strength. Wasp noticed that the exhausted June was still trying to do something. But she was too late and couldn't stop him from doing what he was about to do. Dorothy was standing in the same place and her hand with the piece of meat was slowly approaching her mouth. Perhaps there was a no-nonsense struggle going on inside her for control of the action. Only Jun didn't wait to see who would win. He aimed his weapon, which flew between the stake and Dorothy's mouth and carried on. This elicited snickers from his former partners. The wasp figured he was so weak that he had missed. But his intentions were far more far-reaching. He couldn't fight anymore, but Wade could. All he needed was a little help. Wade freed himself from the webs that kept him from breathing and immediately activated his complex. The spider looked at him in amazement. This was something he couldn't have foreseen. His bad premonition was justified because Dragonfly swept past him with a green arrow. And the first thing that came out of Dorothy's claw was a piece of meat. She did not react to this action. 
She stood frozen with her hand raised. June fell to the floor with relief, right into the water from the sprinklers. Now he could afford to lose consciousness. When Dorothy's body attacked Wade, he simply soared higher into the air. Toward the hole he and Jun had made in the pavilion, there was no water there. It was also a safe place to throw away the meat he'd stolen. From above, everything looked very small, petty, the people and their intentions. But new strands of web had already begun to form on Spider's hands. He was still going to catch the dragonfly in his web. The web, like a living thing, was rising to the ceiling, twisting into harnesses. Wade had a chance to fly away, but he couldn't leave his friends here. The spider's taunt was fair, and though it made him angry, it nevertheless reminded Wade of an earlier conversation. Back then, on the side of the road, June had tipped him off to a weakness in his attack. It wasn't a criticism, but a statement of fact. After all, they were going to visit a very dangerous man. Therefore, Wade listened to him carefully. At that moment, John was not too frank, so he informed him very little, but still generously donated him one secret that Wade could use in a critical situation, like now. The spider was weaving its web and was puzzled why the victim was hanging in one place instead of flailing around in panic. And Wade was gathering all his mental strength to fulfill what he had only heard about from Jun. He remembered his words clearly, as if they had just been spoken. He focused on the target, staring at it point blank and almost unblinking. And I felt like a rifle with a telescopic sight from which a bullet should now fly out. His legs pushed off the ceiling with an effort, increasing the rapid acceleration. That bullet was himself. His body, with all its considerable weight plus acceleration, became a cannonball capable of crushing any obstacle. All the spider could do was cover himself with his arm against the rapidly approaching projectile. The dragonfly was going for the ram and no one could stop it. Not at that speed. The encounter was inevitable and ended with the spider being knocked to the floor by a body crashing down from above. As Wade took the acceleration, he analyzed how he felt about the stunt he was doing for the first time. It appeared that this was really only for the very last resort, because such a condition had drawbacks, but couldn't roll. But also advantages. Such a means of attack could not be resisted by anyone, not even the spider with his web. But it had to be hit in such a way that he would lose the ability to resist for a long time. The blow was delivered to the chest, blood spattered from his mouth. Only the spider had time to defend himself a little. He used his web to soften the blow. He remembered the look in Dragonfly's eyes before the battering ram. It had given him a nervous shiver to realize that he might not have made it in time. But now he laughed nervously, relieved that he'd made it through. The retaliation was behind him and he applied his water spider complex. Jets of water flew at Wade mixed with spider webs, which this time wrapped around him. To enclose them both in a ball of water, the spider's element and its advantage, but a sentence for the air insect. Wade looked around trying to find a loophole. However, Spider kindly informed him not to bother. Wade turned toward him to see the half-crazed look in his eyes and felt his arms close around his neck. The spider was trying to ground him down, pressing the fingers of his hands on his throat to get the last of the air out of his lungs. And watched with pleasure as his enemy wriggled, trying to get the air he needed. June lay in unconsciousness, so there was no help from him. Wasp, as always, stayed out of the way. Her puppet did not interfere in the battle of these two either. Spider was enthusiastic about the future he had in store for the two of them. Wade didn't want, couldn't allow to become a monster again, now in the eyes of his friends from Nest, to let the past loneliness come back to him again. As his eyes rolled back from lack of air, he desperately begged Providence for salvation. And just at the edge of visibility, a dark blur flashed before his eyes. Jean was in time. Her fiery fist burned through the web and a torrent of water spurted out of the ball, tearing Wade from his executioner's grasp. The spider couldn't believe his eyes. The top of his creative mind, the aquarium, had been destroyed in a single blow. And Wade had been held by a caring hand to keep him from being carried farther than he needed to go. He looked upon John as a divine messenger who had rushed in at the last moment. She had always come to his aid when he needed it most. And now she bent down to help him up from the puddle of water lapping from the balloon. He could not refrain from asking an untimely question, but she did tell him in a nutshell what had happened since they had gone missing, about how they had been searched for all night. Until Professor Hinn had reported the whereabouts of the head of the enemy group. Wade didn't understand at first how he could know that, 
until he remembered the conversation he'd overheard in the woods. Nesta's intelligence team continued to follow OSA for several days, waiting for her to show the way to the head of the group. But she had been alone the whole time, until one day she disappeared from sight. In fact, she was then covered by Courier's mimicry hair, and the scouts thought their mission was irrevocably failed. If they hadn't spotted Wade flying, whom the rescuers had been searching for almost 24 hours. Jean had barely had time to regale Wade with news of the girl left on the road, as they had to urgently retreat to a very serious threat. Dorothy had been sent in to take out a new enemy, and she was inevitably approaching, swinging her claws and raising a cloud of spray. Jean was greatly surprised to see who Wade was saving her from, her own friend. But he quickly explained to her that it wasn't Dorothy who was attacking them now, but Wasp, who had subjugated her mind. And the Wasp rushed to intervene, waving its stinger to prevent the two from joining forces against her player. However, Jin managed to dodge. She was no less fast thanks to her symbiote, the cockroach. Immediately, the other side almost got a scorpion claw on her. She dodged to the side and decided that a two-front battle was not favorable to her. So she took a moment when Dorothy was crouching, preparing to jump again, and hit her hard on the head to render her unconscious so that Wasp had nothing to control. The blood from the cut wound splattered on Jean's face. She barely had time to squeeze her eyes shut. She almost missed the sting. She had to lean backwards to do so. Immediately after she staggered back, green lightning flashed past her face. It was Wade who rushed to his friend's defense, and this time he didn't hesitate to strike the woman with his fist. But Wasp had time to bounce back. The spider, who this time without any special intricacies, began to simply entangle Dragonfly's movements with his web, thus preventing him from uniting with his friend against the wasp. He skillfully manipulated his threads, and Wade's movements became like those of a puppet guided by a puppeteer. As a result, Wade, who was spinning on the counterweights, bumped his forehead hard against Jean's. Jean didn't hesitate long and tore the strands of the web that bound Wade. The freed Wade rubbed his forehead after the blow and felt quite embarrassed that he had been caught in the spider's web again. Jin and Wade stopped for a break and looked at their opponents, looking for gaps in their defenses. Of course, those were stronger and more experienced than the freshman students. They had already divided the targets amongst themselves and moved to solve the problem definitively. Wade didn't want the enemies to get what they wanted and therefore asked Jean to take Dorothy while it was still possible but she refused with genuine amusement in her voice, and what Wade hadn't expected at all. She smiled happily at him, reminded him of the day he'd rushed to her aid at the mountain lake. He had a good reason then to stay by her side and protect her from the weeper. When Spider heard that the girl hadn't come here alone, he tensed up. Suddenly, Dez jumped out and tore his water helmet around his head with his shin hooks. He was very angry, especially when he saw the unconscious Dorothy on the floor. Wasp was even glad the backup was only a boy. She'd already handled that guy once, but what she didn't expect was to see golden threads wrapped around her hands. It was the golden-haired one of her friends who showed her skill, who turned out to be Silkworm. Wasp had hurt her last time, getting her out of the way. Now she returned the favor, swaddling her in strong silk threads like a caterpillar. Wade was amazed at the skillful handling of the seemingly harmless and frightened one of her friends. The other held her under her armpits and kept her safe from any unfortunate accidents. The spider had nothing to do in the meantime to restore his helmet. There was plenty of water around. So he was in his element and the freshman team didn't impress him. The wasp didn't hesitate either. Getting free of the threads with a sharp sting was a couple of trifles for her. But suddenly a thunderous voice sounded from behind her and the heat from the explosion told who had come after the students. The wave of fire grew wider and wider. Spider and Wasp were forced to move farther away and prepare to meet a more dangerous opponent. Because this enemy could not be ignored, the fire that everyone fears was his element. He approached, stepping through the flames. His appearance was sudden and so swift that it caused confusion among his enemies. The first to emerge from the smoke screen was a hand blazing with hellfire. Professor John stepped into the dilapidated pavilion, it was not only his hand that was burning. His eyes did not bode well for the kidnappers of his students either. The wasp was incredibly angry. After all, she thought that she had outsmarted everyone and no one would find her. However, the figure of the professor was real, and now instead of playing with the freshmen, there was a real battle to be fought. 
Professor John held his palm at the ready, so that at the first attempt of resistance he would clench it into a fist and strike with a shaft of fire. Meanwhile, a Nesta nurse hopped over to the unconscious Dorothy to administer first aid. Wasp listened to the professor's words with poorly concealed annoyance, until he reminded her of the past. Now he was about to correct a mistake made years ago. This reminder angered Asa so much that she raised her hand to her hair and pushed back her long bangs, showing that her past was always with her. That long ago burn was still reddening in the same place as before. A burning hatred, a desire to get even for her disfigured face, threw her into a deadly flight towards Professor John. If it hadn't been for Spider, he didn't want to lose his associate so foolishly, burned in a fit of rage. So he swiftly swaddled her in his web and dragged her back to his side. The wasp looked back, glaring angrily at his partner. But he had already thought of everything. So a rough male hand, appearing as if from nowhere, grabbed her across the chest. The courier heard the command, came and took the valuable cargo, despite the lady's resistance. It was the first time Professor John had seen such insect man abilities, so he was slightly surprised. The spider behaved quite friendly, trying to negotiate and avoid a fight. Therefore, the first wave of flames Professor John took aside in order to ask Wade about the identity of the man standing in front of him. Hearing a positive answer, he relaxed slightly, because he had heard good news. Filling his hand with a new flame, he thanked the spider, then put him in a stupor. Clenching his fist, Professor John glared fiercely at the man who carried a considerable threat to all the citizens of Nest. He put his hand far behind his back to swing hard for the final blow, and released a jet of flame, aiming at his worst enemy in the face. The spider realized that no one was going to negotiate with him when the fire was already launched in his direction. The professor was very quick in his decisions. While Professor John waited for the fire to subside to see the roasted foe, the courier looked back in alarm. Such heat meant that a murderous technique had been used. Nesta's staff also had to cover themselves with their hands from the blazing blast. Wade peered with one eye at the burning bonfire in Spider's place and rejoiced that his enemy was finally finished. But behind the still bright light of the fire, a silhouette was vaguely visible. Professor John also noticed something that had not been there before. A giant millipede was curled up in a ring on the spot where a man had stood before. In the middle, between its legs, hidden from the shaft of fire by its powerful body, was the spider holed up. As the heat died down, the hitherto hidden body segments of a huge scolopendra began to rise from the ground. Scorched by the heat, it wriggled wildly in pain and crushed everything around it. On its back, everyone present saw a miraculously saved enemy. Professor John looked at the new object of destruction, impressed by its size. But killing such a huge creature was not yet possible, and the spider wasn't going to fight. Why fight against a crowd when you can catch them all one by one? Wade clutched Jean to him, intending to save her first, and looked fearfully at the monster, which had clearly once been human. The white cape covering the scolopendra's head couldn't hide the bowed head and the look of almost human eyes. Meanwhile, the spider was boasting of his brilliance, but was still going to escape. At his command, the scolopendra promptly tore underground again, producing an earthquake. A giant-sized tunnel was left where it disappeared. Wade didn't want to leave it like that. He wanted to go after him and he started talking about the farm where the children were kept, when his strength suddenly ran out and he fell unconscious into the water beneath his feet. Professor John calmed Jean, who was frightened for Wade. He realized that the boy had put himself completely out for the day, and as she lifted his head out of the water, he gazed at the young man who had managed to impress him today with his resilience. He mentally pictured all the prospects that would arise from the fact that Wade had managed to uncover his complex. After all. It couldn't have been otherwise. Otherwise, he wouldn't have survived. When the evening dawn had almost completely faded, they returned home to Nest. Dorothy had a short stay in intensive care. Her bad temper had caused the staff to stutter, and then she had been sent to the general ward. Wade warmly said goodbye to his newfound little sister when she left for a new orphanage. Still, the girl had been a great help to all of them and had saved him personally by pointing Jean in the right direction. Spider and Wasp had disappeared without a trace but it was to be expected that they would reappear in the very near future, so everyone was on edge, assuming the worst of all possible scenarios. And even June couldn't help them. He wasn't trusted with that kind of information. Apparently, Spider had assumed that their roads would soon part, and so had written off his partner in advance. 
He and Wade found themselves in adjoining beds at Nesta Hospital. Jun's arm was rolled up in a cast, and the band-aids were back on his cheeks. But the strange thing was different. How come their kidnapper hadn't been arrested? Des thought so too, unceremoniously placing a dirty sneaker on Jun's clean bed. He had come to voice his displeasure about Dorothy's kidnapping. Wade was afraid his friend was quite capable of picking a fight in the hospital too. So he hastened to turn his attention to himself. But June wouldn't let the conversation drop. He preferred to find out everything at once. And above all, their unfinished argument with Wade. He was the one he was addressing and not paying any attention to the angry Diaz. Wade hadn't realized what he was talking about at first. He couldn't be blamed for his weakness yesterday when he'd revealed his dragonfly complex. Then he remembered the ideals June had fought for until he'd been betrayed by his own. In some ways, Wade agreed with June. In some ways, he didn't. Even Dez listened and sat on his enemy's bed. Behind the screen, Dorothy was quietly listening to the boy's conversation. Wade, based on the experience of his life, believed that origin does not ultimately affect a person's happiness and destiny. June looked intently in Wade's direction. Before he objected, he should have realized what he meant. He remembered his last night, when his mother was still alive, and the blow the fat man had given him for wanting to protect her. Then he picked up a stool to hit the annoying kid harder. The little boy didn't even think of running away. He squirmed on the floor, reliving the echoes of the previous pain. Then his mother covered him with her body and the stool hit her head, smashing it into blood and shattering it into pieces. Warm red drops began to drip onto June's face, making him stop crying. He was so scared to see the blood dripping down his mom's face. And even in this state, she continued to comfort him and spoke to him in an affectionate voice. She hugged him and promised that they would still be happy. At that time, he believed her words without limits. And later, he didn't understand why she deceived him. After all, they were never happy. Now he was trying to figure out what Wade had meant when he'd talked about happiness. Their conversation was interrupted by the Nesta police. They had come for a willing prisoner. And June, without compulsion, got up and went with them. Interrogation was inevitable, but he expected to return. The boys looked after him and were silent. Even Dez did not hate him at that moment. Jun's last words were addressed to Dorothy, who carefully pretended not to be there. That was how hard it was for her. By evening, Wade was declared recovered and returned to his dorm room. The first thing he did was go to the bathroom, looked at his familiar self in the mirror, and pondered his options. And already waiting for him in his room was a late guest who had shown up here despite the locked door. Wade watched in surprise as she rocked from toe to heel and took her time to explain her intrusion. Finally, she spoke, though she hid her eyes at first behind long bangs. Then suddenly she turned to face him, but she asked her question in a soft, sweet voice, though her locked hands said otherwise. Only Wade wasn't listening. He stared dumbfounded at her affectionate smile. His thoughts were completely out of his fantasy-filled head at that moment. Wade wasn't the only one back in his dorm room. Jean was drying her long hair and discussing the events of the previous day, with Dorothy who had made it back to her room for the night. And now, playing with her toy, she chatted about anything she found interesting or simply amusing, as long as she didn't think about the horrors of that day. After another of her jokes, a hair dryer suddenly fell from her friend's hands to the floor. Jean wanted to ask something, even turned around and gathered air into her chest, but she changed her mind. And soon, hiding her face under her hood, was walking out the window to avoid being caught by security during curfew. Dorothy quickly put together in her mind her friend's fallen hair dryer and the words about Wade that had been spoken before. That was why she knew immediately where Jean was going. She had something to say to Wade, too, but she wasn't ready yet. To remember the time when she was weak and helpless and he was protecting her. So once again, she put the impending conversation aside and turned away from the wall. Why spoil her friend's evening with something she might say the next time she saw her? Jean waited a little longer to see if Dorothy would speak up, but then she went out the window. To run across the neighbor's balconies, climb through the window into the boy's room, and ask Wade about the thing that mattered most. He stood across the hall and smiled serenely, but soon the smile slipped from his face when Jean's voice became a blatant threat. Wade had to make excuses for what had happened at the orphanage through no fault of his own. 
He even kneeled down to avoid hovering over his friend sitting in the chair. Jean even blushed at the thought that she had fantasized a lot of unnecessary things just based on Dorothy's joke. Wade had been so convincing in his candor that the second question had fallen away. He didn't remember that he had actually lied. Wade really hadn't paid much attention to that he'd held her hand when she was dying from the earwig's wound, or that he hugged her for joy when she was unexpectedly resurrected after all. And that was important to Jean, but she didn't know how to say it. Even a hint of circumstance didn't compel him to tell her how he felt about her, which made her terribly angry. Wade, on the other hand, had something to say to Jean. He'd been thinking all day about how to thank her for saving him time after time in a deadly situation. She was very surprised. After all, she had never considered her help as something personal. She was just doing what she had to do. Therefore, all offenses were immediately forgiven. After all, his predicament could be easily resolved. Jean knelt down across from the kneeling Wade. Her hint was more than obvious. All Wade had to do was accept the newly changed circumstances, not to say he minded. The tower was a special place for all of Nesta's citizens. Like a town hall where state affairs were decided, it loomed over the city. The next day, the three professors who led the main areas of student learning gathered in the meeting room. Professor Hin took the lead because he coordinated Nesta's exploration and communicated directly with the rector on the matter. Professor Jun was doing force support and was therefore interested in the map of the area. Jun's interrogation didn't bring much information because he didn't have much communication with his head. But the professor still carefully watched the videotape, paying special attention to details. After all, he told without secrecy absolutely everything he knew. After the betrayal of his head, he was extremely sincere. He told about the organization, its goals and methods, names and abilities of people who surrounded Spider. He did not forget to mention the orphanage where he grew up. Selection of children for further hybridization had been carried out for many years. It was scary even to think how many monsters Spider had raised for his army. Professor Olivia, who was in charge of the healing direction, was upset that so many children had suffered. And then June's story came to the part where he told where the spider kept his monsters. The professors discussed this information and came to the conclusion that this is the only place in the existence of which there is no doubt. Because there was indeed such an island on the map, and there was no point in Jun lying. Professor John suggested that it was worth a battlefield reconnaissance. But Professor Hin had conveyed the rector's wish to use freshmen. This made Professor John so angry that he pounded his fist on the table in anger. After all, the training hadn't even started properly yet, and already there were such dangerous assignments. In response, Professor Hin hinted at specific freshmen who had already interfered in the story and would not want to be left out. He was supported by Professor Olivia. She had already scrutinized the capabilities of the newcomers and believed in them. Professor John tried to change their minds, even recalled the wasp's story. But he found himself in the minority. His colleagues proved to be more rigid in their demands on the students. Meanwhile, Jean was sampling her girlfriend's praised food for the first time at a local restaurant. She was accompanied by Wade, who immediately held out a life-saving water. Jean offered to show him the city of insect people and, of course, to taste the local food. Wade was very interested in looking at the streets and comparing them to ordinary human streets. Soon the conversation smoothly turned to Deza. John was surprised that she hadn't seen him once in 24 hours. Wade informed her that he had left Nest. It turned out that he had human parents who were okay with the fact that their son had changed a bit. Through the large windows was clearly visible who sits at the table in the cafe. Therefore, the unexpected meeting was inevitable and caused an involuntary blush on the cheeks of Jean and Wade. After all, they had been caught by their girlfriends Penny and Cherry having a conversation that looked a lot like a date. They wouldn't stop giggling at the couple's embarrassment. Jean was starting to get angry. Wade clenched his fists, not knowing how to stop the taunts. After all, the gossip could spread to the entire university. But the girlfriends stopped themselves and Jean heard the startling news. Immediately grabbing Wade by the arm, she demanded to go to the lab with her. She described how many wonders lurked behind its inaccessible walls without a special pass. She also hinted that she could get something for herself. It was just what Wade needed to be happy. So they all soon found themselves at the receptionist's desk in the technical development lab.
On the sides were mysterious devices for creating and testing new technical ideas. The chattering girlfriends immediately asked Wade what he wanted to order. But what they really wanted to brag about was what they wanted to buy themselves, because they didn't even listen to his answer. They were reminded of the day Professor John chased them with a chainsaw, and what conclusions they drew from being the weakest in the group. Wade listened to their chatter and marveled at the girls' determination to strengthen their character. He understood them, because he'd felt weak in the face of a stronger opponent on more than one occasion. Weak and helpless. And he realized very well that he would have to face Spider again. He was too annoyed with him that he had ruined all his plans. So he approached the receptionist with determination. He already knew what he needed. Jean watched him breathlessly. She saw his face darken at once. She had been closest to him before he passed out and had seen him rushing after Spider to catch up with him. She thought that during her vacation, those horrible events had been put in the past. Wade had seemed so calm, so normal. But now she realized that was just her impression. It was just that Wade could separate the joy of the present from the planning of the future without getting discouraged beforehand. And she liked that about him. Professor Olivia was nervous, so she pulled an e-cigarette out of her pocket. The rector's decisions were beyond her comprehension. She and Professor John had secluded themselves on the roof of the university to talk about the prospects of the selection competition. She was interested in the selection criteria. After all, the students had gotten different abilities from their symbiotes. Some became stronger while others did not. But Professor John had a peculiar experience of real-life battles. He knew that strength wasn't the most important thing. Wade was convinced of that, too, because all he needed to win was a pair of well-made, dust-proof, unbreakable goggles. The main lab was usually quiet and deserted. Only the rare species of deadly insects that were kept in aquariums were improved here. And Spider's assistant was surprised to catch an unbelievable occurrence here. The spider had bound Wasp's hands and feet, gagged her even, and was smiling at how furiously she was trying to free herself. To the assistant's unasked question, he cheerfully replied that he had to defend himself. But then he did let go of the subdued captive. The Wasp seemed so distraught that he didn't expect and missed her lunge with her stinger right on his forehead. However, she only wanted to demonstrate that she shouldn't be treated like that, because she only left him with a scratch to remember. And gazing intently into his eyes, she threatened that next time she would not restrain herself if he interfered again. Only now Spider realized what had made his companion so angry. And so he was not offended. He respected other people's revenge. That's why he gave Ose time to come to his senses and calm down. And he also knew that other people's secrets were very convenient for controlling people's behavior. Wasp still kept silent about the reasons why she had left Nest and joined Spider. But now she remembered Professor John's rage, his words spoken in anger. And she still hid beneath her long bangs the burn that had nearly taken away her eye then. Spider's generous offer to help had not pleased her. Rather, it had aroused a legitimate suspicion. He was so obliging that it was impossible to doubt his true intentions, However, it was still worth listening to him. The wasp lacked the imagination to once again trap Professor John in such a vulnerable position, but Spider had plenty of imagination. The courier had shown up at the table at an inopportune moment because he was immediately drawn into planning revenge. The wasp even laughed, such genuine enthusiasm heard in Spider's words. But she ran her finger around the circle of the cup and was in no hurry to take it. First, she inquired about her partner's true motives. Spider appreciated her insight. However, what was to stop her from telling her a half-truth? Professor John was giving a briefing and was showing another presentation to, to his freshmen. Jean and Wade were sitting next to each other, but Dorothy and Des had had another fight and were sitting on the sidelines. Wade was surprised at the strange name of Spider's organization. It meant something, but all he could think of was his extreme cynicism toward his subjects. The best students were to be chosen for the Black Island mission, and Professor John announced the competition. The girlfriends immediately discussed the novelty and shrugged their shoulders in surprise. The professor had no illusions about those who would win as a result, but the rector said to give everyone a chance, and now he did not hide the level of danger and importance of the future task. The students appreciated the fact that they would get good grades in any case, even if they didn't win the competition, and Wade gloomed and lowered his head. Jean noticed his atypical reaction and she wasn't at all surprised by his next words. She remembered how he'd torn after Spider back then, 
so she supported her friend unconditionally. Dorothy, sitting a row below, listened attentively to their conversation. She snorted. She didn't even doubt she'd hear it. Wade always wanted to be the best. Wade put his fists on the table with determination, showing how badly he wanted to win. Meanwhile, he was fearfully thinking that he had to catch up with his classmates. Because at this rate, he was going to fall out of the student body. And while Wade was silently suffering, he was almost never in class, thanks to his talent for getting into unbelievable situations and then recovering in the hospital. Jean admired his heroism just as silently. Dorothy was tormented by the fact that no one wanted her again. She had been sad a lot lately. She was also worried about Jun, whom she hadn't seen since. Meanwhile, Professor John switched the screen to a new presentation. The simple scheme of the qualifiers did not show the complexity of the task set before the students. For example, close combat in the presence of unequal opportunities for opponents. Des sat closer to Dorothy to discuss the preliminaries, but immediately realized it was unnecessary. So much bloodthirsty excitement sounded in her voice. Professor John noticed it too, and immediately besieged the overly aggressive students with the news that the assignment was to prove themselves, not to discredit others. Team chemistry was determined by how the players were able to divide the responsibilities of defense and offense, so as not to lose their own flag and to get someone else's flag. Scouting and apprehension skills were expected. Strategy and tactics were new to Wade. He was used to the idea that here in Nesta everything was decided by force. But Jeanne listened so attentively to the professor and nodded at his words that it was clear that she was not new to this business. At this point, Professor John considered the briefing to be over. The listeners were confused and silent. No one expected it to start right away. The students were allowed to use the amplifiers ordered from the lab. Wade and company then arrived in the forest to begin the first round of the competition. The other two groups were able to watch in reality TV mode. Evaluate the selection of players, the impact of their individual qualities on the game and learn not to make unfortunate blunders that could ruin everything at the very beginning. Professor John furrowed his brow. There was a reason he had declared a team game. If everyone was strong on their own, then the inability to get along and negotiate would nullify their efforts. The boys had to see their strengths and weaknesses. On the second team were girlfriends Penny and Cherry. They were the ones who could negotiate, but they were far inferior in strength and confidence to their classmates. The video cameras hanging in the forest made it possible to accurately assess everyone's location. The second team immediately split in half and each carried out their task. The girlfriends were in the attackers and circled the forest in search of the second team. It wasn't difficult. The heavy noise from Dorothy and Dez's argument could be heard far away. Professor John was commenting on the accomplishments and blunders of both teams. Because Wade and Jean took advantage of the attention-grabbing noise to pounce on the attackers from the second group, Wade swung his fist, flying towards Penny and Cherry. After all, he really needed a result. The girlfriends were at first very frightened by his unexpected aerial attack. But then Cherry suddenly smiled enigmatically. She could finally show off her own talent. A strong kick unknown to her, but right in front of her nose, made the first team players bounce away from the girls. Jean and Wade caught their mouths in the air from the stress they were under. Cherry's lunge was too unexpected for them. After all, she hadn't shown off her special abilities before, and where would she be able to smash things around with impunity? Jean, as always, relied on her quickness. All she had to do was run up and strike. But she got tangled in the thin golden web that spread across the ground. It was the other friend, Penny, who entered the fray, who could create very fine but strong silk threads. While one of them was holding back the advance, the second friend swung and struck a second blow at the bound Jean, who could not escape the trajectory of the mace. Wade came to the rescue. He picked up Jin, who was swaddled in silken threads, and pulled her out of the way. The girls joined together and confidently advanced on their opponents, who were taken by surprise by their friendly interaction. As Jean removed the silk threads wrapped around her body, Wade was ready to fly into the air with her at the first sign of danger. Because the girlfriends acted so coherently together, it was impossible to defeat them immediately. Professor John praised the advantage of the girls' teamwork. There was much to learn from them, while Dez and Dorothy quietly guarded their flag. After all, they had accomplished the task of attracting attention, and the defenders of the second team carried theirs.
not knowing where to stick it. On the clearing unfolded a serious battle between the attackers from both teams. The girlfriends attacked without delay, not giving time for the opponents to come to their senses from amazement and agree. Cherry swung her mace left and right, depending on where she saw the rudiments of movement. Jean and Wade had to constantly back up to avoid being hit by her sharp spikes. Wade was getting angry. He had no idea how such a weapon was even possible for an insect. Jean had been more knowledgeable about entomology and had suggested that horned spiders could do that. Wade immediately remembered the silver spider, the one that had nearly cost him his life, and he shuddered in disgust. As the mace broke another tree, Jean recalled the spider's vulnerabilities. Her last words drifted away at the speed of a cockroach's run. Just now she was here, and now it was already there, swinging to hit Cherry at close range. But before she could even touch her, she was wrapped in silk threads from head to toe. It was Penny who stepped forward. She was sure that her rival would never get out of the cocoon on her own. The threads of the mulberry silkworm are used to make silk, the strongest material in the world. And she could make an infinite amount of it. Wade rushed to his friend's rescue. He couldn't let her lose so easily. But a spiked cannonball whizzed right in front of him, causing him to slow down. Wade was confused. He alone could not stand up to the teamwork. He had to get past Cherry, who was swinging her mace, and Penny was already handcuffing herself to seal her own victory. But he had wrongly excluded Jean, who also had a lot of secrets. Penny even recoiled when sharp thorns showed from beneath her silken strands. Jean tore her cocoon with brass knuckles that seemed to spring up on her hands. Her friends screamed in surprise. Their first reaction, to run away, caused them to back away. Wade hovered and stared at the transformed Jean. She was no longer a helpless victim. Cherry swung harder and tried once more to smack her opponent with the mace. But Jean activated her complex. Her eyes glowed red and her knuckles glowed red hot. The cockroach's natural weapons didn't physically cross her. Good thing, too, because spiked hands are yuck. But a semblance of it, capable of blowing an iron core to bits, could be ordered from a lab, which she did. Cherry had lost her main weapon and cried out in frustration, and Jean continued her onslaught. The glowing spikes of the brass knuckles were a serious argument for giving way to her. Cherry had already resigned herself to the fact that she would have to order a new mace, but she wasn't going to give up just yet. She waited for Penny to rush out enough threads for a new net. Jean decided to play a team game as well and pass the turn to Wade. Looking down at his girlfriends from above, out of his entire arsenal, he chose his most winning strategy. The dragonfly obediently responded, and the emerald light of her eyes signaled her readiness. Wade launched downward at full speed, peering half-eyed to make sure he didn't miss. When Cherry looked up at the whoosh of air, she was numb with terror. Professor John also tensed and froze. Such a trick was very dangerous. But Wade managed to stop in time and changing direction hovered in front of the girl who closed her eyes from fear. She opened her eyes a moment later, shivering with terror and not believing she was still alive. Her legs wouldn't hold her, and she fell to her knees in front of the guy towering over her. The handcuffs, as evidence of losing, were immediately on her wrists. The students watching the contest were excitedly talking about what had struck each of them about the battle. Professor John, too, was reflecting on the boys' demonstrated abilities and analyzing their blunders. Meanwhile, Wade helped Cherry, who was very weak after the stress she had been through, to stand up. Her friend clutched her head with her hands, seeing that she had lost. She was now all alone, and of course she was scared. But she wasn't going to give up either. So she hurriedly ran away into the bushes and further into the forest. It seemed to her the right thing to do. Jean shouted after her, trying to tell her of the danger. But she was already gone, only to run at full speed up the steep cliff face here. There, as usual, Penny tripped over her own shoe and began to fall. Ahead of her was a chasm where she would have fallen and, at best, crushed herself badly. If she hadn't been grabbed by the hand of Jean, who had come in time to save her classmate. She held her over the precipice and was going to pull her up, thus winning. Penny appreciated the head girl's noble impulse, but she wasn't going to lose that way. So she yanked her toward her, and they tumbled off the ledge together. Wade and Cherry rushed over at the same moment, but could only stare into the abyss and worry about their friends. However, the cunning Penny had simply taken advantage of the head girl's weakness of increased responsibility for her classmates and outplayed it. While still in the fall, she handcuffed her along with sincerely apologizing for it. 
then hugged Jean tighter, enveloping both of them with her silken threads. So that a large elastic silk cocoon fell to the foot of the cliff, from which two butterflies hatched. Penny was dying of belated fear, and Jean was immensely surprised. Wade breathed a sigh of relief, and Cherry looked down joyfully. Professor Jean declared a draw in this battle. Each group had lost one player. But the camera suddenly caught the lone pole of the second group left unprotected. Wade heard the phone ring about that time, pulled it out, and he heard a familiar voice. Only it was hoarse and choking. It was Des. He was alone, and he couldn't handle the current situation. Because the defenders of the second group had come to the clearing for their flag. And Des could barely dodge the fat man's pudgy fist, which with a single blow sliced through the trunk of a tree. Wade was in shock. The situation was catastrophic. If the flag was taken, they had lost. It appeared that their opponents had accidentally stumbled into the base. Consequently, their own flag was left unprotected. Des, meanwhile, talked about the complexity of the confrontation. He went down on one knee because he missed the first warning blow and gasped in pain. Besides, he didn't know how to fight off a flag from such a strong opponent. Raising his eyes from the ground, he saw a thick palm reaching out to grab the flag by the shaft, and there was nothing he could do. Wade immediately looked back at the trunk of the nearest tree, wondering whether to open the case he'd been handed in the lab and use the amplifier. After all, he couldn't let the other team win by getting their flag. Hence rushed to the briefcase and already started to open it to use his advantage. Professor John commented on the events, evaluating them properly and pointing out the flaws, so that the students would learn from the mistakes of others. He was already ready to announce the end of the semifinal competition between the two teams. Wade hurriedly opened the briefcase and its green gut was already glistening through the slit. When a nimble hand pressed the flap, thus slamming the case back shut, Jean suggested that there was no hurry. She had faith in Dorothy not to let things go wrong. Then she left because she was out of the game as a loser, and Wade was left to act on the situation. Jean smiled encouragingly at him, inspiring him to do better. Dorothy did return to the clearing and saw the naked fat man reaching out to grab their flag, and Des squatting and not getting up from the ground. Des looked up at her with a look of pain in his eyes and almost growled. Dorothy was returning with the loot. Instead of doing her job, she was having fun. The defenders from the second group immediately turned around to face the new player. But Dorothy was not afraid of being outnumbered and pointing her finger at the newcomers, asked why they were here. In response, the fat man demonstrated his skill on the trunk of a neighboring tree. He hit the trunk with his horns like a battering ram, causing it to snap in half. Looking around cheerfully, the guy expected shocked screams and quick surrender from the fragile girl. At the same time, Dez shouted loudly, warning Dorothy of another attack from the air. The second player, a nocturnal butterfly, scattered whitish flakes from above. Dorothy was surprised to catch them with her hands and did not understand what exactly the attack was. The girl with a satisfied look enlightened her, expecting that she immediately began to itch. But Dorothy only covered her eyes with her bangs and her nose with her hand to avoid inhaling the nasty stuff. Then she chuckled nervously. She was immune even to Jun's more dangerous bristles. Now it was her turn, and Dorothy immediately launched herself toward the fat man as the more dangerous of the two of them. Wolnyanka was surprised that her surefire method didn't work, but Rhinoceros Beetle was already ready to attack. They grabbed onto each other's palms, trying to overpower and push each other out like sumo wrestlers. The rhinoceros beetle tried its best, even growling through clenched teeth. However, the fragile girl only pushed her heels harder into the ground. Volnianka cheered for her partner. She did not doubt his victory. But an unexpected parody had been established. No one moved. They stood like that, pressing each other's hands. Des opened his mouth to shout something encouraging. He never closed it because he'd never seen Dorothy's complex before. He was shaken to the core. Dorothy was also very pleased. After all, after her complex had been forcibly revealed by the wasp, she hadn't tried using her new skills. Now she made sure she had them all to herself. She struck a sudden blow with her tail, aiming at the fat man's neck, and he flew a few meters away in an arc. Wavianka was shocked that the girl so easily coped with her huge friend, and was about to fly away from the clearing, on her way to grab someone else's flag. But Dorothy did not give her that opportunity, knocking her down on the fly and sending her after the rhinoceros beetle. Now they were both lying on the ground, unable to believe that such a thing could have happened to them.
Dorothy stood over them with a look of triumph. Her hands were covered in armor-piercing gloves from tail to fingertips. Meanwhile, Penny was rushing to her flag to protect it as her partners had left it unattended. She wasn't the only one who realized this. A green lightning bolt whizzed past her, picking up wind and mussing her hair. Wade was the first to grab the flag, and that was the end of the competition. The audience emotionally experienced the last moments of the reality show. Professor John folded his arms on his chest and thought about the strange things he had noticed during the competition. The two had grown so much in their abilities in a short time that it demanded close attention. Jean watched the final footage of her group's victory with satisfaction. Cherry was suffering next door, so much to her chagrin. They had really tried, hadn't they? The other classmates whispered excitedly. They had appreciated the power of the first group and were now trying on the role of their next opponents. Only one guy in the back row was swaying quietly in his chair and not at all worried about it. While Dorothy chatted with her barely up on her feet, Dez glumly turned away from them and walked back alone. He felt like he did when he caught the ball with his hands at the high school championship soccer game and listened to the humiliating comments from the other players because he had caused the team to lose. Everyone was extremely upset and didn't spare his ego. Not a single sympathetic word, only merciless criticism. And he felt so worthless, a ballast who had let his team down at the most important moment of the game, like now. The palm that dropped to his shoulder brought Dez back to reality. Wade had told him that it was getting close to time for the final competition. Dez had missed the competition of the other two groups and was surprised to see everyone banging their heads against the table in unison. Wade explained to him that it was because it was over too quickly. Everyone was also scared that there had been no casualties this time. Des couldn't believe that someone could play so hard to win. Their conversation was interrupted by the jolly guy from the top row. He was from the winning team. A deep cut was visible on his palm, but his smile shone with friendliness. Des didn't immediately like this playful cheerfulness of his, especially because their team had played hard and there was an injured girl in the ICU. Besides, the guy appeared to be a little too clingy. First, he squeezed Jean's shoulder with his palm. Then he rubbed Dorothy's shoulder, all with a sweet smile and the same annoyingly friendly words. Only once did his voice change. Disdain sounded in it. When he passed Des, without calling his name, he tried to hurt him with a word. Des kept silent. He himself knew he'd fallen short in the last game, but he was going to make up for it. The red flag of the first group was flying proudly in the fresh wind that had risen after lunch. Only the losing teams remained in the auditorium. They were to watch the final of the competition and find out who would fulfill the task from Nest. At the red flag, the players from the first team had already gathered. Gene and Wade looked serious and anxious. Dorothy, as always, was showing off for the crowd. Des kept behind everyone. Jean gave the last orders of relative group interaction. Des dutifully accepted the mild criticism of his blunder in the last game. He was standing with his back, and therefore did not see the gaze of Dorothy, who was looking at him imploringly. Professor John announced the start of the final round of the competition. He stopped talking, staring at the screen in shock, because there were incredible things happening. First, Dorothy came very close to Des. She put her hands on his shoulders. Then she reached for his lips, insisting on a kiss and he tried in vain to throw off her tail, which was tightly wrapped around their bodies. Meanwhile, the players of the second group were discussing the event without even seeing it. Because that was the way it was planned. The guy didn't pretend to be friendly for nothing. On his fingers was applied a special pollen, which he applied in such a way that the girls would inhale it. It was a plan suggested to him by his partner. After all, a guy wouldn't be suspected of such deviousness. Her symbiont, the spotted lanternfly, excreted a poison that in small doses acted as a strong aphrodisiac. Wade, too, felt Jean's intense gaze on him, which was accompanied by rapid breathing. Her fingers pulled down the zipper, unbuttoning the jacket over his chest, and on and on until the sports underwear showed. Then she began to throw the jacket off her shoulders, complaining about the stuffiness. Soon her jacket was in Uid's face, along with a seductive, inviting smile. Jean was flirting with him, but the fact that it didn't end there frightened Uid more than a little. Because breathing noisily with excitement, she hooked her fingers into her bra and pulled it up. At this point, the eyes of the entire audience closed. Even Professor John was getting more than a little angry. 
There was foul play at hand, which had started even before the final stage was announced. While he was thinking about what he could do, the lantern lady was triumphant. After all, she had taken half the team out of the game in one fell swoop, and the other half was the victim of the consequences in the form of sexual harassment. Des tried to fight back. Wade hastily tied the sleeves of Jean's jacket as a straitjacket. He had no idea what to do with the loopy girls who seemed to have lost their minds and wouldn't hear any exhortations. And the final game, which had to be won somehow, had begun. Together, Wade and Des had tied up the girls. Now the plans were changing. Wade saw only one option. He would use his complex and Des would stand in defense. But the man scratched the back of his head thoughtfully and suggested another solution. He would go scouting and Wade would stay behind to guard the flag and the girls beneath it. Wade tried to stop him because he thought such a plan was irrational. But Des wouldn't listen to him. He was trying to solve several problems in one fell swoop. When he'd gone home last weekend, his mom had greeted him warmly. And of course, she started asking him how he was doing in school. Her motherly heart was restless. The representatives from Nest had frightened her. She didn't know why, but she secretly sensed that something was amiss. After her son had changed in appearance, though it wasn't noticeable under his pants, she had to accept the help of strangers. But she still hoped it wouldn't last long and her boy would go back to normal. And everything would be as it was before. After all, her whole life was about making her son happy. And his personal happiness was to play soccer. He'd been doing it since he was a kid. Even the ensuing failure at a match didn't make him forget his dream. So he had a very good reason to want to win. And more than one, Des clenched his teeth in anger as he remembered the look on his face as the guy from the opposing team walked past him. At that time, there was a rustle of leaves, and from the top of a tree, he was attacked by a guy with cicada wings on his head. A terrific feature passed to him, ultrasound at ultra-high frequencies. Des bounced out of the line of impact of the acoustic wave. It still hit him, though. The ringing in his ears and temporary disorientation nearly sent him tumbling to the ground. But he remembered his friends, each of whom had mastered their complexes and were doing everything they could to be the best, and engaged his amplifier to its fullest capacity. His jump became unusually high. So his opponent didn't immediately realize that what jumped over the top of him was the one he had to hold off. But then all Des had time to do was dodge the acoustic blows, because the cicada, though flying from below, was emitting ultrasonic waves in his direction. Wade got a sudden text message on his phone. He wasn't expecting anything good from it. It meant someone had been caught and the base was considered declassified. He supposed it could very well be Dezou. This time, however, Des managed it and buckled the cuff first. There was a larger bruise on Cicada's cheek, and the map on the phone flashed up, showing the opponent's base of operations. Des headed toward it alone. He had arrogantly decided to do it all himself and be a hero. He walked out into the marked clearing and started looking around for the opponent's flag but he didn't see anything even remotely similar here, only fresh pits from the last competition. He stood in the center of the clearing and decided to check the map again. Suddenly, a strong hand yanked his leg down to the nearest pit. Des only had time to look at his feet before he began to fall. Into the hole at the bottom of the pit, he was standing near. A hand was pulling him steadily down. The guy who had mocked him in the auditorium was pulling his leg under the ground. There was a pathway dug into an underground grotto, he himself clung to its wall. And Des dropped to the bottom of it from a great height without even giving him a chance to regroup. Then he grinned at his fooled opponent. After all, he was at home here and jumped to him on the floor of the underground grotto, activating his complex on the way. On the other side, a girl in a construction helmet jumped towards Des. She was waving her creepy clawed hands, which she got from her symbiote, the bear. In fact, she'd made her way into the grotto. She licked her lips contentedly, holding the shaft of her own flag in her rough fingers. Mockingbird froze in a half crouch and explained their original twist on the condition to protect their base. Keeping the flag underground was not forbidden by the terms. Then he threw dust from beneath his feet at Diaz, aiming to cover his eyes. And then he began to advance. Both physically, showering Des with sharp stones knocked out of the walls, and morally, crushing his self-esteem in the simplest way possible, destroying him with words. The last kick in the chest, when the enemy could see nothing in the dust cloud, reminded Des how much it hurt him to hear the same words from his soccer teammates. He couldn't stand it any longer. He lunged forward, toward the taunter to hit him back. 
but that's all he was waiting for. For his opponent to rush at him with an open face, arms folded in a lock, and at the moment of impact, spewed a corrosive substance into his eyes. Dez's eyes went black in an instant. He could no longer see anything around him. So he raised his hand to wipe them. But the corrosive liquid was corroding his eyes, burning them mercilessly. The fans in the auditorium grimaced, empathizing with the pain the boy's cry brought to them. Professor John immediately contacted the group, reminding them of the rules of the competition. But all he heard in response was a mocking excuse. The mocker had no remorse for what he had done and was really going to do whatever it took to win. Professor John turned gloomy. This guy was challenging him personally in this way, despising the rules of the university. Meanwhile, Dez ducked to the ground, involuntary tears washing the liquid that was corroding his eyes. The mocker stood over his defeated opponent with his hands in his pockets and continued to mock everyone who was weaker than him, including the previously injured girl. He justified his actions, even though Dez's eyes were already bleeding. He had no compassion for the pain of others. Then he took the handcuffs out of his pocket. He jingled them to make him realize that he had lost completely and was about to put them on, thus taking him out of the game and opening access to their base. But at that time, a small silhouette with wings over his shoulders appeared in the window of the failure. Faster than lightning, it swept past the mocker's hand, changing direction on the fly and the handcuffs were no longer in danger of being put on Dez's arm, because they were in Wade's hand. The taunter stopped laughing at once and gawked at the unprecedented miracle. The handcuffs disappeared from his hand so fast he didn't even feel it. Wade was wearing new glasses made in the lab on special order. His capabilities were now greatly increased. He crouched in a dragonfly stance, and no sand attacks were a hindrance for him to see well. The moment Wade received a message with the exact coordinates of the enemy's base, and realized that Dez had managed to single-handedly defeat the opponent, thus doing half the work. He had to decide what to do, whether to fly to help, because he could not cope with two defenders at once, or stay to guard his flag. Wade decided it was time to use the amplifier created in the lab. He put on the goggles made for it and activated them immediately. The world around him immediately became brighter. The palette of colors expanded. There was something else he hadn't ordered additional options which were built in by a concerned installer. The receptionist had warned him about it, but he hadn't even expected to get that. The fact that a dragonfly has faceted vision is common knowledge, so the choice of such a base to improve its eyesight was not accidental. But here is a wheel on the side was embedded by its creator sort of to improve the quality of vision. Explanations of the administrator did not add understanding. Why such an addition for him? The audience flinched every now and then as Wade learned to fly with the new gadget on the bridge of his nose. Eventually, he threw up under a nearby tree, just as the administrator had promised. Whereupon, Wade turned the dial to position zero and breathed a sigh of relief. That's when the world went back to normal and it was possible to go to Dez's aid. He climbed as high as he could so that the trees below looked like a map. He looked up the direction of the enemy base so he could fly to it in a straight line. He headed there at maximum acceleration praying to himself that he wouldn't be too late. Caught a kneeling Dez bowing to the guy who'd come to talk to them before the contest. Wade looked at him and realized that the girl's strange state of mind was probably his doing. And then there was Dez moaning on the floor and a categorical verdict on his eyesight. Wade immediately rushed to his friend's aid. The taunter was just waiting. A new portion of corrosive liquid immediately flew at Wade as soon as he came within the necessary distance but Wade's eyes were protected by his glasses, so he didn't realize what had happened at first, until his hand began to burn where the largest amount of acid had hit. The formic acid of the world's most dangerous fire ant, capable of harming even humans, not to mention the other small creatures that feed on it. A jet of formic acid and even predators give way to these small creatures. Wade didn't wait for the next shot of formic acid. He went as fast as he could and flew around the enemy, trying to figure out the best way to take him out. The easiest way was to fly sideways, and while he slowly turned around, give him a well-deserved punch to the jaw, without sparing him. To Dez's eyes, Ant got up, spitting blood out of his shattered mouth and cursing foully, then set his jaw, crunching it properly. He didn't seem too concerned, because he shouted a strange command to someone upstairs, while Wade pondered what it could have been. An ant gloated from the side. Wade didn't know where to look from which side danger would come. 
Meanwhile, Lanterness was dragging with all her might a flat stone boulder braided with chains. It was to cover the entrance hole to the grotto. Wade watched as the gap slowly closed and the lights in the grotto slowly diminished. Soon it was completely dark, and there were rustles all around. The sound of footsteps stood out. It was the first time Wade had been in a situation where he could see nothing. At first, he had convinced himself that the others were on equal footing with him, until a returned blow to the jaw showed that this was not at all the case. Ant had perfect night vision passed down to him from the symbiote, and he delivered the next crushing blow to his temporarily confused opponent. Wade began his run-up to fly over the heads of his opponents. It would be impossible to hit him in the air. But then something grabbed his knees and a girlish voice told him he couldn't do it. Wade instinctively looked down and jerked his legs up, trying to free himself. Of course, he couldn't see anything. But he heard Ant coming toward him. He had already released his next dose of formic acid and swung around to smear it on his opponent, causing painful shock. The screen in the auditorium went dark as the lights in the grotto went out and the audience whispered excitedly. Professor John was forced to explain the immutable rule of all contests, win at all costs. Wade managed to protect his face with his hands in front of him, but a painful burning sensation told him he couldn't hold out much longer. He hissed in pain and even dropped to one knee, trying to adapt, but it wasn't working out well. Ant pulled out the handcuffs again and carried them to Dragonfly with a look of triumph. Wade got to his feet when he heard a familiar sound and prepared to defend himself. But what could he do in the pitch darkness? So he resolutely put his finger to the wheel he had forbidden to touch. His head was again disturbed by the change from human vision to dragonfly vision. After his outrage at the uninvited additions, the receptionist flatly refused to change anything. She explained exactly what the end result was supposed to be, and Wade listened carefully so it was no surprise now that he was, albeit vaguely, beginning to see, a raking hand heading for his face. So he managed to bounce aside in time for Ant's swing to pass him by. While Ant was looking back, Wade was already hovering over his shoulder, getting used to his new vision. And even trying to move at super speed, so far he was only trying out the powers, but he had already managed to scare Bear when he flew right next to her nose, then he began to dash around the grotto, constantly changing direction to avoid crashing into the walls. The ant even blushed with anger. His prey was no longer an obedient victim. The ant hurriedly burrowed into the ground to hide from the incessant attacks from the air. The ant had no time to turn his head and fight off Wade. He wasn't interested in dragonflies and couldn't know that they weren't just daytime insects. That they see better than humans. Their eyes are designed to hunt at dusk. That's what made Wade sick. It's not easy to adapt to dragonfly vision. The faceted eyes are a special way of looking at the world that takes some getting used to. There, standing there, Ant-Man. He raises his arm to protect his face from the next blow. And his eyes see as a hundred hexagonal windows, and each at a different angle of view, with different light intensity and in different spectra. The guys in the auditorium even got bored. There was no sound before, but now the total darkness was oppressive until the lid that Lanterness was guarding twitched. She supposed it should be over by now. After all, so much time had passed. The boulder shattered into pieces and two male figures flew upward from the grotto. From above, shards from the rock and chains that no longer held anything together sprinkled down on her. But it wasn't them she was staring at with her mouth open in amazement. She was looking at a battle that was impossible in her mind. Everyone in the audience even stood up. After a long lack of information, such a sight at once. Professor John stroked his beard, wondering how what he had seen was possible. How Wade had punched the fire ant's face time after time, preventing it from falling. Because it was high above the ground and would have crashed. But still the inevitable happened, and after another blow the fire ant flew down. The ground was approaching rapidly and he was helpless, just like his victims before him in total darkness. The girls on the opposing team, however, quickly oriented themselves and raced to the flag to protect it. Bear was closest, and she could have hidden the flag deeper into the ground. If it hadn't been pulled out in front of her by Wade, who swooped down from above like a kite, grabbed it and flew away, leaving her lying on the ground. Lanterness managed to pull a tranquilizer out of her sinus as a last resort to win, and fired a shot at Wade as he flew upward with an awkward pole. He noticed the ampule immediately. It was flying surprisingly slow compared to him, so he just swung the pole, knocking it off course so that it hit the floor. The girl froze with her mouth open. She could not have imagined such a thing. 
and then she saw the aerobatics when the guy's body first disappeared and then whizzed past her, making her fall to the ground and cover herself with her hands in fear. Professor John nodded his head in satisfaction. The winner had been decided. The blue flag of the defeated team was flying in the air, not dusting beneath the ground. And it was in the hand of the only remaining intact member of the group. The girlfriend stared with amorous eyes at today's hero. Wade suddenly recovered from his sense of triumph and remembered that somewhere out there, Des remained suffering and helpless. It was necessary to go back. Des was lying on the dirt floor at this time and was indeed suffering. Only not for the reason Wade had in mind. He was tormented by the same situation over and over again. When he'd made mistakes and let others down, his pride couldn't stand the fact that he was the weakest link on the team. He felt that today was also his fault for falling into Ant's trap and failing to overpower him. His tears had partially washed away the acid, but his vision only discerned a faint light. Des only fully opened his eyes when Professor Olivia arrived and healed him. Wade, meanwhile, washed the acid off his hands and listened to what the doctor had to say. Des was greatly surprised to hear that their group had won after all. Next to him, Wade was smiling at him as the doctor treated the acid burns on his hands. Des looked at him almost in awe. After all, he had done something that was beyond his reach. Wade held out his hand to help him up off the ground, but his hand hung in the air. Des was in no hurry to accept his hand. He stared at the newcomer who could become stronger than him in just a few weeks. And envy overcame him, so much so that he bit his lower lip with his teeth in anger. Professor John noticed this and folded his arms across his chest in displeasure. History was repeating itself. So he immediately kicked Wade out of the grotto. Des was his concern from now on. Wade had to obey his teacher. He put on his goggles and went to take off. Des sat there with a gloomy face, reliving not the most pleasant moments in his life. Professor John explained to him how it was that Wade's level had increased in such a short time. He touched on the philosophical point that for every force there is an even stronger force. But the problem Desa saw was something else entirely. Lack of patience and wounded pride caused him to stop fighting even where he could still flounder. Des even raised himself on his knees when he heard the professor's honest opinion of his shortcoming. It was not at all what he had supposed, but the man didn't go into details. He only said that the Black Island would not pass their group by. All that remained was to prepare properly. Des didn't realize that the best doping for a jump in abilities was mortal danger. First of all, for people you cared about. But the professor knew it. That's why he left it with a cryptic phrase. In the evening, the student dormitory shuddered with the sound of a woman's scream. Jean had learned of her unacceptable behavior during the finals. Wade tried to reassure her that nothing was wrong. But the girlfriends kept at it, spelling out the details of her and Dorothy's actions and the guy's reactions to it. It would have been funny if it hadn't been so embarrassing. Soon the conversation turned to discussing their accomplishments. They drank to their success. However, Wade made everyone sad that no one had added any extra points to their ranking. He knew this for a fact because he had asked Professor John about it. While working out in the weight room with a barbell, he had quietly informed them of the rector's orders. Cherry knew that sometimes the rector would intervene with strange suggestions, and always for educational purposes. Wade pretended not to care at all. He wasn't, though he really wasn't. The girlfriends looked at each other. They asked a question Wade hadn't thought of yet, as he pondered how to answer. Penny offered her services and even provided a sample of her skill by weaving something out of her clothes in front of him. She had the amazing ability to produce threads of given parameters and colors simply by eating a piece of such fabric. Jean wasn't averse to an upgrade either, and Penny handed her a notepad for taking notes of the right sizes. While Wade and Jean agreed on how they were going to measure up, the friends watched their squabble with amusement. Then they clinked glasses and winked conspiratorially at each other. A few days later, the boys sailed to Black Island. It seemed quite settled. At any rate, there were plenty of boats at the docks. Wade hid his wings under a long, fancy cloak. Jean didn't have much to hide. She had her antennae tucked into a long ponytail this time. The opposite situation was true for their friends. Des only needed to wear loose pants to hide his legs. Dorothy, on the other hand, flaunted a bouffant dress to conceal her scorpion tail. They were to be met, and they looked around the dock for a chaperone. It turned out to be a young man, a little older than they were. He seemed extremely disguised. 
The boys stared in amazement at the man who, in their minds, was not supposed to stand out from the crowd. His brightly colored Hawaii, sunglasses, and long hair made him as inconspicuous as a traffic light at an intersection. While Wade suffered at the thought that they might be tracked thanks to their escort's conspicuousness, Dez glanced at him. He kept thinking about what the professor was interpreting to him, how Wade was different from him because he didn't see him as particularly diligent. Just a regular guy. Now he decided to put those thoughts aside and just try to be the best. And so he strode ashore first, ahead of everyone else, almost hitting Wade with his shoulder. He'd been looking so glum lately that Wade was beginning to worry. As he watched Dez moving away from them in puzzlement, Dorothy came up. She, too, didn't like her friend's behavior lately. The attendant led them to a small hotel by the sea where rooms had been reserved and held out four small bags of clothes for them to change into. The boys took each one in bewilderment. They figured they had taken enough care of their appearance as it was. Wade asked before he printed out an update. He almost tapped himself on the forehead. He'd completely forgotten about Penny's promise, and she hadn't reminded him, so he'd forgotten. Sonny's attendant adjusted his glasses on the bridge of his nose as he waited for the group to change. Wade pulled an ordinary pair of shorts out of his bag and bit his lip in confusion. The girls, too, pulled stunningly beautiful swimsuits out of their bags and stared at them in amazement.